Preface of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King John's Charter of AD 1215, the Great Charter as it came in later days to be specially called by those who looked back to it with reverence, is dealt with in so many of its aspects by the eminent writers who have contributed to this volume, that this preface need contain nothing more than a few general reflections on the place which it occupies in the history of English politics and English law. One such reflection is suggested by a comparison of English law with the only other legal system which holds an equally important place in the jurisprudence of civilised mankind. That system is the law of the Roman city, which ultimately became the law of the ancient world, and survives in the modern world as the basis of the codes of great nations like France, Italy and Germany, and in a more diluted form of many other states. As Magna Carta is the first document of high legal significance for England, so for Rome the first such document was the law of the Twelve Tables. In no other country, ancient or modern, can we find any body of legal rules which, framed at an early period in a nation's growth, has so powerfully influenced its subsequent development as did the Lex Duodecim Tabularum. The nearest parallels are what we call the Law of Moses in the Pentateuch and the Koran of Mohammed, but the differences are so great that it is hardly worth while to pursue a comparison. The Twelve Tables were enacted about four centuries before that remarkable expansion and modernization of Roman law which began in the last age of the Roman Republic, and Magna Carta four centuries before the days of Coke, Pym, and Selden, when the law and constitution of England passed into a new phase of development. Both the Charter and the Tables included what the Romans called Ius Publicum and Ius Privatum. Fons omnis publici privatique juris, says Livy. The distinction between these elements had not been clearly drawn, either in Rome or in England, at the time of their enactment but it was the private element that turned out to be of most consequence in the Roman case, the public or constitutional element in the English. Both enactments arose out of political troubles. The Twelve Tables were prepared and passed to meet the demand of the Roman plebs for some formal and permanent definition and limitation of the arbitrary executive authority exercised by the consuls, and they contained rules which gave some protection to the civil rights of the individual citizen. So, likewise, the charter was demanded by those who complained of the irregular and arbitrary violence of King John, and the restrictions it imposed upon the Crown's action became the cornerstone of English freedom. Its provisions, never repealed, though varied and to some extent amplified in subsequent instruments similarly extorted from subsequent monarchs, were solemnly reasserted in the famous declaration by Parliament in 1628, which we call the Petition of Right, and were finally re-enacted in the Bill of Rights of 1689. Thus the Charter of 1215 was the starting point of the constitutional history of the English race, the first link in a long chain of constitutional instruments which have moulded men's minds and held together free governments not only in England but wherever the English race has gone and the English tongue is spoken. The Bill of Rights was in the thoughts of those who framed the first constitutions of Massachusetts and Virginia when the North American colonies renounced their allegiance to the British Crown, and much of the document of 1689 was incorporated in those constitutions. From them the old provisions, largely in the original words of the Great Charter, passed into the Federal Constitution of the United States when it was drafted in 1787 and adopted with the first ten amendments between 1788 and 1791 nor does the chain of historical sequence stop here. 
the federal constitution supplied a model for republican constitutions enacted in later days it was imitated by the republics of spanish america when they threw off the yoke of spain it influenced the form which france from seventeen ninety onwards gave to the successive frames of government she adopted and led to the placing in most of them of declarations of the primordial or so-called natural rights of man the positive and pragmatic phrases of stephen langton if it was he who was the chief draughtsman of magna carta had now been transmuted by the spirit of rousseau into wider and vaguer terms further influences may be traced in the constitution of the swiss confederation and those of other european countries it seems not too fanciful to say that the prelates and barons of runnymede building better than they knew laid the foundations of that plan of written or rigid constitutions which has now covered the world from peru to china the influence of the law of the twelve tables upon the development of legal thought and institutions in later ages need not be followed out here as it worked chiefly in the field of roman private law but two resemblances between that code if code it can be called and magna carta may be noted both had the character to those who enacted them not so much of what we call legal commands as of solemn covenants magna carta is a series of engagements contracted by the crown with the magnates of the realm accepted by them and authenticated by the king's great seal so among the romans one of the definitions of lex is communis re publicae sponsio it is a public stipulatio the presiding magistrate interrogates the people in a rogatio whether they wish to be bound by what he proposes the people if they accept answer uti rogas be it as you ask and thus the obligation is constituted there is a real meaning in this though it may seem a point of form both moreover purport and this is a matter of substance to be in reality and fact not so much enactments of new law as declarations explicit and precise of pre-existing customary law the twelve tables included some rules which were if not new at any rate doubtful and some others plainly new but in the main they were a digest of existing customs and regulations of procedure some of the liberties which the barons claimed and some which the commonalty also desired had to a certain extent been recognized in henry the first's charter of liberties and john's concessions were not extorted grants of new rights but rather the solemn renunciation of old abuses abuses so inveterate that they reappeared under his successors and had to be again renounced neither the twelve tables nor the great charter was established like most modern fundamental instruments in such a way as to make it unchangeable by ordinary legislative methods that was a device reserved for later ages and in point of fact many provisions of both became by degrees obsolete because inapplicable to the conditions of a constantly developing community one enactment of the decemvirs was repealed within a few years others were varied later yet down to the days of cicero's youth boys learnt these ancient texts by heart as a carmen necessarium though cicero adds quas iam nemo discit magna carta had become so sacred that in the seventeenth century there would seem to have been lawyers who doubted whether it could be repealed by an ordinary statute parts of it have been in later times modified by parliament and we have just seen some of them infringed or suspended by the defence of the realm act of nineteen fourteen yet other parts may be quoted to-day as binding not only in england but in the courts of australia or illinois just as the twelve tables could be quoted in the courts of thrace or syria down to the days of justinian who made a clean sweep of all antecedent legislation 
both it may be added set in the directness and precision of their language an example which had a healthy influence on the form of statutory enactments for many generations until a time came after the antonine emperors when rhetorical diffuseness depraved the legislation of the later roman monarchs and when in england especially in hanoverian days the effort to attain completeness induced undue prolixity and a tedious enumeration of particulars it is a part of the service which may be credited to both documents that they helped to form exact habits of legal thinking and legal interpretation in both peoples qualities to which the chief merits of both the two great systems of law that now rule the world may be ascribed passing from the legal to the wider historical aspects of the great charter let us see what share may be assigned to it in the rendering of those services by which britain has helped forward the cause of freedom and good government throughout the world the first place among these services is often assigned to the development of representative government in the english parliament but the representative system although more successful in england than elsewhere was not peculiar to england it may be deemed another service that she set in the nineteenth century the example of an extension of the right of the masses of the people to share in self-government in this however the ancient republics had anticipated her and so had some few of the swiss cantons rather perhaps may we find the chief contribution of england to political progress in the doctrine of the supremacy of law over arbitrary power in the steady assertion of the principle that every exercise of executive authority may be tested in a court of law to ascertain whether or no it infringes the rights of the subject does the law of the land warrant and cover the act done of which the subject complains though it is now generally held that the famous phrase nisi per legale judicium parium suorum well per legem terre does not as used to be supposed constitute the basis of what we call trial by jury still it remains true that these words and especially the declaration of the supremacy of the lex terre are the critical words on which the fabric of british freedom was solidly set before a representative parliament had come into existence it was this guarantee of personal civil rights that most excited the admiration of continental observers in the eighteenth century and caused the british constitution to be taken as the pattern which less fortunate countries should try to imitate if it be said and truly said that this fundamental principle could not have been maintained in england without the assertion by the parliaments of the fifteenth and again more forcibly and persistently by those of the seventeenth century of control over the power of the crown it is to be remembered that their efforts might not have succeeded had not the earlier resistance to that power by the men who secured magna carta created and fostered in the minds of the upper and middle classes that firm and constant spirit of independence that vigilant will to withstand the aggressions of the executive which overthrew charles i and expelled james the second supreme power has now passed into the hands of the whole people who not only enact the laws through their representatives but supervise administration by their control of the executive ministers so that conflicts between the law and the executive need no longer be feared where the people make the law the risk of transgressions of the law by the servants of the people is but slender such dangers to liberty as may now be feared are of a different order if they arise they will arise from a tendency on the part of majorities to encroach by the exercise of legislative power on the sphere which ought to be reserved for the unchecked action of the individual citizen and the self-guided development of his own aims and purposes we may hope that here in britain that attachment to individual rights which has now by long tradition become instinctive in our race 
will preserve us and preserve also those british peoples beyond the seas who have inherited our spirit and our time-honoured traditions from any such dangers making us and them prudently watchful to keep legislative authority within its proper limits one may say of liberty what the roman historian said of empire it is preserved by the same methods which achieved it the spirit of freedom is always the same and has had and will have similar work to do for the welfare of mankind whether at runnymede in twelve fifteen or seven centuries later end of the preface to magna carta commemoration essays by the right hon viscount bryce o m d c l recording by ruth golding Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Introduction by H. E. Malden, M. A. The 700th anniversary of the granting of the Great Charter by King John occurred in June 1915. Some kind of celebration of the event was so likely to be undertaken that the Royal Historical Society determined that if such took place at all, it should be directed by competent persons, and early in 1914 organized a committee for a due commemoration. The Right Honorable Viscount Bryce consented to act as chairman of a committee, which representatives of universities and learned societies and leading historical scholars from the United Kingdom, America, and some other countries were invited to join. The Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lord Mayor of London represented the continuity of English life from 1215 to 1915. A small executive committee was appointed to arrange details, among which a visit to Runnymede and an address upon the spot were contemplated. By 1915 this intended celebration proved not desirable, nor indeed possible. The memory of the assertion of the principle of government by law was overclouded by the cares of the immense struggle to maintain that principle through force of arms. Several eminent scholars had, however, prepared papers upon certain points or aspects of the Great Charter, or upon matters of cognate interest, and these it is thought well to present to the Fellows of the Royal Historical Society, and to preserve in book form for the general use of historical students. These papers, it may be said, were not written with any idea of sequence, nor as aiming at any complete comment upon all points of the Charter. The authors were free to offer such contributions as they chose, but there will, nevertheless, be found, running through several of them, a line of general agreement. The old uncritical admiration, which found in the Great Charter something more than the germ of all the more important parts of the Constitution and law of recent centuries, has vanished from every place, except occasionally from Parliament and the public platform. The natural reaction which saw in the Charter merely the assertion of class privileges has begun to suffer from criticism in turn. Motives are indeterminate, even to those near at hand. Who knows all the motives of the Whigs, of the Reform Bill of 1832? Who can confidently assert all those of Stephen Langton in 1215? But to those afar off the general tendency of actions is more clear. In effect, Ten years after the charter was given, it was popularly accepted, when recast and repeated, as national, not only as baronial in its benefits, confirming liberties tam populo quam plebi. The barons did more than they knew, perhaps more than they would have intended had they known it, but whatever the interpretation in their minds of liber homo, the interpretation of the courts soon gave it a wider scope than has sometimes been allowed to it by commentators. As has often been pointed out, those who asserted the rule of law, and provided a sort of privileged civil war for the vindication of that rule, had travelled but a little way upon the path of constitutional progress. But the rude awakening of our own age has again forced upon us this unfortunate fact of a yet imperfect society, that liberties of a class, or a nation, or of a world, are only secure for those who can in the last resort venture their lives for their defence, and have the means to make that venture successful. 
the present struggle for the rule of law explains the absence of some names from the list of contributors and of some subjects which might have been treated a german professor well known for his mastery of early english law once a friend of england had promised a communication a courteous letter through sweden suam cui que tribuito regretted his inability to contribute the great French scholars, to whom we owe so much light upon the reigns of the Angevin kings, were necessarily preoccupied. It was hoped that from a Hungarian source we might have had a treatise on the likeness and differences between the privileges of the Anglo-Norman and the Magyar nobility. A Belgian professor might have written on the parallels between our constitutional laws and the joyeuse entrée of Brabant, and other Netherland liberties. We are fortunate, however in securing the aid of Signor Rafael Altamira upon the analogies of English and Spanish liberties. What we at home owe to the pious interest in the antiquities of their motherland felt by the scholars of America, the following pages show a little. We all know how much has been done by them elsewhere. There is a peculiar satisfaction, however, in an English celebration of a thirteenth-century document and event. Here, as elsewhere, in the course of seven hundred years all things have changed. But here, as not elsewhere, all things have changed by processes of development which have often left names, offices, titles, and some more essential features of national life the same. Can any other country read at the beginning of its book of statutes a law in the form in which it was made six hundred and ninety-two years ago? The national spirit and aspirations, which at all events adopted as their own the Articles of Runnymede, are the same today as then, while no peer of the United Kingdom represents in the male line any one of the barons of 1215, yet the blood of several of the latter flows in the veins of many Englishmen, Scots, and Irishmen, noble, gentle, and simple. The king wears, as the centre of a legal government, the crown which his ancestor John was admonished that he must wear in accordance with a law older than his dynasty. The titles of nobility, and of the archbishops and bishops who advised the charter, remain. In one case at least an English peer, the Duke of Norfolk and Earl of Arundel, is now lord of manors and castles which his ancestors in the female line held in 1215. The bishops in 1917 hold in many cases the same houses and estates which their predecessors in title held when by their advice John gave the charter. Langton had his house at Lambeth, Peter de Roche at Farnham Castle, where their successors live now, in the latter case in some of the same buildings. Our race across the seas claims an inheritance in liberties which were declared to be ancient at Runnymede. There is something in this unbroken line of social and national descent akin to the ever-changing yet essentially permanent features of the stage upon which the national drama was enacted. The face of the country has been changed since 1215, but it is the same land, and of all places in it Runnymede has probably changed among the least. Sir John Denham's Cooper's Hill looks across it, and up to Windsor and down to London, over more thickly inhabited distances. A few inns and boathouses, standing amid enclosures, fringe the river, but in the foreground a meadow by the Thames there was. Meadows by the Thames remain. In 1215 the hay of the commoners of Engham must have been ruined, unless the season was unusually early. The hay crop would now stand as an obstacle to a celebration upon the spot on the actual anniversary in the middle of June. Whether the place was the scene of any ancient meetings is unknown. Leland first advanced, with the boldness of the amateur etymologist, the derivation of the Mead of Council, to explain the name. Certain topographical considerations, in fact, governed the selection of the place for a conference between John, who was at Windsor, and his barons, whose base was London. A Roman road ran from the southwest towards the valley of the Lower Thames, and when London had become the great commercial city of Roman Britain, in London it ended. Staines must be on or near the site of the Roman station, ad Pontes, or Pontibus. It would seem, from the name, that there must have been the earliest Roman bridge across the Thames, made perhaps before London was all-important. There is another Roman road, recoverable in Sussex and Surrey in very short portions of its course, 
one of the longer is in Somersbury Wood, near Ewhurst, which, if continued in a straight line, would hit the Thames near Staines. But the undoubted road from Silchester, known locally as the Devil's Highway, crosses East Hampstead Plain and runs through Virginia Water, an artificial pond made in the eighteenth century, and heads directly towards Staines. When the succession, no doubt, of Roman bridges, which crossed the low meadows subject to floods, as well as the river itself, fell into ruin, no one knows. But there is reason to believe that a bridge had been restored at Staines before 1215. In the patent rolls of Henry the Third, 29 July, 1228, is a table of tolls which the warden, Custos, of Staines Bridge may impose. In auxilium pontus de Staines, reperande et emendandi. There is no reference to the bridge being newly made then, and the natural inference is that a bridge which needed repairs had been standing more than thirteen years. Here, then, was the obvious reason for the baronial host coming to Runnymede on their way to Windsor. They had marched from London by the Roman road, and had crossed Staines Bridge. Runnymede was a good camping ground, with a good communication with London behind it. The local tradition, which places the granting of the charter in Magna Carta Island in the Thames, is contradicted by the charter itself. Data in prato quoad vocatur running mead. The erroneous tradition was fixed by the lord of a Buckinghamshire manor, the island is in that county, who put up a fantastic building with an inscription on the island in 1834, saying that it was the true spot. If there is any reason behind it further than the assumption by Mr. George Simon Harcourt that the notable event took place upon his land, it may be found in a passage where Matthew Paris, in Chronica Majora, adds to Wendover's account of the treaty between the French Prince Louis and the Earl of Pembroke in 1217 that it was negotiated quandam insula, near Staines. Buckinghamshire must not rob Surrey of its greatest event. Surrey has also its own baseless tradition, perpetuated by an inscription, that the barons arranged their articles in the caves under de Warren's castle at Reigate. Considering the attitude of John's cousin de Warren, this would be equivalent to the Reform Bill of 1832 having been concocted in the cellars of Apsley House. Moreover, the caves in question were made for getting fine sand, and were valued as sand pits in a survey of the manor of Reigate in 1622. Runnymede, with the adjacent Longmead and Yardmead, or in the manner of Egham, which formerly, and in 1215, belonged to Chertsey Abbey, and after the dissolution became the property of the crown, though granted for terms of years to various holders. At the time of the parliamentary surveys of the late king's lands in 1650, it appears as meadow land belonging to Egham Manor. In 1811 there were some ten tenants who enjoyed the use of the land for hay from March to Old Lammas Day. After that date it was thrown open for grazing to the cattle of the tenants of the manor of Engham. An Enclosure Act in 1814, 54 George III, c. 153, and the consequent award made in 1817, divided it among nineteen holders and the crown as lord. In Runnymede proper there were over seventy-one acres. The adjacent Longmead, of seventy-six acres, was divided among the crown and nine tenants. The whole might be stocked with horses and cattle from Old Lammas Day to 13 November, and with sheep from 13 November to 2nd February. From 2nd February to August it is to be left for hay. The central part was and is left unenclosed. But the Act stipulated that any enclosures which should interfere with the holding of Engham races upon the usual course at the end of August must be removed every year. William the Fourth gave a plate to be run for at the meeting, and on the first occasion, in 1836, being present, the races coinciding with festivities at Windsor for his daughter's marriage, made a speech in which a contemporary reporter found good feeling and patriotism equally blended. The king declared that neither himself nor any other could be present without calling to mind that it was here that our liberties were obtained and forever secured, and that we were here to enjoy those liberties and sports which he would with his utmost power ever protect and foster. His Majesty forbore to specify which clause of the charter secured the liberty of horse-racing. 
the rather unusually disreputable crowd which frequented Angham races, probably never at any other time recalled at all the more momentous gathering. The races ceased in 1884. But with Aristophanes we may say, Que tafta mendi is macra copihoria, and revert to the studies of a great subject which follow. The first paper was delivered as an address by Professor W. S. McKitchney in 1915, before the Royal Historical Society and some members of the Magna Carta Committee, the Right Honorable Viscount Bryce being in the chair. It was the only celebration in the 700th year. It justifies the title Great as applied to this charter, and explains how every succeeding age builded upon its conclusions to suit its own aspirations. When we read the glosses of the School of Coke, we may be reminded of an ingenious preacher who founds upon a simple text consequences which were far from the mind of the original writer. With Moliere's character we may exclaim, Tant de choses en demain, but it is hard to deny a great value to that which contained a principle of such very practical application. Professor George Burton Adams, of Yale, USA, follows with an article upon the bull and the letter of Innocent the Third, condemning the charter, and prints the letter itself in an accessible form. The grounds for the Pope's interference were not the feudal supremacy which John had conceded to him, but rather his position as ecclesiastical arbiter of European quarrels and special guardian of the rights of a professed crusader. That the thirteenth-century court of international appeal made a great mistake in its excursion into English national politics is more unfortunate than surprising. Dr. J. Horace Round contributes a penetrating criticism upon the distinction between the lesser barons, who by Clause 14 were to be summoned and block, to councils, and the malites of the charter. It will be a reminder needed by some, to whom comment has become more familiar than the words commented upon, that baronies minorities are not so named in the charter at all. The barons in 1255 are said to have appealed to Clause 14 concerning the writ of summons which was not repeated in the reissue of the Charter. Is it possible that the many copies of the first issue of 1215 were in fact more numerous, or more generally accessible, than the reissues which should have superseded them? Or, to draw a suggestion from Professor McIlwin's paper, was what had once been declared to be ancient practice considered binding, later laws notwithstanding? Professor Sir Paul Vinogradov and Professor F. M. Powicki deal with the famous Clause 39, Liber Homo, Legali Iodicium, Paruum, Suorum, and Lex Terrae. Too much cannot be written upon it by competent people. The clause is considered from slightly differing standpoints, but not with very different conclusions. It is here that the expansible nature of the Charter, as society expanded, is so clearly to be seen. Liber Homo is a very Proteus with whom to grapple. He assumes many shapes, but he was not always a military tenant only. John had fifteen years before 1215, in a charter, greeted as Liberi Homines, the men of Kingston upon Thames, who had all in doomsday been merely villeins on ancient domain. Professor McGillwain of Harvard, USA, deals with Magna Carta and the common law in an exhaustive treatise upon the whole subject of ancient custom, statute law, and ordinances. Dr. H. D. Hazeltine, USA, and Emmanuel College, Cambridge, treats the inheritance in the charter of the American colonies before and after the Declaration of Independence. Signor Rafael Altamira, of Madrid, reminds us that in the early Middle Ages England was far from having a monopoly of constitutional liberties, and that there may be positive influence from the Pyrenean lands upon English constitutional developments. Certainly the elder Simon de Montfort, when in the November of 1212 he settled the affairs of the conquered Albigensian lands, called a parliament at Palmyre, which was attended by barons, clergy, knights, and citizens, antedating by fifty-three years his more famous son's parliament after Lewes. The device of a parliamentary committee to do the real business not unknown in England and stereotyped in Scotland, was employed two bishops, a Templar, a Hospitaller, four French knights, two Languedocian knights, and two Languedocian burgesses were the lords of the articles. 
both the younger simon and edward i had ruled glascony and the latter had seen spain but we may hesitate to yield the palm to the spanish kingdoms in the practical attainments of liberties spanish constitutional phenomena have yet to be studied as fully as those of england and senor altamira admits that generalization is so far premature when english constitutional studies were younger the tendency was to exaggerate the evidence of the early popular liberties when those of aragon and castile have been as exhaustively explored a similar shrinkage of claims may follow at any rate moderation slow advance a practical sense aiming at the necessary and the attainable from time to time with the continuance which was the fruit of these were what made english constitutional gains solid finally mr hilary jenkinson late of the p r o now captain r g a gives an extremely interesting review of the financial organization or disorganization of the reign of john drawn from the records it tends to show that by some one perhaps by the king himself some effort was being made to introduce method into business which had outgrown its earlier machinery the editor must return hearty thanks to mr f a kirkpatrick m a f r historical society for the translation of senor altamira's paper and to mr c johnson of the record office for the correction of mr jenkinson's proofs and to professor mckitchney for invaluable help in the reading of proofs doubly useful when it was impossible to send some of these across the seas for the final corrections by the authors nor is his debt to the greatest authority upon the charter confined to this alone by arrangement dr hazeltine's paper has appeared already in the columbia law review volume seventeen january nineteen seventeen end of section one of magna carta commemoration essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org magna carta 1215 to 1915 an address delivered on its 7th centenary to the royal historical society and the magna carta celebration committee by Professor William S. McKechnie. Seven hundred years ago, at a meadow on the Thames between Staines and Windsor, known as Runnymede, a spot thereafter hallowed for all lovers of England and of freedom, King John, bending before a storm he had raised but could not lay, set the great seal of England to a charter of liberties. The event proved memorable in many ways, but preeminently because of its clear enunciation of the principle that the caprice of despots must bow to the reign of law, that the just rights of individuals, as defined by law and usage, must be upheld against the personal will of kings. John Lackland, in acceding to the demands of his barons, under picturesque and memorable circumstances, tacitly admitted the doctrine of later constitutional law that rulers are accountable for the use they make of their sovereign powers. The royal surrender at Runnymede thus presaged the darker tragedy enacted at Whitehall, four centuries later, when the chief exponent of the Stuart doctrine of the divine right of kings died a martyr to his face. In 1215, King John, sorely against his will, was forced to take the first painful step on that road of constitutional progress that led, in the course of centuries, to the firm establishment of the modern doctrines of the royal impersonality and the responsibility of ministers for the actions of their king. The events that led to so notable a surrender must be briefly told. John's father, Henry Plantagenet, a prince endowed with a double portion of the untiring vigour, the ability and the hot blood of the race of Anjou had prepared strong foundations for his English throne. In organising an efficient administrative system, he had strained to the utmost every prerogative of the crown, and reduced to the narrowest limits the franchises and privileges and independence of the great feudatories, his earls and barons. With one hand he had increased in frequency and amount every one of the galling feudal services and incidents performed by his vassals. With the other he had curtailed their profitable franchises, their rights of holding courts and trying prisoners. 
these then were the two chief sets of feudal grievances felt in the thirteenth century increase of feudal burdens and curtailment of feudal privileges that made the barons restive under even the indomitable energy of the formidable henry under henry's hot-tempered sons richard and john both forms of oppression were pressed home more ruthlessly on the tenants of the crown and a third set of grievances was added in the failure of both these princes for different reasons to continue the efficient orderly system of government for which the barons under henry had paid so heavy a price and in the employment of a class of unscrupulous foreign adventurers who were placed as officers of the royal household and as sheriffs or bailiffs in every county of the land every feudal service and incident was made more galling by the stringent methods of enforcement john adopted scutages in particular or money paid in commutation of actual military service in the field increased in frequency and in amount and became more burdensome from the rigorous manner of their exaction every rule of the unwritten but well recognized feudal law was broken by john and his horde of unbridled mercenaries such as engelard of Sigogne and geoffrey of martigny and their associates branded by name in the fiftieth chapter of magna carta cruel private wrongs inflicted by john as a man added to the growing flame of resentment kindled by his extortions lawlessness and inefficiency as a ruler by twelve thirteen the barons seething with discontent only waited an opportunity to demand redress with weapons in their hands direction and point and unity of action were given to their endeavours when archbishop stephen langton a name ever to be honoured by the heirs of english liberty produced a copy of the coronation charter granted in the year eleven hundred by john's great-grandfather henry i as a model from which they might begin at least to formulate their claims for reform of abuses only a fit occasion was needed for the rebellion to break forth and that occasion came in the autumn of twelve fourteen when john set sail from france vanquished and humiliated by the complete failure of his grandiose schemes for winning back from philip augustus the lost french provinces of the angevin inheritance by means of a grand alliance with the emperor as its central figure returning discomfited on fifteen october twelve fourteen john found himself confronted with a domestic crisis unique in english history the northern barons took the lead in demanding redress their cup of wrath that had long been filling overflowed when a new scutage at the unprecedentedly high rate of three shillings for each knight's fee was demanded roger of wendover narrates how after a futile conference with john on four november the magnates met at bury st edmund's as if for prayers but there was something else in the matter for after they had held much secret discourse there was brought forth in their midst the charter of king henry the first which the same barons had received in london from archbishop stephen of canterbury after binding themselves by a solemn oath to take united action against the king the barons separated to prepare for the resort to arms the muster being fixed for christmas the covenanters kept their tryst a deputation from the insurgents met john in london at the temple on six january twelve fifteen and a truce was patched up till easter in april the northern barons again met in arms and marched southward to brackley they were met there by emissaries from the king to inquire as to their demands who took back with them to john a certain schedule the rude draft that was afterwards expanded into the baronial manifesto that is to-day exhibited to the public in the british museum in the same case with magna carta commonly known as the articles of the barons but describing itself more fully and accurately as Capitula que barones petunt et dominus rex concedit. John's consent, however, was not to be easily obtained. When the embassy bore back these demands to Wiltshire, where the king then was, John, livid with fury, declared, with his favourite blasphemous oath, that he would never grant them liberties that would make himself a slave, asking sarcastically, Why do not the barons, with these unjust exactions, demand my kingdom on five may the barons having chosen as their leader robert fitzwalter acclaimed by them as marshal of the army of god and holy church 
performed the solemn feudal ceremony of diffidatio or renunciation of their fealty and homage a formality indispensable before vassals could without infamy wage war upon their feudal overlord absolved from their allegiance at wallingford by a canon of durham they marched on london on the attitude of which all eyes now turned with solicitude when the great city opened her gates to the insurgents setting an example to be immediately followed by other towns she practically made the attainment of the great charter secure the mayor of london thus takes an honoured place beside the archbishop of canterbury among the band of patriots to whose initiative england owes her charter of liberties john deserted on all sides and with an exchequer too empty for the effective employment of mercenary armies agreed to a conference on the ninth day of june a date afterwards postponed until the fifteenth of the same month it was on fifteen june then in the year twelve fifteen that the conference began between john supported by a slender following of half-hearted magnates upon the one side and the mail-clad barons backed by a multitude of determined and well-armed knights upon the other the conference lasted for eight days from monday of one week till tuesday of the next on monday the fifteenth john set seal to the demands presented to him by the barons accepting every one of their forty-eight articles with the additional forma securitatis or executive clause vesting in twenty-five of their number full authority to constrain king john by force to observe its provisions this was merely a preliminary measure numerous minor points had yet to be adjusted before the final settlement which took place on friday nineteen june when the completed charter containing the substance of the articles in an altered sequence and with numerous additions and amendments as to points of detail was also sealed not merely in duplicate or triplicate but in considerable numbers each of the great english cathedral churches in particular receiving a certified parchment for its own four of these originals still exist two of them in the british museum one at lincoln and one at salisbury the more famous of the museum copies originally posted in dover castle is now scarred by the marks of fire and in part illegible throughout the conferences as in the discussions and embassies that preceded them stephen langton played the leading part alike in giving direction and unity of aim and moderation to the councils of the barons in preventing complete rupture of diplomatic relations in pressing the barons just claims upon the king while remaining a faithful servant of the best interests of the crown and perhaps also in focusing the baronial demands and thus accepting in some sort the responsibilities of an editor in the drafting of the actual clauses of magna carta the great charter whose weighty declaration quod anglicana ecclesia libra sit has helped to build into one whole the rights of the national church with the constitutional liberties of the nation so that they should act as mutual buttresses was thus merely repaying the obligation it owed to the greatest of english primates when john on that friday morning of a memorable june set seal to the completed record of his surrender known to contemporaries as carta liberatatum or carta baronum or carta de ranimede and to after ages simply and preeminently as the great charter he had no intention of being bound by his promises longer than circumstances compelled him the wax on which the great seal had been impressed had scarcely hardened when john appealed to rome for leave to repudiate his consent alleging his intention of going on crusade in response innocent the third issued a bull in which he sternly forbade under ban of anathema that john should observe the charter or that the barons and their accomplices should exact its enforcement at a lateran council innocent excommunicated all those english barons who had persecuted his liegemen john king of england crusader and vassal of the church of rome by endeavouring to take from him his kingdom a fief of the holy see meanwhile the points at issue between the english king and his feudatories had passed from the sphere of conferences legal documents and diplomacy to the sphere of civil war the insurgents in their urgent need 
invited the aid of louis son of the french king offering him the rich guerdon of the crown of england the fortunes of war still trembled in the balance when john's death at newark on nineteen october twelve sixteen and the consequent desertion of the french prince's cause by many of the english barons paved the way for the healing of internal discords on a peaceful and permanent basis william the marshal acting as regent for the boy king son and heir of john accepted and confirmed the great charter in young henry's name subject to certain omissions and modifications as the basis of his future scheme of government confirmations of the charter were accordingly issued in twelve sixteen on henry's accession and in twelve seventeen when it was arranged by treaty that louis of france should renounce his pretensions to the english throne and depart from england and finally in henry's third great charter impressed with his own seal in twelve twenty five magna carta took its definitive shape assuming the form word for word in which it stands to-day as the earliest enactment on the statute rolls of england thenceforward the almost sacred text of the great charter has remained fixed and stereotyped together with that of the forest charter which issued in twelve twenty five for the first time as a separate document formed its natural complement the two being confirmed together in future reigns without suffering variation in one jot or tittle new confirmations in twelve thirty seven and twelve fifty three were accompanied by solemn ceremonials repeated on several occasions during the reign of edward i the constitutional importance and results of the confirmatio cartarum of twelve ninety seven are known to all and of later confirmations coke has counted fifteen under edward the third eight under his grandson richard six under henry the fourth and one under henry the fifth no further confirmation was required thereafter for the great charter had by that time been woven inextricably into the fabric of the national law and the national life such in brief were the stages in the genesis of the great charter of english liberties from even the hastiest examination of these facts one question emerges and presses for an answer whence did the charter acquire the right to be described without qualification and without rival as being great why did the granting of it mark an epoch in english history and perhaps in the history of civilization whence came its world-wide fame to begin with it is obvious that its title to distinction cannot be exclusively derived from any one of its isolated characteristics for its chief merits in the eyes of different ages have not always been the same gazing backwards over the crowded centuries that separate the present from the day when john surrendered to the male fists of the feudal host at runnymede is it possible to estimate the stages by which the prestige of magna carta has slowly been built up the task is no easy one but it would seem that three separate periods may be distinguished in each of which the chief merits of the charter have been differently rated being found respectively in its reference to the present the future and the past the first epoch the importance of the charter for the men of twelve fifteen did not lie in what forms its main value for the constitutional theorists of to-day to the barons at runnymede its merit was that it was something definite and utilitarian a present help for present ills to them it was by no means what it became to the english lawyers and historians of a later age who looked on it as something intangible and ideal a symbol standing for the essence of the constitution a bulwark of english liberties to the barons every clause was valued because it gave relief from a current wrong little they thought of its influence on the development of constitutional liberty in future ages the individual crown tenant smarted under the steadily increasing burden of feudal exactions his scutages were more frequent and at a higher rate on succeeding to his fief he had been forced to pay a relief of an amount bounded only by the limits of john's greed if his father's lands had fallen into wardship on coming of age he found them exhausted and laid waste when he died his widow and children would be subjected to a host of harrying and unjust exactions in magna carta he sought an immediate remedy to these embittering ills 
the same crown tenant found that by the insidious extension of the use of certain royal writs the profitio able jurisdiction of his court baron was being infringed and his authority as a local magnate undermined he found too that where the royal justice was beneficial it was fitfully administered and that the same upstart aliens on whom john bestowed in marriage the best dowered heiresses of the realm were given a free hand to abuse the powers of the lucrative offices that were showered upon them to magna carta the baron looked as an immediate end of all these abuses and irregularities no contemporary estimates of the value of magna carta considered as one whole are extant the biographer of william the marshal excuses himself from discussing the charter and the civil war on the ground that there were too many incidents which it would not be honourable to recount the chief contemporary source of information is a chronicle composed by a minstrel who visited england in the train of robert of bethune one of john's familiars who gives a fragmentary catalogue of particular clauses rather than a general estimate the provisions of the charter which this troubadour found worthy of mention were the clauses that redressed three abuses namely the disparagement of heiresses the loss of life or limb for killing deer and the encroachment on feudal courts and the clause appointing the baronial executive committee the selection of these four topics as of outstanding value gives point to the view already expressed that to the men of twelve fifteen magna carta was an intensely practical document valued as an immediate remedy of present ills with nothing whatever of the glamour of romance the second epoch by the stuart era if not earlier a marked change had taken place after a period of comparative neglect the great charter established new claims to popular esteem when it proved its usefulness as a shelter against the stretches of prerogative by a james or charles stuart it is interesting to compare the glowing rhetoric of coke with the colder estimates contemporary with magna carta speaking of one of the charter's famous clauses sir edward coke breaks thus into rhapsody as the gold finer will not out of the dust threads or shreds of gold let pass the least crumb in respect of the excellency of the metal so ought not the learned reader to pass any syllable of this law in respect of the excellency of the matter by that age the charter had become too a powerful instrument of reform in the hands of the leaders of the parliamentary opposition to the arbitrary government that accompanied the stuart doctrine of the divine right of kings it became indeed the strongest link that bound together past and future in the constitutional development of english freedom it served this purpose all the better because of the antique flavour of its language in redressing old world abuses of which the seventeenth century had forgotten the meaning the very fact that many of the feudal grievances of twelve fifteen had died a natural death and been forgotten centuries before the struggle with the stuarts began that much of its phraseology was no longer understood made it possible for coke and hampton elliot and pym and hakewell to give to its numerous clauses meanings that favoured their own aspirations in the cause of constitutional progress for its seventeenth-century exponents the charter's great value lay thus in its bearing on the future by discovering precedents for a desired reform in some obscure passage of magna carta a needed innovation might be readily represented as a return to the time-honoured practice of the past the veneration with which his contemporaries viewed the antiquarian and black-letter learning of sir edward coke that unrivalled master of the intricacies of the common law secured the unquestioned acceptance of his declaration of what exactly had been meant by obscure chapters of the charter the great charter as enshrined in the imaginations of the parliamentary leaders of the puritan rebellion was to a great extent the creation of coke's legal intellect it has been contended indeed in a brilliant and still recent article under the startling title of the myth of magna carta that no charter really existed to correspond with the conceptions formed of it by the leaders of the long parliament and that coke was the creator of the charter or of the myth which alone had political significance or value it seems safer however to maintain that there are two great charters or two aspects of one charter each of which 
valuable in its own sphere and period has rendered inestimable services to the growth of sound theories of government the original feudal charter and the charter of seventeenth-century interpretations part at least of the greatness of the charter would thus seem to lie not so much in what it was to its framers in twelve fifteen as in what it afterwards became to the political leaders to the judges and lawyers and to the entire mass of the people of england in later ages the third epoch in our own day when the privilege of living under the best constitution in the world has come to be more lightly valued by a generation who are prone to take their heritage for granted magna carta is no longer resorted to as an indispensable storehouse of precedents for desired reforms its chief value is not now for its bearing on the present as it was to the men of twelve fifteen nor on the future as it was to the men of sixteen twenty eight or sixteen eighty eight but as a helpful means of reconstructing the past the vivid glimpses that the charter gives us of life in england in the early thirteenth century open as it were a window into the past to understand the charter aright in all the clauses of its sixty-three chapters traversing as these do fields both wide and various requires intimate knowledge of every phase of mediaeval england whether feudal social economic legal or political from the many points at which it touches the life and customs of the middle ages its elucidation affords ample illustration of the principles that must animate every teacher of history who seeks to gain the permanent interest of his hearers that root principle is the necessity of never for one moment forgetting the closeness of the tie that binds the dead past to the living present there is no document however dry and obsolete it may to-day appear which did not spring from a human situation that was once alive with hopes and fears the pigeon-holes of a lawyer's office with their scores of uninteresting-looking documents tied neatly into bundles with red tape are as it were the fossil bones of human ambitions and passions and tragedies that have long since been struck cold to the eye of imagination however there shines through every one of them some ray of the sentiments and emotions with which they were once instinct the lumbering clauses of the articles of his deed of partnership cannot quite conceal the eager hopes of the young merchant making a first start in life the proceedings in bankruptcy mark the close of a long-drawn agony the last will and testament suggests thoughts that run through the whole gamut of the infinite pathos of human life similar results flow from the application of imagination to any historical document and notably is this true of the interpretation of magna carta read this feudal charter apart from its historical context and without any effort of imaginative sympathy and taking it thus dull clause by clause you will find it wearisome to extinction but read it in the light of all that is known of life in the middle ages read it in the light of the human passions and ambitions and wildly beating hopes of the barons in whose interests it was framed read it in the light of its magnificent historical setting and behold you have transformed the whole what is the writ precipi or the assize of novel decision or the crown's right of prerogative wardship to the men of to-day nothing if we are ignorant of the once living context much if we have the sympathy and historical insight to set them in their true perspective against a background of medieval life the problem then for the historical teacher as for the historical researcher is how best to reconstruct the once full-blooded life of the past out of the dry bones that now cumber the ground the hebrew prophet ezekiel chapter thirty seven verses one to ten has described how this miracle comes to pass the hand of the lord set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and said unto me prophesy upon these bones and say unto them ye dry bones hear the word of the lord so i prophesied as i was commanded and as i prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone and when i beheld lo the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above but there was no breath in them 
so i prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army so only by the spirit of sympathy and the breath of historical imagination can the dry bones of history be made to live again the nature and the motives of the interest that is to-day taken in magna carta are thus widely different from those that influenced the men of the seventeenth century and both are different from those of the thirteenth it is therefore useless to seek for any one quality as the sole source of the charter's fame it is further plain that its value cannot lie in any principle of logical arrangement for the chapters are grouped in a disorderly manner as though they had been jotted down exactly as they occurred to the memory of the framers and that hurriedly in case they might be quickly again forgotten the time now available makes it impossible if indeed it were desirable to give a detailed account of the sixty-three chapters of magna carta or even to attempt their classification while a mere catalogue would serve no useful end there is certainly no one clause to which the chief value of the charter can be exclusively traced no such monopoly can be claimed for the twelfth and fourteenth chapters limiting the king's power of imposing aids and scutages without the commune concilium of the realm nor for the thirty-ninth which gave security of life and property against john's arbitrary interference by affording the protection of judicium parium nor for the famous fortieth chapter that declared in oft quoted words to no one will we sell to no one will we refuse or delay right or justice nor can it be claimed even for that extraordinary sixty-first chapter which provided machinery for enforcing all the rest by means of a committee of twenty-five of the baronial opposition to whom john granted authority under certain conditions of coercing him by the forcible seizure of his castles lands and possessions one who searches for the causes of the charter's greatness must thus look elsewhere than to even the most famous of its isolated provisions the elements indeed that have contributed to the constitutional influence of magna carta are numerous and varied while an attempt to classify these elements on any principle of absolute mutual exclusion would be artificial and stultifying they may yet perhaps be regarded as roughly falling under the seven following heads the inherent merits of the charter its historical setting its continuity with the past its continuity with the future the number and solemnity of its confirmations its flexibility and its success in taking hold upon the popular imagination the great charter is famous first because of its inherent merits because of its moderation the wide orbit of its range its preference for practical details rather than vague generalities its assertion of the existence of settled usages to which the king binds himself to conform this is perhaps the cardinal principle of the whole its insistence that there is something higher and more sacred than the will of sovereigns and rulers secondly it is famous because of its vivid historical setting christendom was impressed by the spectacle of an anointed king obliged to surrender at discretion to his rebellious subjects the fact that john was compelled to accept what previously he had passionately refused meant a loss of royal prestige and an encouragement to future resisters of oppression the dramatic circumstances of john's humiliation were stamped indelibly on the minds of future generations thirdly it is famous because of its continuity with the past it was modelled in some measure on the charter of henry the first and that charter was in some respects an embodiment of the terms of the old coronation oath under which the conqueror and his sons had sworn to observe the laws of edward the confessor's reign and that oath can in turn be traced back to the days of the early kings of wessex the demand for the confirmation of magna carta took the place of the older battle cry of a return to the laws of good king edward and the halo as of a golden age that surrounded the lieges edwardi was transferred to their supposed new embodiment in john's charter of liberties fourthly it became famous for its continuity with the future because it stands directly in the line of development of english liberty and the reign of law 
because it marks the first decisive step in the establishing of a system of government of great value to the whole of the civilized world slow and sure has been the motto of the builders of english liberty and the influence of magna carta and of the circumstances that gave it birth have been woven into the whole fabric of our constitutional continuity for one thing the winning of the charter marks the beginning of a new grouping of political forces in england no longer as in the days of those three master builders of our constitution william the conqueror henry beauclerc and henry plantagenet were crown and people united in the name of law and order against a baronage that contended for feudal license all this was changed in twelve fifteen the mass of merchants and yeomen the small sub-vassals and the clergy had in that year formed a league with the barons as the new champions of law and order against the crown that had now become the chief law-breaker this association with new allies was accompanied by a change of baronial policy convinced that the complete feudal independence of each feudatory in his own territory was now impossible the feudal magnates sought to control and guide the royal power they could no longer defy magna carta was the first fruit of this new policy and thus stands directly in the line of constitutional development fifthly it is also famous because of its numerous reissues and confirmations and because of the solemnity with which some of these have been accompanied it is true indeed that we are dependent upon an authority of some centuries later date for some of the most impressive details Hollinshed, embroidering on the narrative of matthew paris relates how in a parliament held at london in twelve fifty three after henry the third had confirmed the charter sentence of excommunication was pronounced by the archbishop of canterbury and thirteen of his bishops revested and apparelled in pontificalibus with tapers according to the manner against all transgressors of the liberties of the church and of the ancient liberties and customs of the realm of england and namely those which are contained in the great charter and the charter of forest whilst the sentence was in reading the king held his hand upon his breast with glad and cheerful countenance and when in the end they threw away their extinct and smoking tapers saying so let them be extinguished and sink into the pit of hell which run into the dangers of this sentence the king said so help me god as i shall observe and keep all these things even as i am a christian man as i am a knight and as i am a king crowned and anointed sixthly the charter was found valuable as a weapon in the hands of later champions of freedom because of its flexibility the original meaning of many of its clauses was in later centuries forgotten and after the decay of feudalism new interpretations as we have seen superseded older ones the process which substituted the redress of the abuses most bitterly felt in later centuries for those actually redressed in twelve fifteen was usually a perfectly honest one and thus even mistaken interpretations of magna carta have contributed to the advance of sound principles of government this process of constantly adapting the half obsolete provisions of magna carta to meet the changing needs of succeeding generations had been begun in the reign of john's famous grandson if not even in that of his son while the interpretations of some of its most famous clauses commonly entertained under edward the third would have astonished alike john and his opponents but the process of modernization culminated only in the reign of the stuarts if the inaccurate eulogies of coke and hampton have obscured the bearing of many chapters and diffused false notions as to the development of english law the service these very errors have rendered to the cause of constitutional progress is measureless what was originally an affirmation of the validity of feudal law and custom against the arbitrary caprice of john became in time an affirmation of seventeenth-century national law against the arbitrary stretches of prerogative by the stuart kings in furtherance of their personal or dynastic aims magna carta in this way became a bridge between the older monarchy limited by the restraints of medieval feudalism and the modern constitutional monarchy limited by a national law enforced by parliament to the fame gained by magna carta in respect of its real and original meaning 
must thus be added to the fame gained by the imaginary magna carta as evolved from the earlier charter by the learning of coke and his parliamentary associates we have seen how in the seventeenth century it became a means of cloaking innovations in the guise of a return to the past and how in an age averse from constitutional innovations it enabled the opponents of the divine right of kings to gain for their policy the approval of staid upholders of the venerated past the elasticity of the great charter has thus enabled it to adapt itself to the ever-changing needs of succeeding centuries and each century that enjoyed its powerful aid has heaped upon it in return tributes of grateful veneration and has read into it new principles of which its frame has never dreamed seventhly and lastly it has enjoyed an enduring fame because of the hold which for these and other reasons it gained and held for many generations upon the popular imagination its emotional and moral value is perhaps even greater than its strictly legal or constitutional value all government is at bottom founded on public opinion upon sentiments either of affection and veneration or of fear psychological considerations are often all-powerful in the world of politics and morality it is no disparagement of magna carta then to admit that part of its value has been read into it by later generations and that its power now lies in the halo almost of romance that has collected round it in the course of centuries sentiment counts for much in the most practical affairs of men it is the sentiment that has brought the flower of anglo-saxon and celtic manhood from the shores of the seven seas from africa australasia canada and india to fight the mother country's battles in europe and in asia the twin sentiments of love of empire and love of home and these men claim justly as their right a full share in the goodly heritage of the free institutions and traditions of the homeland of which magna carta forms an essential part the great charter is great because in ages long after its framers were dead and forgotten it became a shield and buckler behind which constitutional liberty could take shelter fortified as it had been by the veneration of ages it became a strongly entrenched position that the enemies of arbitrary government could safely hold apart from the salutary effect of many of its original enactments its moral influence has steadily contributed to an advance in the national spirit and therefore to the more firm founding of the national liberties the value of the great charter has continually increased in the seven hundred years during which traditions associations and aspirations have clustered ever more thickly round it in the forefront of this long catalogue of virtues however there lies the one great cardinal merit of the charter which has already been insisted on namely that it is in essence an admission by an anointed king that he was not an absolute ruler that he had a master in the laws he had often violated but now once more swore to obey that his prerogative was defined and limited by principles more sacred than the will of kings and that the community of the realm had the right to compel him when he refused of his own free will to comply magna carta affirmed the doctrine that kings are accountable for their deeds and thus paved the way for the shifting of the responsibility from the king to his ministers holding office at the will of a representative parliament in conclusion it may not be profitable to ask what valuable lessons if any magna carta and its historical context have for the men of nineteen fifteen in this time of unparalleled stress and anxiety here two lines of thought suggest themselves one connected with our foreign relations and the other with our domestic troubles and reforms one set of problems lies in the realm of international and the other of constitutional law and both of them turn on the possibility of substituting peaceful methods for brute force in settling acute differences of opinion there are two ways and only two of reconciling conflicting principles and interests one is by the method of rational men the other of savages and wolves and tigers the one proceeds by the devising and enforcing of wise laws and the framing of constitutions the other by the arbitrament of war take the international problem first 
more than nineteen centuries have elapsed since the prince of peace was born into the world at bethlehem war and the horrors of war should surely be obsolete and impossible in this twentieth christian century and yet never has a more widespread unremitting or inhuman war been waged than is waged to-day what hopes then remain for the priests of peace must they with averted faces renounce all hope of the long-expected time when wars shall cease the events surrounding magna carta would seem to furnish them with a ray of hope however dim for in twelve fifteen the granting of the charter was the beginning not the end of a bitter civil war and at that date the possibility of permanently superseding domestic strife by peaceful constitutional methods seemed as remote as the possibility of devising machinery to prevent recurrence of war among rival nations appears to-day yet in twelve fifteen in spite of the blackest of outlooks the process had really commenced of substituting in domestic troubles the settlement by reason for the settlement by brute force a constitution for england had already in twelve fifteen begun to be evolved similarly may it not be possible that in nineteen fifteen when everything looks its blackest for the friends of peace we may not be far from the coming of the dawn international law may yet achieve what seems so impossible to-day just as constitutional law has achieved what seemed equally impossible in twelve fifteen the second problem or group of problems for light on which we turn to the history of magna carta affects the internal policy of great britain and the british empire the present generation of englishmen like the spendthrift heirs of an industrious father show a tendency to underestimate the value of that priceless heritage of the british constitution that has come to them without effort of their own as a product of the labour and the forethought of the generations that have gone before why is it that constitutional privileges that are the envy of all civilised foreign nations privileges that were esteemed alike by pitt and fox and edmund burke by blackstone hallam mill and macaulay by wellington and earl grey by peel and palmerston and lord john russell by gladstone disraeli and john bright have come to be cheaply held as airy trifles to be taken for granted or to be lightly bartered away for the rapid attainment of the moment's transient and loud-voiced needs why was it that even for years before the evil example set by germany at the commencement of her war against the foundations of civilization there appeared everywhere signs of a tendency at work to discredit the constitutional heritage to which so many generations of britons have contributed of a retrograde movement away from the method of settling disputes by the discussion of what is just and right to the method of self-help by organized violence whatever the reason the facts are undoubted a spirit of lawlessness discontent and greed had even before the fateful august of nineteen fourteen bred a quick impatience of every constitutional barrier that stood in the way of its own immediate gratification it had ceased to be remembered that even red tape whether of the moral or legal variety is an excellent thing in its own place this universal impatience with legal and traditional restraints from which great britain can by no means claim to have been wholly free was perhaps only part of a great wave of discontent with constitutional impediments which culminated in the felons act of germany in repudiating the obligations of her plighted word and violating every accepted code of law and honour the time will come however when the tide will turn when public opinion will recognize once more the merits of the slow but sure constitutional methods of settling disputes when the british constitution readjusted and amended perhaps to meet the new destinies that lie ahead will return into sunshine of popular favor when magna carta and other scraps of paper or of parchment will come to their own again the centre of world interest will then swing back again from the work of the bayonet and the howitzer to the work of the pen then all eyes will centre once more on constitutional problems of which three at least are likely to occupy the foreground of public attention the framing of a new perhaps federal constitution for the british isles 
the framing of a new imperial constitution to bind the overseas dominions more closely to the motherland the framing of some stepping-stone at least toward a scheme of government for europe and the world capable of substituting the decisions of justice and reason for the grim arbitrament of war for that new world towards whose dawn we are peering through the darkness yet with stout hope in our hearts magna carta has grave lessons which it cries aloud with no uncertain voice the part that the great charter has played in achieving the enduring reforms of earlier centuries is a sermon on the text of slow but sure it teaches the value of continuity in all matters of constitutional development it shows that ground to be permanently held against the encroachments of the enemy must be slowly and painfully acquired and carefully entrenched yard by yard against the inevitable counter-attack to be openly delivered or prepared more insidiously underground magna carta and its historical context proclaim to all idealists who are in haste for quick results the danger of breaking with the past framers of new schemes of government whether for the united kingdom or the empire will find sure evidence of the strength given to national institutions by continuity when they look back on the long slow steady growth of the english constitution through the vicissitudes of the seven hundred years that separate the conference at runnymede from the present day when the happy day has dawned on which britons meet to celebrate on bended knee the restoration of peace to a tortured europe they will do well to return thanks also for the free land into which they and their sons were born a land of settled government a land of just and old renown where freedom broadens slowly down from precedent to precedent end of section two read by carol box in surrey england two thousand and fifteen Section 3 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Innocent the Third and the Great Charter by Professor G. B. Adams, Ph.D. That John expected the Pope to release him from his obligation to the Charter upon some ground or other is, I think, reasonably certain. That the Pope honestly believed that he was acting with complete authority in doing so is even more clear from the evidence. But no attempt has ever been made, so far as I am aware, to show by an analysis of the evidence upon what basis of legal right the Pope supposed he was resting his bull of 24 August 1215 or to subject his right to annul the charter to a legal criticism. I can hope in this paper to do no more than to make a beginning in that direction. To determine the legal basis of the Pope's action, one turns first of all to the bull itself, but the answer which it gives is too indefinite to be satisfactory. One naturally expects to find the Pope's action based upon the vassal relation of England to the papacy. This relationship is indeed clearly mentioned in the bull, but it is not emphasized. It is put forward as one fact among others, explaining the Pope's interest in the case, but his interest in the fact that John was a crusader is more strongly insisted on. Nowhere is the feudal relationship asserted as the ground of right on which the Pope was acting, nor is there any attempt made to show that the charter reduced the value of the fief, or its ability to perform the service by which it was held, nor are these facts even asserted. In the formal phrases of annulling at the close of the bull, it is the apostolic authority which is put forward, and there is no mention of the feudal relationship. So far as the language of the bull is concerned, there is nothing in it to prevent our saying that, if the relationship had not existed, the Pope would have taken the same action. If now we turn from the bull to the other contemporary evidence, documentary and chronicle, which has come down to us, the information we gain is no more definite, but certain things bearing on the question stand out rather clearly. 1. The feudal dependency of England upon the papacy was recognized by all parties during the whole period, with the single exception of Philip II of France and his son, in their debate with the Pope. They, however, do not deny the fact of the relationship, but the right of John to enter into it and its legality. 
John, of course, makes the matter entirely clear in his two charters, recording his oath of fiality of 15 May and 3 October, 1215. He there calls England for the first time, Patrimonium Beati Petri, a phrase recurring again in connection with the charter. In his letters, in 1215, John also refers frequently and clearly to the relationship, as does also the Pope, and the phrase, Patrionium Petri occurs several times. Too much emphasis has, I think, been placed upon the barons' recognition of the vassal relationship in their letter to the Pope in February 1215, for rhetorical purposes merely, but they certainly do recognize it, according to the statement of John's envoy. 2. In certain cases John had acted, or seems at first sight to have acted, as the Pope's vassal. 1. He sought a confirmation from the Pope of his grant of freedom of election to the churches of 15 January 1215. That this is the act of a feudal vassal seeking a confirmation from his lord of a grant which would be invalid without it is exceedingly doubtful. It probably would have been sought in any case. The prelates would naturally desire this sanction added to the king's grant. The confirmation is Actoritata Apostolica Confirmamus and there is no reference in it to the feudal relationship nor to the feudal rights. The language of all the clauses of confirmation and sanction follows closely the model which had long been in use in the papal chancery for similar confirmations issued in large numbers to monasteries and churches with reference to lands and rights by whomsoever given. It is not possible to cite this case as evidence of action upon feudal principles. 2. Confirmation was also sought from the Pope of the arrangement made with Berengaria in 1215 in regard to her dower rights. In this case, the papal confirmation is lacking, though one was sent to Berengaria in answer to her request, and one was no doubt sent to John. We have, however, John's requests, two separate requests of even date, in regard to the two distinct agreements. In these no references made directly or indirectly to the feudal position of the Pope. In the one which concerns the main agreement, there is no request for confirmation, but, in the language of the agreement, the Pope is asked, Ut presenti compositioni adat securitatis quas veredit expiride et nos retum habibimus quince quid indi statureat. In the second the word confirmat is used, but clearly not in a technical sense, and the meaning of this request is the same as in the first, not that the Pope will make legal something which is otherwise beyond the capacity of the contracting party, but that he will add further, unknown, sanctions to the agreement. This is quite in accordance with what would at any time be normal, considering the question between the parties and the Pope's earlier interest in the case. In a letter on the subject addressed to John in 1207, he had clearly stated the grounds of his right to act in the case, his special duty towards widows, and commanded, mandamus, him to represent, in presentia nostra, what he was going to do. This case is also clearly non-feudal. 3. In his letter of 29 May, 1215, John said that he had declared to the barons that his land was the patrimony of St. Peter, held of him and of the Roman Church and of the Pope, that he emphasized to them his obligations and claimed his privileges as a crusader, and then appealed through the earls of Pembroke and Warren against the disturbers of the peace of the land. Roger of Wendover states that John's messengers to the Pope, presumably those whom he says the king sent soon after granting the charter, in the account of events which they gave to the Pope, mentioned an appeal by the king before the entry of the barons into London. In his bull of 24 August, the Pope says that John had twice appealed to him. There is no further evidence for these statements, but there is no reason to doubt them. It should be noted that they give us no clear evidence of the ground on which the appeal was made. 4. Roger of Wendover, in the account just referred to, makes the king's envoys say that at some indefinite time before the granting of the charter, John publicly protested before the barons that, because the kingdom of England belonged to the Roman Church, Rationi Dominii, he could not and ought not to decree anything new without the consent of the Pope, nor to change anything in the kingdom to his prejudice. This same statement is also made by the Pope in the bull of 24 August. Here clearly is an appeal to feudal law. The Pope's attention was called to a principle upon which he might act against the charter, and that principle was clearly in his mind when the bull was drawn up. Nevertheless, it was not made the basis of the Pope's action. 
In regard to the point of law, we may so far anticipate the latter discussion as to say that, in the first part of his statement, John was quite wrong, and in the second, more nearly right. 5. In the bull of 24 August, the Pope says that after offering to the barons, secundum formum mandati nostri justitii plenidudinum exhibiri, which they refused, the king, ad audientium nostrum appellans, obtulit eis exhibiri justitiam coram nobis, ad quos hujus causae juditium rationi dominii pertinibat. This is the first appeal mentioned by the Pope, and if the appeals have been correctly indicated in three above, it is the one made through the earls of Pembroke and Warren. In his letter, 29 May, John, in mentioning this appeal, does not add these legal particulars, and the source of the Pope's information is not evident. Judging by his general practice, however, he was probably following English information from some source. It is also quite possible that John, in order to confuse the situation, may have made an appeal in some such terms. It is out of the question, however, that any practical result should follow from such an appeal, or that it should be legally defensible. It is theoretically possible that the Pope could create a lay court of peers for the trial of an appeal by John, but not actually possible. The King of Sicily was in the midst of his campaign for the throne of Germany. The King of Aragon was a minor. The Pope's royal vassals in Hungary and the Balkans could hardly be expected to appear in Rome for such a purpose. A lay court of the Pope's vassals in Rome and its neighborhood could easily have been called together, but it would hardly have been a court of the peers of John. In relation to him, they would be in the position of those who held in England ut de honore instead of ut de corona. The legal difficulties are equally formidable. The language used by the Pope plainly implies a judicial proceeding. If the Pope states the facts correctly, and the evidence goes to show that he did, on the arrival in England of his letter of 29 March, John offered to the barons, quod in curia sua per peris irum secundum legum et consuetidinus regni suborta dissensio superitur. This, however, would not be a suit at law. With reference to the barons' complaints, the king would be in the position of a defendant, but as king he could not be sued. He states the situation with technical correctness in his letter of 29 May, which is probably the source of the Pope's information. He says, Et praeteria eis optilimus, quod de omnibus petitionibus suis, per consideratium parium, suroum justitiae, plenitudium eis exhibirimus. That is, the baron's case could come before the curia regis only by way of petition, and the answer would be a matter of equity. That is, an act of the curia as counsel, not as court, if we may make a distinction perfectly valid in 1215, but which perhaps the men of the day could not have drawn. In such a case, John could have no appeal to his suzerain on technical grounds. Every action of the council was technically his action, and no decision of the whole baronage against him would have any legal validity if he withheld the rexcabot. The only technical appeal possible would be by the barons. They, however, refused the king's offer, and then John appealed, on what grounds we do not know. It could not have been on grounds of legal technicality, but the general appeal to his lord for protection was always open to him, though it could have been made in this case only by a quibble. Equally difficult is the Pope's statement that John offered to do the barons justice before him to whom hujus causae juditium rationi dominii pertinabat. In the relation of England to the papacy, no right of judgment pertained to the Pope, rationi dominii, except in the cases brought before him by way of appeal. It is necessary to say that the Pope is here using language which is apparently technical, but which cannot be justified on such grounds, but only if it is regarded as used in the most general and non-technical sense. John's curia was as fully competent to judge finally every case between the king and the barons after as before he became the vassal of the pope and without any reference to his overlord. His position was not that of an English vassal of the king, but that of one of the sovereign great barons of France, and, under the terms by which the fief was held, he could not even be called up for court service as a matter of right. 3. Although John calls attention several times to his feudal relation to the Pope, and seems disposed to make what he can of it, he clearly does not trust to it as sufficient. On 4 March 1215 he took the cross, thereby gaining the ecclesiastical protection and extensive privileges granted to the crusader, but also securing the interest of the Pope in regard to the plans which Innocent had most deeply at heart. 
In this new relationship John undoubtedly secured all that he needed, and the skillful use which he could make of it is shown in his letter of 29 May, in which he puts the situation in such a light as to make clear to the Pope his inability to take any steps towards the crusade because of the trouble the barons were making. On this ground alone the Pope would undoubtedly have felt himself justified by existing law and practice in acting as he did. Not merely did the privileges granted crusaders relieve them from contracts which interfered with the carrying out of their vows, but the popes assumed the right to protect a crusade and crusaders from any interference with the undertaking. In his excommunication of the crusaders of the Fourth Crusade for their attack on Zara, Innocent based his action wholly on ecclesiastical grounds, and did not allude to the fact that the king of Hungary, whose territory was thus violated, was his vassal whom he would be bound to protect in the possession of his fief. 4. According to Roger of Wendover's account of the embassy to the Pope soon after the granting of the charter, Innocent was informed that the barons had demanded quasdem legis et libertatis iniquias quas dignitatum regium nulli duciet confirmeri. The same chronicler informs us that John, angry at the demands of the barons, presented in their preliminary schedule, cried out, et quare cum istis iniquius exectionibus barons not postulat regnum and attributes a similar exclamation to Innocent when certain clauses of the charter were shown him in writing. If these statements refer to specific demands, it would be exceedingly interesting to know which ones they were. If regarded as intended to furnish a legal basis in feudal law for the Pope's action against the charter, they are certainly much too strong for anything which it contains. The only clauses which demanded extreme concessions from the king, I have discussed elsewhere sufficiently, I think, to show that, taken altogether, they would not justify such statements. If, finally, we turn to feudal law, as understood either in England or upon the continent, to inquire if, by its principles alone, the Pope would have been justified in annulling the charter, the answer must be, I think, in the negative. The details of the law which would apply to the case differed in different countries, but the underlying principle was the same everywhere. Without the Lord's consent, the vassal might do nothing with or in his fief, which reduced its value to himself to such an extent as to endanger his ability to perform the service by which he held it. In some cases this principle was extended to mean that no reduction, however small, like the emancipation of a serf, could be made in the capital, or permanent, value of the fief, undoubtedly with reference to the possibility of escheat, as is stated in the English statute of Mortmain. In applying this principle to the case of Innocent the Third and John, it must first of all be remembered that John did not hold England by indefinite feudal or by military tenure, but by a clearly defined money payment only. That is, England was a feudium sensuale, which is the term applied by Innocent to the exactly similar relation of Aragon to the papacy. In both John's charters of 1213, making the concession to the Pope, and in the Pope's acceptance of 2nd November 1213, the money payment is distinctly said to be pro omnis servicio, et consuetudina, quad pro ipsis farcera de merimas, saving St. Peter's pence. This definition of the service is perfectly clear and normal, and it limits not merely John's obligations, but also the Pope's rights. Under it the Pope would be in duty bound to protect the king in the possession of his fief against any outside attack or any internal revolution which would deprive him of it, but he could find no ground in feudal law on which he could object to any arrangement entered into by his vassal for its internal management which did not seriously affect his ability to pay the specified annual sum. If all the financial clauses of the charter being put together and interpreted as they must have been understood in 1215, the absurdity of supposing that they would justify the annulling of the charter by the overlord would be apparent. But the Pope and the King apparently understood the weakness of such a case notwithstanding John's extreme statements and the Pope's seeming endorsement of them. Neither of them trusted the feudal relationship as a sufficient ground of action against the Charter, and the fact accounts for John's assumption of the cross, and for the way in which the Pope passed over his feudal rights in the bull of 24 August. It is upon his ecclesiastical rights that Innocent founded his action, and upon them alone. Appendix the Pope's letter of 18 June 1215, to which reference is made above, is in the Public Record Office, Papal Bills, Box 52, Number 2. The upper left-hand corner has been destroyed at some time in the past, so that the entire address and portions of diminishing length of the first ten lines have been lost, 
and a single word and portions of words, as indicated in the text, have been lost elsewhere in the letter. The lines contain an average of 202 letter and word spaces. The address was probably general to the people of England. The letter seems to have special reference to John's letter to the Pope of 29 May, and in the first portion it follows rather closely the Pope's letters of 19 March. The text was printed by Pyrene in his History of King John, 1670, page 27, who supplied the address, Innocentius Episcopus, Nobilibus Virus, Universitate Baronum Angliae, Hanc Paginum Inspecturus, Salutum et Apostolicum, Benedictionum, which can hardly be correct, and portions of the missing words, distinguishing his editions in two cases only. Modern historians have mostly not noticed its existence. Ramsey, Agavin Empire, page 486, note 1, refers to Pyrene's text, reference a misprint, and says the letter does not read quite like one of Innocent's utterances. Gasquet, Henry III in the Church, pages 13 to 15, gives a reference to the original, says it was addressed to Langton and the other English bishops, which it certainly was not, and gives an otherwise inaccurate abstract of its contents. There is no reference to it in Pothast. As the letter is highly characteristic of the method in which the papal letters were composed during this conflict, and may be called in some respects a first draft of the bull of 24 August, it seems worth while to print it in a new and more accessible edition. A comparison of the text with that of the other letters, papal and royal, of the crisis, beginning with that to the Eustace de Vinci of 5 November 1214, Reimer, Romanet 1, 126, will show the characteristic borrowing of phrases of which I have spoken. I have referred in the notes by date to some of the more important or interesting cases. It will be noticed that in this letter the Pope says that he has given directions to the Archbishop and his suffragans to excommunicate the barons unless within eight days they come to an agreement with the king according to the form which he had earlier recommended to their messengers. The only papal letter which we have corresponding to this statement is the bull Miramur Purimum, preserved without date by Roger of Wendover, Romanet 3, 336. The dating of this bull is admittedly difficult. Its place among the events of Roger of Wendover's narrative can give us no clue. In Walter of Coventry, Romanet 2, 223, a bull of similar purport is said to have been shown to the bishops at a meeting at Oxford on 16 August. It is dated by Potshast, number 4992, and of August, and most modern historians have accepted Walter of Coventry's date as that at which it was presented. Sir James Ramsay, Avignon Empire, page 478, concludes against August in favor of 16 July. The most serious objection to considering the bull, Miramur Pirimum, to be the one referred to in the letter of 18 June, is the definite statement that the barons were to be allowed an interval of eight days in which to come to an agreement with the king. That statement is not in the bull, Miramur Pirimum. It may have been contained in a supplementary letter, or have been committed to the messengers to be made known orally, as not quite consonant with the dignity of a formal papal command. It should be noticed that the bull shows no knowledge of the charter. I am inclined to believe that it should be dated 18 June, and the meeting at which it was shown to the bishops, 16 July, although I am not prepared to assert this definitely. Text of the Pope's Letter of 18 June Blank Partibus Angliae Nupa Auribus Nostris Blank Odo Regni Angliae Sed Etiam Aliorum Blank Quostam inter eos et carissimum, blank. Opus eset cum humilitate ac devotione repetere, blank. Super hoc iidem barones suos ad nos nuntios destinacent, ut nos ve, blank. De dicemus literis in preceptis, ut conspirationes et conjurationes presumptas, Ad tempore suborte discordiae inter regnum et sacerdotium apostolica de nu, blank, es. Ne talia de ketero temptarentur, in jungerent baronibus ante dictis, ut per devotionis et humilitatis indicia tam animum regis placare, quam recon, blank, es, 
quod ab eo ducerent postulandum conservando sibi regalem honorem et exhibendo servitia debita quibus ipse rex non debebat absque judicio spoliari ac in super blank prefatam in remissione sibi pecaminum in jungendo quatinus benigne pertractans nobiles ante dictos justas petitiones eorum clementa admitteret plena eis in uniendo morando et recedendo secu blank essa pariter atque data ita quod si forte non posset inter eos concordia provenire in curia sua per pares eorum secundum regni consuetudines atque leges mota deberet dissensio terminari barones ipsi nostro non expectato responso postquam idem rex signum crucis assumpsit in subsidium terre sancte contempta justitia quam ipse rex superabundante offerebat eistem contra dominum suum arma movere temeritate nefaria presumpsurunt non timentes taliter crucis negotium impedire ac regni periculum procurare cum pecuniam quam proliberatione terre sancte deberet expendere in destructionem etiam terre sue profundere compelatur quodque nefandum est et absurdum cum ipse rex quasi perversus deum et ecclesiam offendebat illi assistebant eidem cum autem conversus deo et ecclesiae satisfecit ipsum impugnare presumunt sic quae videtur quod conspirationem inherent detestandam ut eum taliter de regno possint eicere hominio et fidelitate sibi prestitis penitus violatis quod quam crudele sit actu et horrendum auditu cum perniciosi exempli materia sit et causa nostris temporibus in audita manifeste conoscit qui cumque judicio utitur rationis unde valde dolendum existit cum hoc in inuriam sumi dei ecclesiae romane ac nostrum contemptum regis et regni opprobrium et periculum et terre sancte ad cuius subsidium se devoverat rex prefatus nimium detrimentum redundat cum igitur debeamus et libenter velimus pacem regni angliae procurare ipsius tubationes propellere ac dicti regis qui vasalus noster existit conservare justitias et inurias propulsare maxime cum idem propter caracterem crucis assumptum specialiter sub nostra protectione consistat prefatis archiepiscopo et suffragani seus in obedientiae virtute districte dedimus in preceptis quatinus nisi prefati barones infra octo dies post susceptionem literarum nostrarum ab eis vel aliquo ipsorum diligente ammoniti recipiarent et servaverent formam descriptam superius a nobis nuntiis eorum presentibus cum multa deliberatione provisam idem omni cavillatione post posita eos et fautores ipsorum sublato cuius libet contradictionis et appellationis obstaculo excommunicationis mucrone percellant et terracilorum ecclesiastico subiciant interdicto facientes utramque sententiam per totam angliam singulis diebus dominicis et festivis solemniter publicari 
ne igitur propter quostam perversos universitatis sinceritas in anglia corumpatur quae hactenus ab infidelitatis contagio fuit prosus immunis universitati vestri per apostolica scripta precipiendo mandamus et in remissionem in jungimus peccatorum quatinus prefato regi adversus perversores huius modi opportunum impendatis auxilium et favorem ita quod in confusionem ipsius et aliorum regnorum non posit tanta nequitia prevalere sed tempestate sedata regnum ipsum optata tranquillitate letetur scientes procerto quod si rex ipse remissus eset aut tepidus in hac parte nos regnum angliae non pateremur ad tantam ignominiam et willitatem de duci cum sciamus per dei gratiam et pusumus talium insolentiam castigare dat terentin ante diem quator decim calendus julii pontificatus nostri anno octavo decimo an endorsement in a later but thirteenth century hand possibly not much later than the original reads inoc de turbacione orta interregum one et baronis angliae verbum ultimum compentis est examinator End of section three. In four of Magna Carta commemoration essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Barons and Knights in the Great Charter by J. H. Round, LLD. The passage in the Great Charter on which I propose to comment is contained in its second chapter and is here italicized. Si quis comitum vel baronum nostrorum, siwe aliorum tenentium de nobis in capite per servicium militare mortuus fuerit, et cum decesserit here sues plene etatis fuerit et relevium debeat habeat hereditatem suam per antiquum relevium scilicet heres vel heredes comitis de baronia comitis integra per centum libras heres vel heredes baronis de baronia integra per centum libras italics heres vel heredes militis de feodo militis integro per centum solidos ad plus End italics. et qui minus deburit minus det secundum antiquam consuetudinem feodorum if we view these provisions in isolation and endeavour to make the text here its own interpreter we observe one that those to whom they apply are the tenants in chief by night service two that these are divided into three categories a earls barons and others b earl baron and knight three that the holdings recognized are only two viz the barony and the knight's fee it is important to observe that in this chapter no distinction is made between greater and lesser barons the difficulty presented by these provisions is that no one has been able to give a satisfactory explanation of the difference between the baron and the knight or between the two holdings here specified when their holders were alike tenants-in-chief by knight service the barons returns of their knights cartae baronum in eleven sixty six imply that all such tenants-in-chief stood on the same footing and that the milites were not among them but were the under tenants whom they had enfeoffed upon their lands the above difficulty was already felt in the seventeenth century 
when selden considered that the holdings of tenants in chief were originally alike in status but were subsequently differentiated some being classed as baronies and others as knights fees maddox on the other hand boldly assumed that the difference in status of the two holdings went back to the norman conquest that quote, william the first enfeoffed his barons of their baronies or his knights of their knights fees End quote. while i do not presume to hope that i shall wholly solve the difficulty by which historians and antiquaries have been so long baffled i shall endeavour to elucidate the problem to the best of my ability and to clear away some of the confusion by which it is at present surrounded for it affects an important development in our constitutional history that problem is the status and fate of those lesser tenants-in-chief who ceased to attend the great council were these lesser barons known as barones minores or as milites and if the latter is it possible to trace any connection between these milites and the representative knights of the shire there has been if i may venture to say so on the part of the commentators on the charter too much glossing and too much assumption when we examine the text itself we find one that in the second chapter dealing with reliefs the two classes below the earls are the baron and the knight two that in the fourteenth chapter dealing with summons to the council the two classes below the earls are the maiores barones and all those others who hold of us in chief it has been assumed but not proved that in both chapters and for both purposes the line of division is the same and it follows as a consequence of this assumption that quote, the barones of one clause of the great charter seem to be the barones maiores of another it seems that the baro who has a baronia in the one clause is the baro mayor who is to have a special summons in the other clause end quote. maitland the constitutional history of england nor is this the only consequence which follows from that assumption for it involves we find the still more improbable equation of the knight miles who held a knight's fee in chapter two with the alleged barones minores of chapter fourteen i use the term alleged because in spite of the freedom with which the phrase is used by the commentators on the charter it is not found in that chapter or indeed anywhere else in the text of the document this is no mere verbal quibble the phrase barones maiores does indeed imply that there were lesser barons but it certainly does not involve the gloss that quote, all those others who hold of us in chief end quote, were barones minores they might and judging from chapter two they would comprise at least the knights as well as the lesser barons in which case these classes were distinct and the alleged equation disappears let me endeavour to make the point absolutely clear the tenants in chief by knight service include according to chapter two a barons b knights chapter fourteen introduces a further distinction by speaking of maiores barones this no doubt implies the existence of barones minores but it does not affect the knights who would remain as before distinct from all barons whether greater or less therefore miles cannot be used as the equation of baro minor putting the point differently the line in chapter two which is concerned with reliefs is so drawn as to include the minor barons with greater ones but in chapter fourteen which is concerned with separate summons it is drawn athwart the baronage and by excluding the lesser barons creates so far as summons is concerned a fresh class again the phrase all others who hold of us in chief in chapter fourteen 
may include in addition to the lesser barons not merely the knights but others such as tenants by sergeanty stubbs indeed admits in one place when speaking of the greater and lesser barons that quote, the entire body of tenants in chief included besides these i e the greater barons the minor barons the knightly body and the sockage tenants of the crown end quote, all of whom he deems were entitled to be summoned by the general summons as provided in chapter fourteen it is true that he writes in another place of the phrase barones secundi dignitatis who are admitted to be identical with the barones minores that quote, hallam rightly understands this to refer to the knightly tenants in chief end quote, which virtually accepts the wrong equation but this only illustrates the need of greater clearness in definition no one i think will suspect me of imperfect appreciation where our great historian is concerned but his work occasionally betrays a certain vagueness of conception a lack of clearness in definition which perhaps is sometimes met with in the work of english scholars for instance we first find him treating of the great council in norman times and recognizing the barons greater and less and the knights as distinct classes among its members but when he turns to the composition of this same great council under henry and his sons he appears to lose sight of the essential distinction between these classes this i think was due to the influence upon him of gneist to whom we may clearly trace the fundamental error of confusing the line drawn by the charter chapter two between the baron and the knight with that which it draws chapter fourteen between the greater baron and the tenants in chief below them Gneist, quote, from the first the distinction between barones maiores and minores was known in the exchequer reliefs wardships and marriages of the great feudatories formed the principal items in the financial administration whilst those of the single knight's fee were fixed at a hundred shillings those of the greater lordships were not until later times fixed at a hundred marks stubbs quote, Gneist points out that in the exchequer the difference of relief between a hundred shillings for the knight and a hundred marks for the baron in the court and in the shire moot the interval between the two classes must have made itself apparent dialogus de scaccario two ten end quote. by the interval between the two classes stubbs here obviously means the distinction of maiores and minores barones yet dialogus de scaccario two ten so far from making that distinction actually denies that there was any so far as relief was concerned here again the identity of the knight with the minor baron is wrongly assumed in the history of english law pollock and maitland it will be found have fallen victims to the same confusion they write vaguely of the greater men and the lesser men and evidently treat as identical the two lines of division which we have to keep distinct another error traceable to gneist is the connection of the distinction between greater and lesser barons with two passages in doomsday gneist quote, at the time of doomsday book the maxim held good that only vassals tiny who possess six maneria or less should pay relevium to the wike comes those possessing more than six maneria pay immediately into the exchequer at all events this principle is expressly mentioned in two counties doomsday two eighty b two ninety eight b end quote. stubbs quote, it may indeed be fairly conjectured that the landowners in doomsday who paid their relief to the sheriff those who held six manors or less and those who paid their relief to the king stood in the same relation to one another end quote, as the greater and lesser barons professor adams similarly refers to the antiquity of the distinction drawn in chapter fourteen of the charter quote, 
See the difference in the payment of relief in Doomsday, 1 to 80. Vinogradov, Society in the 11th Century, page 308, note 2, end quote. Now the two passages in Doomsday to which Gneist refers relate only to Yorkshire and to Derbyshire and Notts, and I have explained in Feudal England, pages 72 to 3, that the practice described is part of that duodecimal system which is peculiar to the Danish district in the northern portion of England. It would not consequently be met with outside that district, that is to say, in the larger portion of the country. It could therefore have nothing to do with the later distinction between greater and lesser barons. This point is of some importance if, improbable though it may seem, we have here the origin of Stubb's statement that the lesser tenants in chief paid their reliefs to the sheriff, but the greater ones direct to the crown. This statement is repeated without question by Maitland, by Pollock and Maitland, and by Professor Medley. It is, however, at variance with the evidence of the pipe rolls, which proves that holders of a single fee or even less are found paying their reliefs as directly to the crown as a great baron. Hitherto I have been endeavouring to prove that the line drawn in the second chapter between barons and knights by the charter has nothing to do with that which it draws in its fourteenth chapter between the greater barons and the rest of the tenants-in-chief. A different and far more difficult question is that of the identity of the knights mentioned in the second chapter. For the wording of that chapter, as I contend, is sufficient to prove that they cannot possibly have been, as is so loosely assumed, the minor barons. How then did they differ in status from the barons, from whom the amount of their relief distinguishes them so sharply? It is usually endeavoured to interpret this chapter of the Charter by the help of A. Glanville's book, B. The Dialogus de Scaccario, both of them written in the latter part of the reign of Henry the Second. Now what Glanville says is this, quote, Cum autem heres masculus et notus heres etatem habens relinquatur, in sua hereditate se tenebit, ut supradictum est etiam in vito domino. Dum tamen domino suo sicut tenetur suum offerat homagium coram probis hominibus et suum rationabile relevium alicuius juxta consuetudinem regni, de feodo unius militis centum solidos, de socagio vero quantum valet census ilius socagi per unum annum, de baroniis vero nihil certum statutum est, quia juxta voluntatem et misericordiam domini regis, Solent baronie capitales de relevis suis domino regi satisfacere. Idem est de se Nine, chapter four. The obvious difficulty of this passage is that Glanville is here speaking of reliefs due to a lord, Dominus, and yet includes among them the reliefs due from baronies to the king. Mr. McKechnie claims that, quote, Glanville's words are ambiguous, end quote, and there seems to be among the latest commentators some difference of opinion as to whether they cover the case of a knight's fee held in chief, ut de corona. The authors of the history of English law are alleged to hold that they do, though this is by no means clear. On the other hand, the learned editors of the Dialogus de Scaccario consider that the holder of such a fee did not enjoy the privilege of a fixed relief, and in this they are followed by Mr. McKechnie and by Professor Adams, who considers him to be right. The view of these writers is based on the Dialogus, which undoubtedly limits the privilege to those knights' fees which were held ut de honore. Si vero de Cesarit, quis tenens tunc de rege feodum militis, non quidem ratione corone regiae, 
sed potius ratione baronie cuius libet que quoiis casu in manum regis de lapsa est sicut est episcopatus vacante sede heres iam defuncti si adultus est pro feodo militis centum solidos numerabit pro duobus decem libras et ita de inceps juxta numerum militum quos domino deburat antequam ad fiscum de voluta foret hereditas two ten e si vero de scaita fuerit que in manu regis deficiente herede well alita inciderit pro feodo militis unius hoc tantum regi nomine relevii soluet quod eset suo domino soluturus hoc est centum solidos two twenty four and quote these statements are exceedingly precise and the editors are justified in inferring from them quote, that the tenant of a single night's fee would be a barrow minor since the certainty of relief depends not on the extent of the estate held but on its being held of a mean lord End quote. on the other hand this is at direct variance with the second chapter of the great charter which draws its line of division between barons and knights unless we restrict the latter to those who held ut de honore this we shall see appears to be opposed to another chapter of the charter as well as to the obvious meaning of chapter two itself unfortunately mr mckechnie seeking to produce record evidence that only the quote, tenants of mean lords had their reliefs fixed end quote, states by a singular error that quote, maddox one three fifteen to sixteen cites from pipe rolls large sums exacted by the crown in one case three hundred pounds was paid for six fees or ten times what a mean lord could have exacted pipe roll twenty fourth regnal year henry the second the reference is obviously to the entry which maddox cites correctly Quote, Ted Baldus de Walenes debet triginta libra sic de relevio sex militum. Magnus Rotulus, 24th regnal year of Henry the Second. The amount, therefore, was not three hundred pounds, but thirty pounds, the very amount that quote, a mean lord could have exacted. End quote the knight's fees to which the dialogus refers in the above parallel extracts cannot well be those mentioned in the second chapter of the charter because their case is specially dealt with in its forty-third chapter moreover if that second chapter is read with care it will be seen that the knight's fee there spoken of had been held not of a mean lord but directly of the crown like a barony otherwise it would be tempting to identify the two as it would dispose of the difficulty raised by the passage in chapter two mr mckechnie however does identify the two but admits that on this hypothesis quote, the need for this reference in chapter forty three to relief is not at first sight obvious end quote it seems to be clear at least that the distinctive privilege of paying only five pounds relief on the knight's fee extended to three classes of fees one those specially mentioned in chapter forty three which were held of an escheated honour such as that of wallingford etc two those which were held of a fief temporarily in the hands of the crown owing to wardship or other cause three those held of an ecclesiastical fief which was in the hands of the crown during a vacancy for all three classes were affected by the same principle viz that the king stood in the shoes of the former holders of the fief and could therefore only exact from the under tenants the same dues as their former lords exacted speaking of this forty-third chapter Mr. McKechnie admits that, though it only mentions this cheats, quote, the same rule applied to subtenants of baronies in wardship, which was analogous to temporary escheat, or of ecclesiastical fiefs during a vacancy. 
it is however conceivable that as mr mckechnie suggests john wanted to draw a distinction by which he could treat knights fees held de escaita as held of him ut de corona and therefore liable like baronies to an arbitrary relief but at least under henry the second the pipe rolls do not show any trace of such a claim and confirm the evidence of the dialogus nor has any evidence i believe yet been produced in support of the suggestion with almost monotonous regularity the pipe rolls record reliefs on fees held de escaita at the rate of five pounds on the fee for instance in eleven seventy two michael de preston pays twenty two pounds ten shillings relief on four and a half nights fees de escaitis regis similarly on a lay fief nigel son of the chamberlain pays fifty seven pounds ten shillings on eleven and a half fees held of the honour of richmond then in the king's hands in eleven seventy five while on an ecclesiastical fief Hamo Fitzwilliam pays eighteen pounds fifteen shillings on three and three quarter fees, and Robert Bruton two pounds ten shillings on half a fee, held in each case of the See of Canterbury in eleven seventy one. It is needless to multiply instances of the rule, but exceptions to the rule are worth noting, though they are not easy to find and here it may be observed that the evidence of the pipe rolls is by no means so easy to use as might be imagined extreme care in identifying the fees on which relief is paid is constantly required as there is often nothing to show whether they are held of a fief or an escheated honour or directly of the king ut de corona for instance in eleven eighty one two men are charged thirty marks relief for two knights fees which had been robert of tilbury's there is nothing to identify these fees or to explain why the relief was twenty pounds instead of ten pounds but they can hardly fail to be the two fees which a later robert of tilbury held of the honour of rayleigh forfeited by henry of essex in West Tilbury and Childerditch, or Denji, Essex. Again, Gilbert, son of Gerbert de Arquis, who pays fifty marks pro fine terre patri sui in eleven eighty two, eludes us, though the mention of a fine instead of a relief leads one to look for his father and himself among the holders of baronies. Gilbert, however, is found only as holding two knights' fees of the honour of Tickhill in 1203. His name is not found in a feudary of the honour later in the reign, but we do there find Malvesin de Grava as the holder of two fees. This entry is explained by one on the pipe roll of 1209, which shows us Malvesin de Hersey and William Rufus charged fifty marks and two palfreys for the succession of their wives to the holding of this Gilbert de Arquis, their father. This holding was in Grove, Grava, Knots, which thus descended to the Herseys of Grove. Now, this case might possibly be claimed as supporting the view that John was trying to extort baronial reliefs from fees held de escaita, but it has been shown that the holder of these fees had been similarly charged fifty marks in 1182, and moreover, the pipe rolls under John show him regularly paying scutage not as the holder of a barony, but only as a tenant of the honour of Tickhill. Mr. McKechnie's actual comment on the escheat portion of the Charter, Chapter 43, is this, quote, This chapter reaffirms a distinction recognised by Henry II, but ignored by John. John ignored this distinction, extending to tenants, ut de escaita, the more stringent rules applicable to tenants, ut de corona. Magna Carta reaffirmed the distinction. End quote. It appears to me that this conclusion is based on the assumption that, because the Charter limits the rights of the Crown, it was John who had attempted to extend these rights. 
my own position is that the pipe rolls show the crown's right to feudal incidents to be already extended under henry the second we have now seen that chapter two of the great charter from which this paper started cannot apply to any of the three categories of knights dealt with by the dialogus that is to say not to those who held of a lay or ecclesiastical fief temporarily in the king's hands because the text forbids it or to those who held of an escheated honour because in addition to straining the text such knights are specially dealt with in chapter forty three which is concerned with escheats footnote possibly the right conclusion here is one which has not yet been suggested namely that the charter nowhere provides for the case of knights fees temporarily in the king's hand owing to a wardship or a vacancy because the rights of their holders had not been encroached upon by the crown escheats however seem to have been recognized as a category apart the reason for this may have been that in early days e g in the case of the forfeited fiefs of the bishop of bayeux and the count of mortain the holdings of large under tenants had actually been converted by the crown into separate baronies owing the service of five or ten knights and appear as such in eleven sixty six these constituted awkward precedents End footnote. who then are the knights that in chapter two are distinguished so sharply from barons by the relief on their succession the ultimate and indisputable evidence on which the answer depends is found in the pipe rolls themselves but that evidence has to be combined with that of the various returns of knights fees especially the cartae baronum of eleven sixty six it may however be said at once that the pipe rolls do show a very marked distinction between the arbitrary sums charged as relief on baronies and those of five pounds or some multiple thereof charged on the knights fees normally though not always the former are further distinguished by the word finis which is rightly used as implying a composition the difficulty about the latter is that we have to make sure that the fees are held as strictly as the baronies ut de corona footnote professor adams states that quote, the relief of a single knight's fee as recorded in the pipe rolls seems to be frequently one hundred shillings when held seek directly of the king end quote. origin of the english constitution page two one four end footnote although we are not here concerned with the reliefs on sergeanties it is advisable to note that those on the pipe rolls confirm glanville's statement as to their arbitrary character for instance in eleven sixty three the charge of a hundred marks on ralph fitzwigan pro relevio terre sue was on a sergeanty of some value though the fact is not stated so also was that of seventy five marks fifty pounds charged to robert fitzhugh in eleven eighty six pro fine terre sue this terra was at upton granted by henry the second the tenure of his successors the chanceus family proves that it was held by the service of a sergeant for forty days in war which must not be confused with night service End of section four. Of Magna Carta commemoration essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding barons and knights in the great charter by j h round l l d part two that baronies were liable to arbitrary relief is admitted on all hands but in order to ascertain the sums exacted under henry the second it is not enough to copy the extracts made by maddox one has to examine the pipe rolls for oneself 
and even then evidence may be missed for the phrase finis terre is only indexed in some of the printed volumes of pipe rolls though relevium is indexed regularly it is for the former that we have in the case of baronies to look it would be necessary therefore to read through the whole of the volumes in order to make one's list exhaustive the table on the opposite page however will illustrate the nature of the sums paid under henry the second eleven fifty six robert de halion fees ten query one hundred marks eleven fifty eight william Paynell, fees fifteen query one hundred marks eleven sixty five roger doyley two hundred marks eleven sixty six helia skiffard one hundred pounds alan de ferno one hundred marks walter brito fees fifteen two hundred pounds eleven sixty seven humphrey de bohun two hundred pounds richard de sifrawast one hundred marks eleven sixty eight john diancourt fees forty one hundred marks william de scalariis fees fifteen query one hundred pounds eleven seventy one william fossard fees thirty three and a half eighty marks eleven seventy six john the constable of chester four hundred marks william de montacute fees ten query one hundred marks eleven seventy seven william chendituit two hundred marks eleven seventy eight robert de lacy one thousand marks eleven eighty hasculf de tanny fees seven and a half one hundred pounds eleven eighty one hugh de gournay one hundred pounds eleven eighty two nicholas de merrier fees two and a half twenty pounds eleven eighty three guy de rochford forty marks eleven eighty six hamo fitz mainfelin fees fifteen two hundred marks barony of eton hastings fees five two hundred marks hugh de say fees fifteen query two hundred pounds richard fitz john two hundred marks the first point to strike one here is that most of these sums are either two hundred pounds or one hundred pounds two hundred marks or one hundred marks this is an unexpected result the more so as no relation can be traced between the size of the barony and the relief exacted moreover of these four sums only two exceed the maximum fixed by the charter while one is actually below it this emphasizes the contrast between the arbitrary fine from a barony and the fixed sum of a hundred shillings due from a knight's fee when we confine our attention to the figures for a single county the contrast we shall find becomes striking the evidence for northumberland is of peculiar value for more reasons than one in the first place the proportion of single fees held in chief is exceptionally large and in the second we have copious information on the constituents of the holdings together with notable evidence on the use of the word barony let us first take a typical five night barony that of the bertrams of mitford footnote there was another bertram barony in the county that of the bertrams of bothell three nights End footnote. in eleven sixty six roger bertram certified that it was held by the service of five knights footnote et sciatis domine quod feodum meum non debet vobi servitium nisi tantum de quinque militibus red book End footnote in eleven seventy seven his successor william bertram was called upon to pay pro fine terre patri sui no less than two hundred pounds in twelve twelve another roger bertram is returned as holding the barony by the service of five knights footnote 
rogerus bertram tenet in capite de domino rege baroniam sic de midford per servicium quinque militum tester page three ninety two rogerus bertram baroniam sic de midford per quinque feoda red book page five six three baronia de midford tester page three eight three and footnote here then is a clear case of an undoubted barony by no means a large one as baronies went charged exactly twice the amount prescribed in the great charter as the rightful and ancient antiquum relief we have thus a striking illustration of the fact that as i have insisted the feudal extortions remedied by the charter were not as is so often implied introduced by john but are found in full existence under henry the second footnote e g mckechnie magna carta nineteen fourteen pages one nine six one nine eight so also petit du tailly studies supplementary to stubb's constitutional history nineteen o eight page one two nine quote, its most salient characteristic is the restoration of the old feudal law violated by john lackland and perhaps its practically most important clauses because they could be really applied were that for example which limited the right of relief end quote. also history of english law eighteen ninety five page one five one quote, john in these last years has been breaking the law therefore the law must be defined and set in writing End quote. End footnote. again we observe that the sum exacted is rightly styled finis terre not relevium for it represented as the dialogus and glanville's book explain a special commutation of the king's right to exact in the case of a barony an arbitrary sum from this northumberland barony we will pass to a smaller one the story of which is more complicated and has to be reconstructed in eleven sixty three william de granville was holding what we learn from evidence of three years later was a barony held by the service of three knights next year it had passed to two co-heiresses of whom ralph de gogy married the elder and Hugh de Ellington, i. e. Ellington, the younger. This we learn from the same evidence, namely from their respective returns in 1166. The pipe roll of 1164 shows each of them paying a sum pro relevio terre sue. Footnote, pipe roll, 8th regnal year of Henry the Second, page 11. The fact is obscured by Hugh's name being there printed as de Clenton. End footnote. Ralph pays forty marks and Hugh twenty, so that the whole relief exacted was sixty marks, forty pounds, though the service due from the barony was only that of three knights. Hugh, however, admitted that his tenure was baronial and the entire holding appears in 1212 as a baronia in the hands of ralph de gogy footnote ego teneo dimidiam baroniam see for its constituents tester pages three eight two three nine two compare with this dimidia baronia the baronia integra of the great charter and observe that the baronial tenure is not affected by subdivision though ralph and hugh each claim to owe the service of quote, a knight and a half end quote, only end footnote. this exposed it to an arbitrary relief as the payment is in this case termed in eleven sixty four namely forty pounds in lieu of the fifteen pounds which would have been payable if the holding had not been a barony but three knights fees let us now compare with these baronies three or four northumberland holdings the returns for which were similarly made among the cartae baronum in eleven sixty six for these were similarly held in chief though each of them owed the service of one knight at most william son of seawood who made return in eleven sixty six that he held a knight's fee by the service of one knight 
is proved by his tenure of gosforth to be a certes and therefore identical with the william de tesa or tesia of eleven sixty one to eleven sixty two in eleven seventy four his successor randolph de super tese was charged one hundred shillings five pounds de relevio suo this was the fixed relief on a knight's fee the next case is that of ernulf de morwick who returned his holding in eleven sixty six as a knight's fee quote, of the old fiefment end quote. in eleven seventy seven his successor hugh de morwick was charged a hundred shillings five pounds for his relief this hugh appears as one of henry's ministerial officers towards the end of the reign and it is interesting to note that so early as eleven sixty one he has a discharge precepto cancellarii of two marks charged to his father which suggests that he was already in official employment the third case is that of robert caro who returned himself in eleven sixty six as holding five carucates as one knight's fee in eleven seventy nine peter carhu accounted for one hundred shillings for his relief even more notable is the case of godfrey bayard who returned his holding in eleven sixty six as one third of a fee and who had been charged the year before thirty-three shillings four pence that is just a third of the regulation five pounds the importance of this evidence is that in each of three cases where the holding was one fee or less and where the holding was not part of an escheated honour relief was uniformly charged at the rate of five pounds a fee on the other hand a three fee barony was charged we have seen forty pounds and a five fee barony two hundred pounds moreover in eleven sixty eight an entry on the pipe roll runs quote, Idem vice comes redit compotum de feodis baronum et militum qui de rege tenent in capite in balia sua qui cartas de tenemento suo regi non miserunt End quote. the sheriff was here dealing as i was above not with holdings on escheated honours but with those which were held in capite ut de corona if we now pass to the other end of england we find in devon geoffrey del estre paying five pounds in eleven eighty three as the relief on a knight's fee there is nothing by which he can be identified in the cartae of eleven sixty six but an analysis of the scutage returns shows that the robertus filius galfridi of eleven sixty six red book page two five eight must have been robert son of geoffrey de lestre and father of geoffrey who succeeded in eleven eighty three again turning from devon to norfolk we find william de colechurch returning his small tenement as held by the service of half a knight his son richard on succeeding him paid for his relief fifty shillings the sum due on half a fee in these two cases we can clearly identify the holdings among those held in capite in eleven sixty six it has at least now been clearly established that those who made their returns in eleven sixty six although then treated apparently as being all on the same footing were not treated alike in the matter of their reliefs those who held in the cases examined one fee or less were only called upon to pay at the rate of five pounds on the knight's fee are we then to infer that the distinction between the two reliefs was that if a man held a single fee or less he paid five pounds or less pro rata while if he held more he was liable to a relief of one hundred pounds as holding by barony it would seem that such a proposition need only be stated to be rejected as absurd there is however a remarkable case discussed in the reports on the dignity of a peer and known to us from a petition to parliament in thirteen fifty four the twenty eighth regnal year of edward the third which certainly seems to show that at this date that proposition was the law Quote, in the parliament of the twenty eighth of the king 
robert de la mer suggested that after the death of peter de la mer his father he had atoned to the king and done homage for a moiety of the manor of lavington for which moiety he came into the exchequer and acknowledged his tenure that he held the moiety of the said manor by the service of one knight's fee and for that fee had paid one hundred shillings for his relief nevertheless for that in the red book of the exchequer it was found that henry the second to marry his daughter to the duke of saxony demanded of every knight of his kingdom a mark in aid of that marriage and commanded that every prelate and baron should certify to the said king in writing how many knights he held of the king in chief among which prelates and barons one peter de mara had certified that he held lavington by two knights fees the barons of the exchequer insisted that peter de mara was ancestor of the petitioner and that the petitioner held by barony and for service of barony they charged him of his said relief where he held only the moiety of the manor by the service of one knight's fee only and he prayed a writ to the said treasurer and barons that if they could not find by inquest or otherwise that the said entire manor was held by greater service than two fees and that there is another tenant of the other moiety of the manor that then they would accept his relief for one fee only notwithstanding the things found in the red book mentioned a writ was accordingly ordered to the treasurer and barons of the exchequer that if they should find by record or other remembrances of the exchequer or by inquest or in any other proper manner that the petitioner held the moiety of the manor by the service of one knight's fee as supposed by the petition and not by barony that then having received from him selon la ferron of one fee for his relief they should discharge him of the remainder notwithstanding the name of the said peter was found in the red book amongst the names of the barons it seems from this entry that in the reign of edward the third holding by barony and holding by knight's service only were so far considered as distinct that if a man held by the service of a knight's fee he was subject only to a relief of one hundred shillings and if he held by barony he was chargeable with one hundred marks for his relief though his barony consisted only of two knights fees the entry shows also that the red book of the exchequer was then considered as a document of such degree of authority in the court of exchequer that the court had acted upon it the whole proceeding however seems to show that a writ of summons to parliament did not then necessarily follow tenure by barony the committee not having found any person of the name of mara at any time summoned to parliament not having discovered what was done on the reference of this petition to the exchequer they are unable to give any further information on the subject End quote volume one pages three to five to six from rotuli parliamentarii edward the third page two six three as this is an unsatisfactory comment on the case it seems desirable to state the facts in eleven sixty six peter de la mer returned himself under wiltshire as holding steeple or market lavington by the service of two knights footnote habeo lawentonum westri gratia in dominio pro servitio duorum militum red book page two four six end footnote he was succeeded by robert and robert by peter de la mer who paid scutage on two fees a notable entry in the wiltshire inquisition of twelve twelve query records the quote, baronia seek roberti de la mare duo feoda though in what is printed as the same list we find galfridus filius petri unum feodum in lawintone robertus de la mare unum feodum in lawintone in any case the manor came to be held in two moieties some years later for william de la rocal sued peter de mer for it in the fifth regnal year of henry the third twelve twenty to twelve twenty one 
and must have obtained a moiety of it as we learn from the tester the evidence of which is confirmed by the hundred rolls footnote the entries on page one five one a are decisive confer page one four one b where peter de la mer's holding is given as one fee End footnote. the inquisitiones post mortem bear similar witness that on peter de la mer gives the holding as one fee and so does that on a later peter de la mer in twelve ninety two though that on robert de la mer in the second regnal year of edward the second records it as half a fee it is clear therefore that peter de la mer as he claimed in his petition did not owe the service of more than one knight and therefore by the admission of the crown he was only liable to a relief of five pounds and not to that of one hundred pounds which would have been due from a barony on the other hand there is a decided case of earlier date thirteen o six to thirteen o seven which points in quite a different direction for the legal interpretation at its date of the clause about reliefs william de briouze braosa son of william raised a question as to the relief due from him for the castle of bramber sussex and the land of guha i e gower the south wales peninsula he boldly claimed that in the host bramber had only returned the service of one knight footnote wilelmus et antecessores sui defenderunt castrum et terram de brembre pro servicio unius feodi militis End footnote. the barons of the exchequer decided the question one by reference to the book of fees two by evidence that william and his predecessors had always been immersed as barons without protest they found that quote, in libro feodorum brembre repertum est subtitulo de honoribus End quote and that quote, tantum debere solvi pro relevio de honore quantum pro relevio baroniae End quote. the reference to the book of fees must apparently be to the testa de neville page two 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 a where the tenants of knight's fees de brembre are all entered as holding de eodem honore but it is difficult to understand why these entries should be chosen when on page two two three the same list is headed quote, isti tenet de baronia de brembre johannes le cunte tenet quatuor feoda de eardem baronia End quote. moreover on page two two six b we read quote, in rapo de brembre wilelmus de breuse et antecessores eus tenuerunt rapum de brembre in capite de domino rege et antecessoribus eus ex conquestu angliae per servicium decem militum End quote. the barons decided quite rightly that william should be charged relief for bramber as for a barony footnote honoretur de relevio suo de castro praedicto tanquam de relevio baroniae the whole proceedings are printed in maddox exchequer seventeen eleven pages three seventy two to four from the plea rolls see also baronia anglica page thirty nine End footnote. but far more important for our purpose is their decision as to gower william pleaded dicta terra de guha tenetur de rege in capite per servicium unius feodi militis de dono et fiofermento regis johannis in proof thereof he produced a charter of john twenty fourth of february twelve o two to twelve o three the fourth regnal year of john granting to his predecessor william de braosa the whole land terra of guha with all its appurtenances in wales quote, per servicium unius militis pro omni servicio End quote. this was accepted by the barons as proof that he held guha pro uno feodo militis and he was accordingly charged only the five pounds relief quote, pro terra de guha in walia quae tenetur de rege in capite 
per servicium unius feodi militis end quote in this case the barons seem to have deemed the documentary evidence decisive we must therefore conclude that in all the cases in which such evidence could be produced the tenure was admitted to be knight's fee not barony now this class of knights those who were enfeoffed by charter must have formed a fairly numerous body who could all claim that they did not hold by barony and were therefore not liable to the relief due from a baron i e the holder of a barony it was the custom under richard and john and even under henry the second to grant considerable estates as single knights fees as we learn from the entries in the red book of holdings created subsequent to eleven sixty six footnote this charter is printed by maddox among the proceedings ut supra and also in calendar of charter rolls nineteen o eight three forty six and footnote the existence of this class of holdings seems to have been overlooked by those who have discussed the subject the only point that remains doubtful is whether holdings so created as knights fees but owing the service of more than one knight were called upon to pay relief as baronies or not in the case of those who held by the service of a single knight there would seem to have been no question some support for the view that a line was drawn as in the case of the de la mer holding cited above between those who held by the service of more than one knight and those who only held a single fee or less is afforded by the returns of twelve thirty six in which the sheriffs are directed to make separate returns of these two classes perhaps the most remarkable return for its bearing on chapter two in the great charter is that made by the sheriff of shropshire in twelve twelve in this return the first entry relates to william fitz allen who is described as holding in capite de domino rege per baroniam the second states that roger mortimer barrow tenet in capite de domino rege the third and fourth show us walter de lacy and robert mortimer holding similiter in the next five entries each holder barrow similiter tenet in the tenth william botrealus barrow tenuit in capite de domino rege per servicium dimidii militis which was also the service of peter fitzherbert the last but one in the first portion of the list then come six entries in the first four of which we have the formula miles tenet in capite de domino rege while in the fifth and sixth the word miles is omitted though in the sixth the service is that of one knight this list suggests several considerations in the first place it obviously identifies barrow with the man who holds per baroniam in the second it names the ten barones first and the six milites after them in the next we find two barones who hold only half a fee apiece in shropshire at least certainly we have here a list that seems to have unique importance as bearing on the barons and knights of the great charter three years later it is however unfortunate that shropshire was a county which had only come into the hands of the crown on the downfall of its earl's house early in the reign of henry the first if their fief was deemed to constitute an escheated honour the status of their tenants after the forfeiture might be that of those who held in capite ut de honore this question arose in twelve twenty five only ten years after the great charter hugh pantulf appears in our list as a barrow holding in capite whose service was that of five knights his son william was charged one hundred pounds for his relief as for a barony but he protested before the king quod non tenet de rege in capite nisi feoda quinque militum de terra quae fuit roberti de belesme 
his contention was allowed and his payment reduced from one hundred pounds to twenty five pounds on the other hand robert corbett the subject of the next entry who similarly held as a barrow five knights fees contended in twelve fifty to twelve fifty one that none of his predecessors had paid relief on them but was made to pay the baronial fine of one hundred pounds on his barony of cows this singular contrast affords a further illustration of the difficulties and confusion by which this subject is surrounded even so far back as the seventeenth century dugdale acutely observed that hugh de morwick had the reputation of a baron but his barony consisted of no more than that one knight's fee by which service he held the manor of chivington his holding is carefully distinguished as a villa not a baronia in tester page three nine two b but is styled the baronia hugonis de morwick on page three eighty two b though the said manor is there entered as held per feodum unius militis in spite however of much confusion and contradiction on the subject it is clear that the great charter by drawing the line it did between the relief due from a barony and that which was due from a knight's fee must have led to a definite distinction between the two kinds of tenure in spite however of much confusion and contradiction on the subject it is clear that the great charter by drawing the line it did between the relief due from a barony and that which was due from a knight's fee must have led to a definite distinction between the two kinds of tenure and the ever-increasing subdivision of baronies must have accentuated that distinction we have seen that even under henry the second the two moieties of a barony of only three knights fees were each of them called upon to pay relief on a higher scale than that of the five pounds due from a knight's fee because the tenure was baronial whether this arrangement favoured the tenant or the crown depended on the number of knights due so witium debitum from the barony for instance in twelve thirty six to twelve thirty seven the barony of d'aubigny de albigny of canehoe was divided between three co-heirs each of whom was called upon to pay fifty marks the third of that hundred pounds which was due from the baronia integra as the service due from the barony was twenty-five knights each third was reckoned at eight and a third fees on which the baronial relief was thirty-three pounds six shillings and eightpence though at five pounds on the knight's fee the sum payable would have been forty-one pounds thirteen shillings and fourpence sixty-two and a half marks similarly the essex barony of montfichet was divided into three portions one of which fell to richard de play who was charged fifty marks ut pro tercia parte baroniae baronia integra tunc temporis onerata fuit versus regem de relevio suo de centum libra again in the twenty-first regnal year of edward i alice de musgro had paid twenty-five marks for the sixth part of a barony but her heir in the thirty-fifth regnal year of edward i was only charged eleven pounds two shillings two and a half pence for the same two-thirds of the amount because the relief on a barony had been reduced in the interval from one hundred pounds to one hundred marks eventually the complications caused by these tenures became very great in the eighteenth regnal year of richard the second thirteen ninety four to thirteen ninety five robert de todenham admitted that he held certain property by the service of the third part of the eighteenth part i e the fifty-fourth part of the barony of beecham of bedford and part of an advowson by the service of the seventh part of the third part of the said barony together with a suffolk manor which he held in capite ut de honore boloniae by the service of two knights for this last tenure he paid ten pounds but only small fractional sums for his two baronial tenures no wonder that maddox summed up his evidence as proving that 
quote, land baronies were divided and subdivided till at length they were brought to naught end quote. at last we are in a position to arrive at some conclusions with regard to the difficult problem dealt with in this paper as i observed just above it depended on the service due from a barony whether it was in the tenant's interest to claim that his tenure was baronial or that of knight's fees so conversely with the crown when the baronial relief stood at a hundred pounds it was in the interest of the holder or holders of a barony owing the service of more than twenty fees to claim that what they had to pay was the baronial relief when that relief was reduced to a hundred marks the above statement would hold true of baronies or portions of baronies owing the service of thirteen and a third knights or more on the other hand the holders of small baronies would naturally try to pay relief at the rate of five pounds on the knight's fee in each case the interests of the crown were of course opposed to theirs and thus there would often arise the question whether the tenure was barony or knight's fee as to one class of knights there seems to have been no difficulty those who held of an escheated honour would always pay relief at the rate of five pounds on the knight's fee however many fees they might hold the great charter provided for their case in its forty-third chapter but as to tenants per servitium militare who held in capite ut de corona questions would arise perhaps we may divide them into two classes one those who could produce a charter of enfeoffment from the crown two those whose tenure was prescriptive if a man could produce such a charter in fiefing his predecessor to hold by the service of one knight his tenure was admitted to be knight's fee and he would escape with a relief of five pounds as we saw in the case of gower but if the service due was more than that of one knight it is difficult to state with certainty what his relief would be turning to prescriptive tenure the rule seems to have been that if the predecessor in title in eleven sixty six sent in his return among the cartae baronum this was prima facie proof that the tenure was baronial footnote on the death of robert de chandos in thirteen o one his lands which were in herefordshire were found to be quote, held of the king in chief by barony by service of two knights fees end quote calendar of inquisitions four number one five eight but the inquisition is damaged roger his son and heir seems to have disputed the tenure but without success for compertum est in rubeo libro quod inter carta stiversorum baronum annotatas ibidem continetur quidam carta ricardi de candos antecessoris praedicti rogeri de diversis feodis suis the carta will be found on pages two eighty four to five of the printed red book and records prove that the fief paid scutage on over thirteen fees in the twelfth century roger thereupon admitted baronial tenure and paid one hundred marks relief accordingly in thirteen o eight to thirteen o nine maddox baronia anglica page one two seven it was shown above that a carter of eleven sixty six in the red book was similarly relied on by the crown in the de la mer case End footnote. but the presumption so created could be rebutted as we saw in the de la mer case by proof that the service was that of one knight only footnote this is also the inference to be drawn from the evidence on the practice under henry the second given above End footnote. again as we learn from the bramber case the formal entry of a fief in a public record as a barony or even as an honour was sufficient to establish the fact that the tenure was baronial and there is nothing to show that this evidence could be rebutted finally the keen and frequent discussion as to the amount of relief payable under the second chapter of the charter strongly confirms the main contention in this paper for the line drawn by that chapter could not be left undefined 
the question whether a tenure was baronial or not had to be determined before it could be known what was the relief that it was liable to pay on the other hand the line drawn in the fourteenth chapter between the greater barons and other tenants was of little or no practical consequence and could therefore be left undefined footnote the latest learning insists on the vagueness of this line in the origin of the english constitution nineteen twelve page two two seven note professor adams writes quote, as to when and where the line was drawn between the major and minor barons in either military or court service seminary work on the available material in two different years in connection with other topics leads me to feel sure that if the statement in pollock and maitland one to eighty quote, we shall probably be nearer the truth if in accordance with later writers we regard the distinction as one that is gradually introduced by practice and one that has no precise theory behind it end quote, is to be modified at all it must be in the direction of a more unqualified statement that there was no fixed line end quote. mr mckechnie magna carta nineteen fourteen page two five one similarly holds that quote, a rough division was drawn somewhere in the midst but the boundary was vague and this vagueness was probably encouraged by the crown whose requirements might vary from time to time the crown tenants on one side of this fluctuating line were barones maiores those on the other barones minores End quote. End footnote. my reason for saying so is that the right of the lesser barons to summons to councils was not taken away by the charter but was even asserted whether they looked on such attendance as a privilege or as is more likely at that period a duty laid upon them they would have no occasion in practice to raise the question of the line and where it should be drawn for they could attend if they wished the future developments of the principle could not then be foreseen to sum up i claim to have shown that the commentators glossing of the text by which the knights of the second chapter were made identical with the alleged lesser barons of the fourteenth creates needless difficulties and rests on no foundation footnote it is essential to keep rigidly to the actual text of the charter on pages two four eight to nine of magna carta mr mckechnie equates comites et maiores barones by earls and other greater barons where the word other is an interpolation and on page two five one quotation marks are given to minor barons a phrase which is not found in the charter and footnote the line drawn in the second chapter was in practice sharply defined because the relief payable to the crown could only be determined by it the line drawn in the fourteenth was on the contrary vague and remained in practice undefined. End of section five. Section six of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Martin. Magna Carta, Clause 39. Nullus Liber, Homo, etc. By Sir P. Vinagradoff, FBA, LLD, DCL. By a curious coincidence, the year 1915 has been marked, among other striking events, by a revival of the controversy between arbitrary power and the rule of law, which, in the midst of heterogeneous particulars, formed the substance of the struggle of 1215. The discussion in the course of the elaboration of the Defense of the Realm Act and its amendment has led to extreme pronouncements. On the one hand, Lord Parmore appealed to the principle of safeguarding the freedom and right of individuals, as expressed in the Great Charter and guaranteed by trial by jury. Lord Newton, on the other hand, took this occasion to pronounce in favor of a discretionary procedure untrammeled by lawyers, 
and declared that sensible persons in this country were not in the least worried about Magna Carta at this moment. We need not follow the details of this curious passage of arms and of the correspondence called forth by it, and may confine ourselves to the remark that if Lord Parmore was not strictly exact in tracing trial by jury to Magna Carta, Lord Newton seems to have somewhat rashly discarded the inheritance of legality of which English citizens have been so proud for ages. Turning to the historical problem fringed by these modern polemics, one may say that the predominant strain in the analysis of the Great Charter by modern scholars may be characterized as a skeptical reaction against the great constitutional claims made for Magna Carta since the days of Coke. The note is sounded in a terse page of the history of English law, and Messrs. McKechnie, J. H. Round, E. Jenks, L. O. Pike, and others have followed on the same lines with great effect. They've taken pains to prove that the barons who forced the charter on John Lackland were guided by class interests and aimed at reaction and anarchy rather than at legality and progress. The feudal framework of their scheme is sufficiently clear and has been described very fully by G.B. Adams. There can be no doubt also that Coke, Blackstone, and Thompson were guilty of many anachronisms in their attempts to trace legal conceptions of a later age into these feudal beginnings and that even Stubbs rather exaggerated the sentimental and institutional importance of the principles embodied in Magna Carta. And yet there is room for doubt whether the general effect of the modern criticism to which the text of the Great Charter was subjected has been altogether conducive to the proper treatment of the subject. Granted that the Charter has been prompted by the selfish considerations of the barons, and bears in every line the impress of their special aims, it remains to be explained why it obtained such a hold on national life, why it was reenacted and remanipulated in the course of several generations, why it became the watchword of English legalism, why it was accepted and developed by those very royal judges against whose encroachment its provisions were to a large extent directed. We cannot wonder Magna Carta was partially eclipsed by the arbitrary rule of the Tudors, but right through the Middle Ages and in the 17th century again, it was considered as the principal enactment of English law. And this fundamental fact deserves as much consideration from historians as the feudal environment of the Runnymede Agreement. Clause 39, which I've selected for particular examination, stands, as it were, in the center of the Magna Carta controversy, and is well adapted for an illustration of its characteristic features. So much learning and ingenuity has been expended on the interpretation of this text that I can dismiss in a few words a number of more or less important points, which seem to me have been definitely settled by scholars. It would be superfluous to refute Coke's view as to the meaning of Necabimus Necmatema Super Eum, nor is it necessary to dwell at length on the meaning of outlawry, decision, or destruction. It is quite clear that the famous vel between judicium parium and legem terrae was employed in a conjunctive and not in a disjunctive sense. But several points remain worth discussion, even when we have taken careful stock of the results achieved by the interpreters. The nullis liber homo itself deserves a few words. The meaning attached to the term by the baronial party at Runnymede restricted the scope of the term to that of libere tenens, and it was further emphasized and developed in the confirmation of 1217 and in later issues. Such an interpretation, far from being self-evident in the beginning of the 13th century, cuts right through the difficulties arising out of two firmly established views. Namely, against the frequent combination of free birth with unfree tenure, of which the simplest case is presented by the freemen holding in villainage, and against the doctrine all men worthy of war and white, if not providing the security of free tenement, were to join the Frank Pledge, Plegium Liberale, and had to attend the public court twice a year at the sheriff's view. This arrangement was merely the expression of the fact that in criminal and police matters, the villain was on the level of the free. As the narrow conception of freedom aimed at in the Baron's Charter did not square with important doctrines well established in early common law, the interpretation given to Nullis Liber Homo by the judges was bound to take a different course from that intended by the originators of the document. It's been argued that the barons did not intend to bestow any of the guarantees of Clause 39 on people who did not belong to their order, that is, who are not tenants-in-chief. 
If such was their intention, it was not adequately expressed. Because the class of libere hominis, even in the strictest legal sense, embraced all the free tenants, the Vavasors, Sockmen, and Franklins, as well as the Barons. The fact that Clause 34 applied only to Barons holding courts of their own did not militate in the slightest degree against such an interpretation. Clause 34 merely said that when freemen had courts, they were not to be deprived of their privileges. Freemen who had no courts were not concerned in Clause 34 at all. But as soon as the line was drawn so low as to include all those who could prove their freedom, say by the action de libertate probanda, it became impossible to insist even on the restricted meaning of free tenants. This being so, possible cases of infringement of personal liberty, of illegal imprisonment, come very much to the fore, and the differentiation between the protection of the person, corpus, and of property and privileges, tenementum consuetidines, is carried out in later issues of the Charter. Again, when this personal acceptation of the term liber homo has obtained a firm footing, the transition from the feudal notion of liberty to the civic one becomes a matter of substitution. The fall of the stone into the lake calls forth automatically wider and wider circles on the surface. That this is no mere speculation of ours may be proved by textual evidence. In a statute of 1350, issued after the Black Death, it was expressly provided that nul home de quel estat o condicion il suite shall be imprisoned or deceased in infringement of the Great Charter. And this elaborate formula was evidently meant to remove all doubts as to the general application of the rule. In an earlier instance, namely in a statute of 1331, the term used is simply home, but it stands in the place of liber homo, and the omission of the qualifying epithet is not likely to have been accidental. The wording of such clauses was the result of very careful consideration, and the change in terminology has to be taken into account at least as much in this case as the insertion of the words about free tenements and franchises in the earlier confirmations of the Charter. It may be noted in this connection that the defense of a person refusing to release a prisoner on bail in an action de homine replagiando was not that the prisoner was a villain, but that the prisoner was the villain of the lord who had imprisoned him. I should like now to examine a second point, the expression per legem terrae, which forms the conclusion of our clause. I entirely agree with Professor C.B. Adams that the only sense in which these words can be construed is that of an assertion of legality. Lex terrae means law of the land. It is amplified in some of the confirmations by the expression legale judicium, and both, in conjunction, would point to legality in procedure as well as substance. Of course, lex is used sometimes in the technical meaning of conpurgation, but such a technical acceptance would square badly with the accompanying expression per judicium parium. What is more important, the general meaning of law of the land is conclusively established by two texts directly connected to the history of the Runnymede transaction. The patent of 10 May 1215, by which King John wished to conciliate the moderate among his enemies, and the papal letter, in which Innocent III exhorted the barons to cease their opposition to the king. No reasonable canon of interpretation could warrant a separate treatment of legem regni nostri et judicium parium, of John's patent, or the per pares vestros segundum consuetidines et leges regni, of Innocent's bull, from the per judicium parium suarum vel per legem terrae of Magnum Carta. The terms of the three documents are identical in substance and significant in their technical differentiation under two heads. At the same time, the slight variation of phraseology enable us to supplement to some extent the barrenness of the central statement in Magna Carta, Clause 39. Regnum Nostrum appears in the letter of 10 May as a welcome gloss to Terrae, but the reference to Leges et Consuetidines Regni is even more explicit. It shows conclusively that a contemporary potentate, thoroughly conversant in the, the subject and dispute, and fully able to express his thoughts in a definite manner, understood the lex terrae in the broad and ordinary sense of the laws and customs of the realm. It would be inadvisable for us to dissent from this authoritative interpretation. The struggle was waged to secure trial in properly constituted courts of justice, and in accordance with established law. 
the latter requirement would apply equally to substantive rules as far as they existed, and to procedure. It was, in fact, a declaration in favor of legality all around. Here again, as in the case of the free man, the formulation was elastic enough to stand carrying over from class justice of feudal lords to the common law of the growing commonwealth. The mention of a properly constituted tribunal, however, discloses in a curious way a certain opposition between the views of the barons and those of the royalists, as expressed by king and pope. While the baronial documents merely speak of a judgment by peers, the royal and the papal pronouncements state that such a judgment should be given in the king's court, in curia mea. The omission of these words in the text of the charter is hardly accidental. One of the objects of this curtailment may have been the wish to extend the application of the clause relating to peers to the courts of the barons themselves, on the principle indicated by Clause 60. But there is yet another connection which the barons had an interest in avoiding a direct mention of Curia Regis. They wanted to make clear that they would not recognize as legal judgments not delivered by the peers of the accused. In this, they followed the feudal doctrine, Compare Conrad's two edict and King David's formula, which had emphatically asserted, e.g. in 1208 by William of Browse. Now, as such an unadulterated feudal doctrine stood a view according to which the administration of justice was the outcome of royal power and not a feudal contract. From this point of view, Pierre de Rocher in 1233 contested the very existence of peers in England. But there was also an intermediate position favored by the judges of the king's court. According to this compromise, the curia was not only a body with attributions delegated to it by the king, but also a meeting of the king's vassals, and it exercised its functions in virtue of the collective power of the assessors. In this sense, the justices derived their office not only from the sovereign, but also from the circle of peers. Indeed, both in France and in England, the Court of Peers was regarded as one section of the High Court of Parliament, which, in itself, was enlarged Curia Regis. One more step was required to reach the conclusion that the professional judges of the court might be taken to serve as a substitute for the cumbersome process of judgment by the full court. This step was not only actually made in both England and in France, but it was justified in both cases on similar grounds. I have in view the introductory sentence of Bracton's treatise on the connection of the single judge with the full court of magnets, and the chapter of Beaumanoir's Cotumes de Boesis on the jurisdiction of the bailai. In both cases, stress is laid on the subordinate character of a decision given by a single judge. His action is important for practical reasons because it would be useless to overburden the full court with trials which develop on ordinary lines, and can be easily settled by reference to well-known rules. In all doubtful cases, however, the single judge ought to revert to the fountainhead of his authority, that is, to the curia. The expressions used by Bracton are exceedingly characteristic. It is as a member of the aristocracy and not as a learned delegate of royal justice that the judge is made to appear. By the Magna Curia may be meant either a sitting of the full court of regis or the high court of parliament a body of rather uncertain composition in the 13th century. A characteristic complement to the jurisdiction of Parliament in the center appears in the shape of the commissions in circuit composed of local magnates by the side of ordinary judges. For our purpose, it is important to note that, in the main, the requirement as to justice administered by one's peers gradually resolved itself in the hands of the justices who founded the common law into a potential appeal to a royal high court. It cannot be said this process of transformation took place without opposition and misunderstandings, or that it followed a perfectly straight course. It is well known how the higher baronage obtained a strict recognition of its position as a group of peers of the realm. A corollary to that purely feudal view appears in the claim of privileged exemption from trying the causes of lower people. It is also interesting to note that sometimes attempts were made to establish further gradations in the peerage, for example, in the case of Gilbert of Clare, Earl of Gloucester, who wanted to be tried by Lord Marchers like himself. The process of affecting the free population below the exalted ranks of the peerage is more interesting. Here also we find an occasional attempt to establish group divisions. A Yorkshire knight seeks and obtains from an itinerant justice to be tried by fellow knights instead of a jury of freemen selected without distinction of rank. 
The judiciar, in this case, complies with the request of the accused and gets rid in this way of one of the latter's many objections. But as we know, such an exclusive point of view did not prevail as to the composition of juries, both grand and petty. The rule established by practice required merely that members of the jury should be impaneled from the country, patria, or the neighborhood, visnetum, that they should be free and lawful men of some social standing, and that their several appointments could not be challenged on personal grounds. Anyway, even when knights are selected for the recognition, it is evident that they do not belong to a circle of peers of the accused in any other sense but that of being his equals in rank. They do not constitute in themselves an ordinary court of peers to which the accused man would eventually be a suitor. They are members of the patria, in the ca case just quoted from the county of Yorkshire, and act in a representative capacity. One more characteristic feature has to be noted. The knights in question are selected to satisfy the requirement as to judicium parium, and at the same time they are a jury, a petty jury according to the technical terminology of later days. Submission to the verdict on the part of the accused is enforced by means of the threat of applying the regime of hunger and thirst, which formed such an important element in the Pene Forte at Dure. Altogether, the report of the trial looks like a standard case, selected for the purpose of illustrating all sorts of dodges, counter-moves, and exceptions which might be resorted to by an accused person. There can be no doubt in this way a criminal petty jury was taking the place of a batch of peers, and... Though we have no similar means of exact identification in other instances, the mere reading of crown trials in such collections as that of the select pleas of the crown, the crown pleas of the clowny of Gloucester, and the notebook of Bracton affords ample corroborative evidence of the treatment of criminal cases on those lines. All cases of felony in these volumes are tried and decided in royal courts, either by appeals or by the recognition of juries. The latter mode becomes more and more common, and except in the case of a great man, depends not on a judgment by the feudal peers of the accused, but on a recognition by men of the same group, free and lawful men of the country. The question arises, is the treatment of that recognition as a judgment the result of mere confusion and looseness of terminology, or has it been brought about by the deliberate overriding of the Magna Carta provision by royal justices? Neither the one nor the other solution is likely to commend itself to modern students. In order to understand the process of substitution, by which the jury was put at the place of the circle of feudal peers, we have to attend, as it seems to me, not only to the existence and rapid increase of small freemen who had no standing as vassals, but also to the popular conception of a public court in 13th century England. The opposition between judgment and verdict developed only gradually in consequence of the growth of the jury system, and although, as has been convincingly shown by H. Brunner, the trial by jury was in truth the outcome of inquests held by professional judges under the authority of the king, and in the popular mind there lingered the notion that jurors were delegates of a body of doomsmen. This is assumed in the Yorkshire case, under discussion, but it is also indicated by the frequent substitution of an award by jurymen for the doom or judgment of a popular court. One of the earliest extant records of a post-conquestual plea, the account of a suit in which Bishop Odo of Bayeux ultimately got the best of it against his opponent, contains the notice that sworn representatives of a county were substituted for the full court of the county. From a case inserted in Bracton's notebook, we can gather that the right to make dooms that is, to pronounce judgments, was considered to be inherent in the status of a member of a county court, though its proper exercise depended on the holding of a regular session of the court. It could certainly not be denied that a suitor of the county, acting as an assessor of its courts, was able to exercise judicial functions by the side of the sheriff or of the royal justice who presided in the court. In the same way, a juror, representing the patria, was deemed to contribute in a certain sense to a judgment, although in another sense the judgment is a final decision of the case appertained to the royal justice. This manner of treating the question led to a rather ambiguous phraseology, but it helps to explain how the rule as to judicium parium was applied by the royal courts in the case of freemen not belonging to the highest social rank of the peerage. It remains for me to consider the constitutional widening of the prohibition of arbitrary imprisonment and destruction, 
it has been currently held to be the germ of habeas corpus doctrine, and there is a good deal of truth in this view, although it certainly does not comprise the whole truth. The narrow class basis on which the rule was originally drawn up need not be insisted on. It is the initial assumption from which further analysis has to start. What I should like to emphasize is the fact that right through the Middle Ages, the rule was recognized by the judges and became one of the fundamental principles, not of the law of peerage, but of the common law. It was reasserted again and again by various parliaments, with slight variations in form, which showed that it was not treated as an empty formula kept up by meaningless tradition. In John de la Lee's case, it formed the basis of the defendant's claim. In the quashing of Thomas of Lancaster's sentence, and in the proceedings as to Maltravers' pardon, royal officers and even the peers of Parliament were charged with flagrant breaches of the rule of law, safeguarding the right of free Englishmen to a fair trial. It must be conceded, at the same time, that there was a powerful doctrine which ran counter to a consistent application of Clause 39 of Magna Carta, namely, the exceptional power assigned to the king in virtue of his prerogative as sovereign ruler of the Commonwealth. Thomas of Lancaster was condemned to death without trial because Edward II had personally recorded the notorious fact of his treason. The personal command of the king is often recognized by judges to outweigh purely legal considerations. In the procedure of replevin as applied to accused persons, it was taken for granted that an arbitrary arrest might be justified by the personal order of the king. This point may be illustrated, for example, by the following extract from a writ de homine replegiando of Edward the first time. The sheriff of Cambridgeshire is ordered to replevin a certain Richard, and others, who had been arrested by the bailiffs of the Bishop of Ely. Nisi capti assent per speciali, preceptum nostrum vel capitalis justiciari nostri. The passage implies, of course, to preliminary arrest and not to punishment. But it was well understood already in medieval times that such preliminary arrests might create the greatest hardship, and ought to be guarded against. How is one to reconcile these conflicting tendencies? They cannot be reconciled by logical construction. They represent, as it were, the two poles of English political development in the Middle Ages. The historical struggle between John and the barons, Henry III and Montfort, Edward II and Lancaster, Edward III and the good parliament, had its counterpart in conflicting legal theories as to the extent of the royal prerogative and the application of legal rules. But as one might say of English judician Edward I, that he was eminent as a powerful ruler, and at the same time, as a most efficient promoter of legal order. So it may be said of the judges who shaped the common law that they were fully alive to the necessity of a rule of law and regarded the modifying interference of the prerogative as an exceptional agency which ought not to affect the general administration of justice. The principle of legality as formulated in Magna Carta is one of the elements of England's constitutional growth, and it has certainly exerted an influence on the destinies of the nation which is not lessened by the fact that the roots of the charter were embedded in the soil of feudalism. End of section six. Recording by Patrick Martin. Seven of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Per Eudicium Perium, Well Per Legum Terrae, by Professor F. M. Poica. In his recent treatise upon the origin of the English Constitution, Professor G. B. Adams has pushed to its logical conclusion what may be called the baronial tendency in current interpretations of the thirty-ninth clause of the Great Charter. The barons, he suggests, were thinking almost entirely, if not entirely, of themselves. They were demanding that they should not be imprisoned, disseized, or outlawed, except after a trial in the king's court, by the judgment of their peers, and by the whole body of law and custom which such judgments are intended to interpret and apply. By the king's court, 
the barons meant the magnates of the realm, not the judges alone. By the law of the land they meant no particular form of procedure, certainly not the process of indictment and presentment. As I understand this view, the barons desired to place themselves beyond the scope of the judicial system elaborated in the reign of Henry the Second and Richard the First. They were thinking of such trials as those of William of St. Calais and St. Thomas of Canterbury. This view is clear and intelligible. It is a good starting point. Without traversing the whole field of speculation fully described in Mr. McKechnie's commentary, I wish to put over against Professor Adams's view the old fourteenth-century interpretation of the clause, and see what can be said for it. There appears to be no doubt that in the minds of politicians of Edward the Third's reign the clause comprehended all free men, and the law of the land covered all the due processes of law, even indictment and the appeal. Whether there was a judgment of peers or not depended on the circumstances. We can all agree that the barons were thinking mainly of their own safety, and were not thinking directly of trial by jury. But if we accept the Edwardian view, we cannot hold that the charter is simply the program of a pack of feudal reactionaries. According to Professor Adams, the barons were seeking to undermine, so far as it concerned them, the whole fabric of the new judicial system, including the jury, the itinerant justice court, and the permanent central court of common pleas. According to the fourteenth-century politicians, the barons frankly recognized the value of the judicial system, new and old, and in this clause were maintaining the rights of the subject against an arbitrary prerogative. The inquiry involves two separate but related questions. In the first place, assuming that the clause was intended to apply to the barons alone, was it only concerned with a trial by peers in the king's court? In the next place, ought we to limit the phrase liber homo to the barons? If the barons were not thinking of the ordinary freemen, they may none the less have been thinking of more than one judicial method. If they did include the ordinary free man in their demand, they would naturally allow a variety of procedure. 1. Nullus liber homo capiatur, well imprisonetur, aut disesiatur, aut ut lagetur, aut exulator, aut aliquo modo destruetur, nec super eum ibimus, nec super eum mitemus, Nisi per legale judicium parium suorum, well per legem terrae. The barons and their followers were in this clause included among the liberae homines. Indeed, John's letters of 10th May 1215 show that the baronial desire for protection was perhaps the original motive of the clause. These letters, addressed a month before the date of the charter, read as follows. Sciatis me concessise baronibus nostris qui contra nos sunt, quod nec eos nec homines suos capiemus, nec disesiemus, nec super eos per wim well per arma ibimus, nisi per legem regni nostri, well per judicium parium suorum, in curia mea, donec consideratio facta fuerit, per tres quos elegemus ex parte nostra, et per tres quos elegent ex parte sua, et dominum papam, qui superior erit super eos. Note. The corresponding clause in the Articles of the Barons, paragraph 29, reads, Ne corpus liberi hominis capiatur, nec imprisonetur, nec disesiatur. End note. It does not appear, however, that the king is promising a trial by peers in his court as a remedy in all cases. Even though by the baron's men only their more important followers were intended, John is not likely to have given an undertaking that all charges against them would be brought before the supreme authority. Nor do the words, 
per legem regni well per judicium parium taken in their natural sense suggest that the law of the realm and a judgment of peers are indissolubly connected or in this case identical such a serious conclusion must be based upon a much stronger argument than the probable meaning of well the word well is used about sixty times in magna carta but never so far as i can see in an explanatory or accumulative sense however vague or weak its disjunctive quality may be it cannot suddenly be construed as et etiam or id est as the author of the dialogus de scaccario points out even et was frequently used at that time in a disjunctive sense unless the meaning of the terms themselves suggests a much closer connection between the ideas of the lex regni and the judicium parium the use of well can only suggest that they are not rigid alternatives one would expect the king to mean that without stating exactly the scope of the law of the realm he would observe it it might include a judgment of peers or it might not if the circumstances were peculiar owing for example to the importance of the offender or the difficulty of the case the judgment would not be arbitrary the defendant's peers could be or would be called upon to see that justice was done the practice of the time and the general meaning of the words used strengthen the probability of this interpretation in many cases a judgment of peers in the king's court was doubtless the normal method of procedure a great baron's default of service for example might result in disseisin by such a judgment but a judgment of peers was not the only legal way during the sharp quarrel in 1205 between king john and william the marshal the marshal offered to defend his fidelity against the most valiant man in the kingdom by god's teeth swore the king that is nothing i want the judgment of my barons the marshal was ready to stand this test also but the barons shrank from giving judgment and when john of bassingbourne one of the king's bachelors ventured to speak the count of omal silenced him it is not for you or me to judge a knight of the marshal's quality there is no man here bold enough to put his default to the proof of the sword si hardi qui vers lui montra le forfait the duel is distinguished in this scene from the judicium parium the barons regard the duel as the more appropriate test while the king prefers the judicium note histoire de guillaume le maréchal edited by meyer volume two pages one o nine to one twelve four years earlier the king had acted in an exactly contrary way the poitevin barons asked for a judgment of peers john had tried to insist upon a trial by combat against picked champions of his own howden volume four page one seventy six end note did the lex regni mean the old form of procedure such as the feudal trial by combat procedure was certainly part of the law of the realm and some scholars have wished to limit the meaning of the phrases lex regni lex terrae to this form of trial excluding any wider sense for example process and the methods of appeal and indictment which might precede the actual proof i can see no reason for any such limitation in the thirty-ninth clause of the great charter the lex terrae which is substituted for john's lex regni was certainly used of the ancient forms of proof but in norman and in anglo-norman law it was more frequently used in the sense of the general body of law operating through familiar processes the word terra was used sometimes to denote a holding as in the phrase terrae normanorum but also to denote a district subject to public law whether the local patria or the regnum as a whole its substitution for regnum in the clause under discussion 
shows that lex terrae was here intended to apply to the customs of england and probably to cover also any varieties of local customs such as those recognized by the justices in kent and herefordshire and it may be noticed that the phrase lex terrae was commonly used of actions and procedure generally for example of the possessory assizes a writ of right and the proceedings in outlawry the phrase judgment of peers on the other hand had a more limited and precise meaning it implied a particular kind of court a court of doomsmen the judgment must be delivered on behalf of a company of men who were of the same race or nationality or status as that of the accused or party it involved the equitable principle which underlay the recognition and the accusing jury indeed the processes of inquiry and judgment met in the jury of arbitrators of which we have an example in john's letters of may twelve fifteen but the judgment of peers was not the same as and did not include the recognition and the presentment the jews in england claimed the judgment of their peers but they objected to a mixed jury of recognitors note a comparison of john's charter to the jews rotterly cartarum page ninety three with a case in the year twelve twenty four in bracton's notebook volume two page seven o six case nine eighteen makes this clear End note. a solemn trial in the curia regis in the presence of the magnates of the realm the ordinary session of the shire court perhaps also the trial of possessory actions before justices enforced by local knights involved a judgment by peers the proceedings before the justices on air did not i think involve this kind of judgment but the lex terrae would be enforced in all alike a contemporary change in norman procedure illustrates very clearly the distinction between the lex terrae and the judicium parium after the conquest of normandy king philip augustus took the trial of ducal pleas in the bellywicks out of the hands of justices and gave it to local men the custumal says assisie vero tenentur per barones et legales homines pa per parem judicari debet the procedure of the court and the law enforced by the court were not affected by the change the lex terrae was observed both before and after but henceforward a trial according to law would in normandy involve a judicium parium in england this was not necessarily the case the phrase lex terrae then though not excluding a judgment of peers suggests so many varieties of law and procedure that a demand for a judgment of peers in every possible case could hardly be expressed in words so mild and general as per judicium parium well per legum terrae i have pointed out that even a great baron accused of default did not regard the judgment of his peers as the most natural or obvious way of meeting the charge moreover other clauses of the charter indicate that the barons used more explicit language when they wished to emphasize a demand for a judicium parium disputes about land on the welsh border were to be settled per judicium parium secundum legum in accordance with the law of england wales or the march as the case might be note magna carta section fifty two sections fifty five fifty six and the articles of the barons section twenty five the phrase per judicium parium secundum legem does not mean that judgment of peers is according to law but that the judgment by peers must be in accordance with the law those writers who identify the phrase with the phrase per judicium parium well per legem terrae seem to have overlooked this distinction End note. the conclusion is forced upon my mind at least that the thirty-ninth clause was intended 
to lay stress not so much on any particular form of trial as on the necessity for protection against the arbitrary acts of imprisonment disseisin and outlawry in which king john had indulged if we turn to some leading cases of the next twenty years a period during which the great charter was solemnly renewed fresh in men's minds and acknowledged as authoritative this view is confirmed there is the same insistence upon protection the same concern for the observance of law and also the same hesitation or indifference about the actual constitution of the court the king acknowledges that he has disregarded the forms of law it may be in his own court or it may be in a shire court redress is given by the magnates of the realm if the case is of great importance or by a judge in the royal following maitland was fond of reminding us that the distinctions between the royal courts were but vaguely defined in the thirteenth century and with similar indefiniteness we find coram rege cases decided now by the assembled magnates and now by a single justice one such case concerned a great yorkshire house the desirable manor of cottingham which had been much improved first by william then by nicholas de stuteville was claimed by nicholas's co-heiresses on their father's death in twelve thirty three but it had been for some weeks in the possession of his nephew eustace a man of some importance in the affairs of the shire this was clearly a case for an assize of mort d'ancester and for a writ of right for some reason the king intervened dispossessed eustace installed the heiresses and their husbands and finally per concilium magnatum de curia sua took the manor into his own hands eustace had offered large sums for a judgment and in twelve thirty four at wallingford on the octave of trinity twenty fifth june his claim was heard by william raleigh the king was present and admitted that he had acted on his own initiative in deceasing eustace without due process of law sine summonitione et sine judicio eustace was ready again with his offer of one thousand pounds the fine was accepted and judgment was given that he should be reinstated pending a settlement of assize of mort d'ancester and writ of right secundum legem terrae eustace de stuteville seems to have come to an arrangement with hugh wake one of his rivals and was clearly doubtful of his claim but the king had deceased him without a judgment and the decision at wallingford points to the legal process by assize and writ to a possessory and proprietary action as the means of summons and judgment a thousand pounds was a large sum yet a royal admission of error in the royal court was perhaps worth the money the case appears on a roll of pleas which followed the king before w de raleigh eustace was apparently restored not by judicium parium but by one of the king's judges the other claimants were deceased by an administrative act of their peers but in eustace's history there is no mention of such a judgment stress is laid not on it but on summons judgment assize of mort d'ancester writ of right the law of the land a more famous trial of the same year illustrates the proceedings per legem terrae in the case of outlawry the decrees of outlawry declared by king henry against the great hubert de burg and also against gilbert bassett and other companions of richard earl marshall were annulled by a judgment of their peers declared by the mouth of the same william raleigh who decided the cottingham case the king says the record desired to show justice and on twenty third may twelve thirty four called together all the magnates then present in his court at gloucester including edmund archbishop of canterbury bishops earls and others this judgment ended the political crisis during which the earl marshal before his violent death in ireland and gilbert bassett had made the claim to be tried by their peers and had been met by peter de roche with the well-known retort there are no peers in england one would expect therefore a deliverance by the court at gloucester on the question as to whether a baron could be outlawed without a judgment of his peers 
but the judgment contains nothing of the kind. It reverses the decree of outlawry in Gilbert Bassett's case, one, because the act which provoked the king, the rescue, namely, of Hubert de Burgh from sanctuary at Devizes, was done in the course of war, a cajene gurai, and was not therefore an ordinary criminal offence. Two, because the proceedings of outlawry in the Shire Court of Wiltshire were irregular, and only in the third place, three, because Gilbert and his friends had been prepared to stand their trial in the King's Court. The decree against Hubert de Bourgh was annulled on the ground that escape from prison was not in itself punishable by outlawry. In both cases stress is laid on the proceedings in the Shire Court, that is to say, on the Lex Terrae. Note. The phrase is explicitly used in another outlawry case, Notebook, Volume 2, page 75, case 85, of the year 1220. Certain persons who had refused to answer a writ, and whose guilt was clear, were condemned, if they continued to resist the royal officials, to be outlawed in comitatu secundum legum terre. End note. The magnates clearly imply that these barons, distinguished though they were, could have been lawfully outlawed if they had fled per appellum racionabile aut per sectam domini regis ubi fama patriae accusaret bracton as maitland points out probably had this judgment in mind when he stated that outlawry at the king's suit or command is a nullity unless an inquest has been taken by the justices and the fugitive has been found guilty Elsewhere, Maitland describes the judgment in Hubert's case as an important step in constitutional history, since it made indictment or appeal a necessary preliminary to outlawry. But was not the court simply enforcing the principle laid down in the Great Charter? Was it not interpreting the principle to mean that the lex terrae in a case of outlawry was the process in the Shire Court involving either the indictment or the appeal? Two. I have suggested that the barons did not claim a judgment of peers as an essential and universal remedy even for themselves. Their words do not imply this claim, and actual practice did not enforce it. The lex terrae might be trial by combat, as in the marshal's case in 1205, or proceedings in a possessory action, as in Eustace de Stuteville's case, or indictment or appeal, as in the case of Gilbert Bassett and Hubert de Bourgh. It did not involve a judicium parium. That was either an alternative or a last resort, a solution of a judicial or political deadlock. But it is not clear that the barons were thinking only of themselves. Indeed, the conviction that this clause asserts a claim to the judgment of peers in all cases has, I think, been father to the thought that the words liber homo do not include the ordinary free man. Students of the Charter have felt that a claim to the judgment of his peers by the ordinary free man was either unnecessary or absurd. They have urged also that the barons had no special interest in the judicial rights of the ordinary free man, and in the manner of King Charles I liked to speak of themselves as free men. The substitution of the words liber homo in the thirty-ninth clause for the baroness et homines sui of King John's letters had no special significance. First, let us look at the use of the words in the charter. The freeman appears six times. In the fifteenth clause he is protected against unlawful and unreasonable aids levied by his lord in the twenty-first, against immersements which might shatter his social position, in the thirtieth, against forced contributions of horses and wagons for carrying purposes, in the thirty-fourth, against the loss of his court by a writ praecipe, in the thirty-ninth, against arbitrary imprisonment, etc., and in the twenty-seventh clause regulations are laid down for the distribution of his chattels if he should die intestate. If we set aside the thirty-fourth and thirty-ninth clauses for the moment, the charter clearly safeguards the ordinary freeman. Limits are set to the power of his lord, 
local officials are to respect his freedom, judges are to permit his neighbors to immerse him fairly, his relatives are not to suffer when he commits that last sin of intestacy. In two of these clauses the ordinary freeman is explicitly distinguished from the baron. In the twenty-seventh and thirtieth he is primarily intended. Is it credible that in the thirty-fourth and thirty-ninth clauses the same phrase, liber homo, can exclude him? Note. The only argument in favor of exclusion is that in the thirty-fourth clause, where the freeman's court is protected against the writ praecipe, only a baron's court could be intended, but could not any manorial court suffer through the writ? End note. Recent exponents of the Charter have not, I think, allowed sufficient weight to the fact that the document was not a baronial manifesto, but a carefully drafted statement of a settlement, in which churchmen, citizens, and statesmen who had large experience of public affairs took part. Archbishop Langton and several of the barons on each side were not likely to overlook the growing significance of the freeman in English society, or the danger which the community of the realm would run if his economic and legal position were not protected. By the close of the twelfth century the freeholder was an important element in every feudal state of civilized Europe. In most countries it is probable that he did little more than represent a general economic tendency towards fixed services and money rents, and that affranchisement was a privilege of more or less sentimental value, not affecting the actual position of a serf. In England the freeman, however slightly his economic status might differ from that of the villain, was becoming essential to the state as the state was more and more defined in laws and institutions. Within the economy of the manor, the freeman, or, to speak more accurately, the free tenant, strengthened the wealth and dignity of the lord. On the one hand, enfranchised villains were founding families. On the other hand, as the Doomsday Book of St. Paul's records, old tenements were frequently resettled, or new tenements divided, among free tenants paying fixed rents. Note. The Doomsday of St. Paul's, Camden Society, Passim, the free tenants, tenants ad sensum, tenants at a rent of new assarts divided by the farmers of the manors, for example, pages 12 and 36, are as numerous as the other tenants. A forester, a smith, a merchant, and a templar's relicta, were among the tenants of the Assart at Wickham. Page 37. End note. It was to the common interest that these men should not be broken, and the thirty-ninth clause of the Charter, in protecting them and their tenements against illegal interference from the King and his officials, in my opinion simply applied the general principle expressed in other clauses. We have seen that in the case of outlawry, the lex terrae required a charge, either by indictment or appeal in the shire court. There is some evidence for the view that the thirty-ninth clause met, in addition, the desire of the freeman for protection against administrative proceedings at the king's command, and especially against imprisonment without the prospect of a trial in the local court. The contest between the principles of order and liberty had already begun. The natural instrument of order was the prison. During a political crisis or an epidemic of criminal unrest, it was convenient to issue commands for a summary inquiry and for the imprisonment of suspected persons during His Majesty's pleasure. The well-known Edictum Regium of 1195, preserved in the Chronicle of Roger of Howden, was, in fact, a command of this sort, a crimes act, disregarding the usual procedure. During King Richard's absence in the Holy Land, the country had been much disturbed, and Hubert Walter, the new justiciar, was determined to restore order. The great inquiry of 1194 did not meet the situation. The justices had probably been too busy to get through the ordinary police business, Indeed, Roger of Howden tells us that a very important inquiry into the administration of sheriffs and local officials was postponed. Hence, in 1195, 
knights were appointed to deal with crime. A sworn obligation was imposed upon all males of fifteen years and upwards. The inhabitants of each district, Balia, swore that they would keep the king's peace, join in the hue and cry, deliver all who were guilty or suspected of robbery and theft to the knights appointed. The knights passed on the malefactors to the sheriff, who was not to release them save at the command of the king or justiciar. Non deliberandos nisi per regem aut eius capitalem justitiam. The duty prescribed to the king's subjects was very similar to that which they performed in the hundred court, but the procedure was different. The presentments were received by special commissioners, and the imprisonment of those presented followed as a matter of course. Per sacramentum fidelium hominum devis nato, says Roger of Howden, multos caperunt et carceribus regis inclusarunt. No mention is made of judgment in the shire court before the justices. The trustworthy men were not the jury of presentment, and the accused had no opportunity of alleging their general good character, and of submitting to the proof. It is probable that the ordinary methods of attaching and trying criminals had broken down. They broke down periodically during the Middle Ages, but they were quite definite and must have been well understood. Suspected persons were arrested by the sheriff and his bailiffs, sometimes by the tithing man, or in the hue and cry. They might be locked up in the king's jail, or entrusted to the custody of the tithing, or they might be handed over to their relatives or pledges who would be made responsible for their appearance. They were presented, whether in captivity or not, at the sheriff's turn, and again at the shire court before the justices on air. If they were of bad repute, and had been arrested in the act, they might be punished according to the discretion of the court, without further inquiry, that is to say, without going to the ordeal or other proof. Yet even in such a case the assize of Clarendon admitted the right of the accused to find a warranty, si non habeat warentum, non habeat legem. Other suspected persons, those, for example, of decent repute who had been found in possession of stolen goods, went to the ordeal, and after the abolition of the ordeal, were given the opportunity of placing themselves super patriam, of standing by the verdict of a jury. In all this process, imprisonment was merely an incidental affair. It was not yet a common form of punishment after conviction, and only gradually became so general as a form of detention as to necessitate commissions of jail delivery. The distinction between the normal procedure and the drastic action taken by Hubert Walter in 1195 was to be of the greatest importance in future history. Was it realized at the time? At first sight the answer seems to be decidedly in the negative. It is not likely that any opposition was made to the particular edict of 1195. The royal duty of good government included the maintenance of the public peace. These malefactors were persons of ill fame, and were arrested after sworn inquiry among their neighbors. Whether they were tried or not in the future would be a matter of general indifference, and could be left to the royal discretion. Moreover, the king was the source of justice. The man committed to jail, per mandatum domine regis, would in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries have found none to liberate him. By Bracton's time, a sheriff who released on main prize a man who had been arrested by the king's command, or on command of the justiciar, would have defied the law of England, and although this rule, it is true, applied to prisoners awaiting trial, there was nothing to compel the king to bring them to trial. It must be admitted that administrative action such as Hubert Walter's was regarded as within the lawful scope of authority also that persons imprisoned by the king's command could, before the law of habeas corpus had been painfully hammered out, be tried at the king's pleasure. The Edictum Regium of 1195 is the first of a long series of formal acts enforcing what may be termed the administrative law of the prerogative, a prerogative which still exists in king and parliament. 
yet i believe that even at the close of the twelfth century the desire to emphasize the extraordinary nature of this reserved power was both felt and expressed this desire is expressed i think in the thirty-ninth clause of the great charter the charter did not succeed in abolishing the prerogative right of imprisonment it was more successful in stretching the protection of the law over the free tenement but it did assert the principle that the free man must normally be accused and punished in a special manner however awkward or inefficient that manner might be from the days of henry the second the two methods of keeping the king's peace the one per legem terrae the other by administrative action may be traced in medieval england one it is clear that henry the second anticipated the action of hubert walter probably with much less formality the proof is to be found in the action of queen eleanor after henry's death in eleven eighty nine she sent commissioners through england to liberate prisoners the orders given to these commissioners carefully distinguished various kinds of persons who were in jail offenders against the forest law were to be set free and pardoned persons imprisoned per commune rectum were to find pledge for their appearance in case an appeal should be brought against them if they could find no pledge they were to be sworn to appear various other classes who had been subject to legal process were also enumerated they were in most cases to be released under conditions but one group was like the offenders against forest law to be freed unconditionally et ut omnes alii qui capti essent et retenti per voluntatem regis vel justitiae eius qui non essent retenti per commune rectum comitatus vel hundredi vel per appellationem quieti essent clearly in eleven eighty nine the king's prisons contained persons who had been imprisoned by decree not in accordance with the procedure defined in the assizes of clarendon and northampton unimportant people who should have been presented at the hundred court had not escaped henry's attention however salutary this direct intervention may have been it was felt to be anomalous in order to show that a new reign had begun the queen mother declared an act of grace two two years later restrictions were imposed by the barons on the justiciar's power of administrative decision the critics of william longchamp admitted the right of the king to deceive a vassal of his property without a rigid observance of the new procedure but as a rule the lawful customs and assizes of the kingdom must be observed sed et concessum est quod episcopi et abates comites et barones vavasores et liberi tenentes non ad voluntatem justitiarum vel ministrorum domini regis de terris vel catalis suis disesientur sed judicio curiae domini regis secundum legitimas consuetudines et assisas regni tracta buntur well per mandatum domini regis two points are noticeable in this passage the free tenant who is distinguished from the baron and vavasor was explicitly included and protection was particularly desired from the royal officials the demand was extended in 1215 to protection against the king, and was defined still more clearly in 1217, in a passage which recalls the wording of this treaty. Nullus liber homo, disesietur de libero tenemento suo, vel libertatibus, vel liberis consuetudinibus suis, nisi per legale judicium parium suorum, well per legem terrae three de season was more easily dealt with than imprisonment we have seen that between eleven eighty nine and twelve fifteen hubert walter systematized the practice of imprisonment per mandatum regis and forbade release nisi per regem aut eius capitalem justitiam in john's reign this practice recognized as anomalous in eleven eighty nine became a nuisance john was for one thing not concerned to take the opinion of his victim's neighbors into consideration 
He was after booty, not justice. He spared neither small nor great, and he was compelled to surrender this prerogative in 1215. As Mr. McKechnie has reminded us later, opponents of the jurisdiction of the King's Council interpreted the thirty-ninth clause of the Charter in this way. They insisted upon the necessity of indictment or presentment by good and lawful people of the neighborhood in which the crime was committed. Coke borrowed the same construction from Edward III's statutes when he translated per legem terrae by the words due process of law. The phrase, indeed, is a very fair equivalent to Queen Eleanor's per commune rectum comitatus, well hundredi, well per appellationem. On this view, the clause comprehended the criminal procedure of the twelfth century. It said, in effect, unless the case is so anomalous, or the accused so important, that a trial in the king's court by the magnates of the realm is desirable, he must be dealt with in the usual way, by presentment or indictment, in hundred or shire courts, with recourse to the customary proofs. Note. Neither baron nor freeman got matters all his own way. In the thirteenth century we have state prisoners who did not find much help in Magna Carta. End note. In 1241 the sheriffs were instructed by Henry III to keep suspected persons in prisone nostra donec a nobis aliud haburis mandatum. In 1264, Simon de Montfort went further than Hubert Walter had gone in 1195. In the king's name, he placed every shire under a single custos pacis, who was instructed to use the whole strength of the shire for the arrest of criminals and disturbers of the peace. The arrested persons were to be kept in custody. Donec aliud inde praeceperimus. But Simon's action was taken under very abnormal conditions. On the whole, the principles laid down in the charter were observed with remarkable continuity. I have already pointed out how Henry the Third was obliged in 1234 to reverse an unlawful decision and the unlawful outlawry of certain barons. The freeman was also protected. The royal officials, for example, had reason to be very prudent and circumspect in their dealing with suspected persons. A rash imprisonment might involve them in heavy damages. Note. Notebook, Volume 2, page 366, 542, cases 465, 705. In the latter case, a sheriff was declared in misericordiam for wrongful imprisonment, even though the sheriff said that if murder had been committed, the accused were the guilty persons. End note. The periodic revival of disorder, in fact, was encouraged by the conditions which made officials and communities alike unwilling to prosecute their duties. A false step was so expensive. The government tried to deal with disorder by reforms in the police organization, but did not, except on rare occasions, as in 1241 and 1264, interfere with procedure. The police reforms were no more an infringement of the Charter than was the growth in the practice of imprisonment pending trial, or the rule that a man so imprisoned by the King's command could not be replieved. Yet these reforms have probably been confused with the occasional edicts interfering with the Lex Terrae, although in reality they maintained continuity in procedure. The thirteenth-century conservators of the peace, whether they were sergeants elected by the shire, or knights appointed by the king, or important barons invested with special powers, were concerned mainly with the visum armorum and the process of arrest. Just as the headboroughs and constables kept the peace in township and manor, so the conservators assisted the execution of the common law in hundred and shire. The elaborate writ of 1242, which assigned knights in each shire, refers explicitly to the subsequent trial of suspected persons, per legem terrae, thus correcting the action taken in the previous year. 
suspectos autem de die per quoscumque arrestatos recipiant vice comites sine dilacione et difficultate et salvo custodiant donec per legem terrae deliberentur one of the objects of the statute of winchester which codified previous legislation in twelve eighty five was the more conscientious and exhaustive presentment of malefactors by the local juries the conservators were gradually given judicial functions and developed into the justices of the peace but they still administered the common law the lex terrae hence when stubbs traced a connection between hubert walters milites assignati earl simon's custos pacis and the justice of the peace he was i venture to think suggesting a misleading confusion between the exceptional and the normal in the history of criminal law so far as their police duties were concerned the connection between these officials is clear but it is easy to forget that whereas the justice of the peace had behind him the assizes of arms and clarendon the officials appointed in eleven ninety five and twelve sixty four had not the peculiarity of the measures taken in eleven ninety five and twelve sixty four lay not in the method of arrest but in the imprisonment during the king's pleasure the commissions issued to the justices of the peace on the contrary from the period when they combined the functions of conservators and justices until the year fifteen ninety directed the enforcement of the statute of winchester that is to say of the final definition of the system laid down in the assizes of arms clarendon and northampton the justices were so circumscribed by the lex terrae that in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries they could not order an arrest until the accused had been indicted in open sessions of the peace in edward the third's reign the practice was more elastic but well within the limits of the traditional system according to the commission of thirteen fifty seven the justices were to arrest after inquiry per sacramentum proborum et legalium hominum and to determine the cases secundum legem et consuetudinem regni nostri angliae the statute of thirteen sixty ordered them to pursue arrest and punish evil-doers selon la loi et coutume du royaume the lex terrae constantly broke down in the time of justices of the peace as it had constantly broken down in hundred and shire the difficulties are clearly described in the statute of winchester and in the petitions to the judges on air to counsel to the chancellor and to the parliament the folk of the district would not present officials grew slack and corrupt the justices in their turn were too often either overworked or open to unjust influences in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries the king's ministers or council tried to remedy matters by decrees for laying criminals by the heels in the fourteenth the council began to hear and determine petitions on its own account began in short to lay the foundation of that judicial control which was later to develop into the courts of star chamber and requests it was under these new circumstances that parliament appealing to the great charter raised its voice on behalf of the lex terrae the system of indictment and presentment the party of law not for the last time in our history was not the party of order even though it was the party of progress in the fourteenth century the important phrase was lex terrae in the seventeenth the party of law and progress fastened on the phrase judici imparium in this paper i have tried to show that however badly the contemporaries of pym and selden may have blundered there is a good deal to be said for their fourteenth-century predecessors in twelve fifteen neither baron nor freeman was concerned primarily with a judgment of peers so much as with justice the judici imparium ran through a good part of english procedure but it was not universal from the baronial standpoint it was especially important as a last resort in cases where justice had not been done and the law was uncertain the barons had no intention of excluding from the lex terrae any part of the new judicial system neither the court of common pleas 
nor the justices in error, nor the presentment of the grand jury. They were demanding, as they demanded at Merton a few years later, that the practices of English law should not be changed. In the same spirit they desired that sheriffs and other local officials should be men acquainted with the Lex Regni, and on the whole they got their way. The peculiarity of English history is not that the common law is supreme, but that it is so practiced as to seem supreme, and that other expressions of the sovereign power, whether the equitable jurisdiction of the King's Council in the fourteenth century, or a defense of the Realm Act in the twentieth, are universally admitted to be temporary and abnormal. If King John had not grossly abused his power as the source of justice, it is quite possible that this tradition would never have been formed. The policy of efficiency practiced by men like Hubert Walter, Thomas Cromwell, and Francis Bacon might well have gathered momentum and swept aside the prejudices in favor of the common law. End of Section 7 Section 8 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Magna Carta and the Common Law by Charles Howard McIlwain, Professor of History and Government, Harvard University. In estimating the importance of Magna Carta, what we chiefly need is a history of the document in the period after 1215. One of the most significant points in that subsequent development is the famous confirmation by Edward I in 1297. This confirmation is in part as follows. Quote, know ye that we to the honour of God and of the Holy Church, and to the profit of all our realm, et à profit de tout notre royaume, have granted for us and our heirs that the great charter of liberties, le grand chartre des franchises, and the charter of the forest, which were made by common assent of all the realm, lesquelles furent faites par commun assent de tout le royaume, in the time of King Henry our father, shall be kept in every point without breach, soit tenu en tous leurs points, son nul blémisement. And we will that these same charters shall be sent under our seal to our justices, both to those of the forest and to the rest, and to all sheriffs of shires, and to all our other officers, and to all our cities throughout the realm, together with our writs, in the which it shall be contained that they cause the aforesaid charters to be published and have it declared to the people that we have granted that they shall be observed in all points, and that our justices, sheriffs, mayors, and other officials, who under us and by us have to administer the law of the land, qui la loi de la terre, de sous nous et par nous ont à guier, shall allow the said charters in pleas before them, and judgments in all their points. That is to say, the great charter of liberties as common law, and the charter of the forest according to the assize of the forest for the relief of our people. C'est à savoir la grande chartre des franchises comme loi commune, et la chartre de la forêt selon l'assise de la forêt, à l'amendement de notre peuple. 2. And we will that if any judgments be given from henceforth, contrary to the points of the charters aforesaid, by justices, or by any other our ministers that hold pleas before them, touching the points of the charters, they shall be undone and holden for naught. Et voulons que s'il nul jugement soit donné désormais, en contre les points des châtres avant dites, par justice et par nos autres ministres, qui contre les points des châtres tiennent plaie devant eux, soit défait et pour néant tenu. 3. And we will that the same charters shall be sent under our seal to cathedral churches throughout our realm, and there remain, and shall be read before the people twice in the year. 4. 
and that archbishops and bishops shall pronounce sentences of greater excommunication against all those that by word deed or counsel shall go against the aforesaid charters or that in any point break or go against them and that the said curses be twice a year denounced and published by the prelates aforesaid and if the same prelates or any of them be remiss in the denunciation of the said sentences the archbishops of canterbury and york for the time being as is fitting shall reprove them and constrain them to make that denunciation in form aforesaid End quote. under the first of these sections the king's justices are directed to administer magna carta as common law comme loi commune the sense hereof says coke is that the great charter and the charter of the forest are to be holden for the common law that is the law common to all and that both the charters are in amendment of the realm that is to amend great mischiefs and inconveniences which oppressed the whole realm before the making of them End quote. this paper is an attempt to explain still further the sense hereof but the most difficult part of the explanation as usual lies in that part of the provision whose meaning seems at first the most obvious loi commune no tolerably prepared candidate in an english or american law school will hesitate to define an estate in fee simple says sir frederick pollock Quote, on the other hand the greater have been a lawyer's opportunities of knowledge and the more time he has given to the study of legal principles the greater will be his hesitation in face of the apparently simple question what is law End quote. one's opportunities of knowledge would have to be great indeed to be even in slight degree commensurate with his hesitation in attempting to define common law with all that it implied in twelve ninety seven but defined it must be in some fashion before we can understand the real significance of magna carta in the later middle ages some examination of contemporary records has convinced me that coke's interpretation is in the main the correct one but one of his statements seems also to show that it is correct in a sense possibly somewhat different from the one he had in mind this is his inclusion without comment of the charter of the forest with magna carta as the common law what then is the law common to all what made it common in twelve ninety seven how did this conception of a common law and the mass of corresponding rights actually come into existence and finally what light is thrown by an explanation of these things upon the history and character of magna carta itself for a considerable part of the period when the common law was taking form in england there may be observed in the writers on law a certain struggle between the roman idea of lex and the medieval conception of law as immemorial usage the judges of those times who were generally in orders were better acquainted with roman legal conceptions than many of their brethren of a much later time their knowledge and reverence for these ideas coupled with the necessity they were under of administering a law of a different origin at a less advanced stage of development but with roots so deep in the traditions and habits of the people that its binding force was unquestionable these are the chief explanation of apparently incompatible statements concerning the basis and extent of the royal authority which even the adiciones in a text like bracton's cannot wholly explain in the field of private law somewhat the same struggle is to be seen between lex and consuetudo the one a product of the classical period of roman law the other a growth of the middle ages out of roots that are quite different the medieval desire for unity led the jurists of the time to make interesting attempts to reconcile these conflicting conceptions constantine's famous dictum consuetudinis ususque longaiwi non vilis auctoritas est they gladly fasten upon but it will not fully serve their needs until it is practically inverted 
so the author of glanville feels it necessary to apologize to his learned readers for an english customary law which he never thinks of questioning footnote the customary law consuetudo he also calls jura regni but he will not admit a sharp distinction between it and lex though it is mainly unwritten for he is not ignorant of the popular origin of lex even in rome leges namque anglicanas licet non scriptas leges appellari non videtur absurdum cum hoc ipsum lex sit quod principi placet leges habet vigorem eas gilicet qua super dubiis in concilio definiendis procerum quidem concilio et principis accidente autoritate constat esse promulgatas tractatus de legibus et consuetudinibus regni angliae prologus Confergistinian institutes one two three with which glanville in common with nearly all the mediaeval english juristic writers prefaces his treatise End footnote. glanville is quoted word for word by the author of flata but without acknowledgment bracton also begins his treatise with the usual liberal quotations from the institutes and borrows from glanville the sentence identifying consuetudo with lex but his treatment of the subject is fuller and much more valuable it is clear that these medieval writers are faced with a consuetudo a lex non scripta which is binding much as lex was binding in the later roman empire in order then to apply their favorite texts in support of the existing law they are under the necessity of including within lex what was certainly not included in justinian's time the outstanding fact is that custom had really become law it was accepted by common usage pro lege this is almost the central fact in early english law but we moderns like the romans of the later empire are so prone to identify lex and law that we can hardly appreciate the difficulty in which glanville and bracton found themselves glanville's apology for consuetudo was directed at the classicists and is easily understood by ourselves to a twelfth-century englishman if unlearned in roman law it probably had very little meaning but consuetudo was a thing well understood evidence of its importance and its binding character is abundant glanville himself in the passage quoted above though he is paraphrasing the institutes cannot say as they do that in england the law is what the people or what any one constitue bat instead he has to say that it consists of those things quas super dubiis in concilio definiendis procerum quidem concilio et principio accedente autoritate constat esse promulgatas it is something already in existence which may indeed need defining but can only be promulgated not made the celebrated excommunication of twelve fifty three mentions only those who violate the liberties of the church magna carta the charter of the forest well antiquas regni consuetudines approbatas it is not difficult to prove that these ancient customs of the realm were of binding force even of supreme binding force so the author of the mirror of justices who may certainly be trusted as an interpreter of contemporary words and phrases though we can no longer believe all his stories declares that the article in the statute of marlborough concerning reader caesars is reprehensible because no special ordinance ought to exceed common law car nullement de moi spécial ne doit passer comme un droit and we find the justices of both benches required to take oath that in case they receive letters from the king commanding anything contrary to the law they will enforce the law notwithstanding such letters 
the parliament roll of the year thirteen thirty contains an interesting petition by several nobles setting forth that they were entitled to lands escheated at the time of the suppression of the templars which lands however had been handed over by a statute irregularly procured by the dispensers to the hospitallers they pray that this statute be annulled and quote the opinions of the judges against it les dites justices disaient appartement et expressement que le roi ni ne devote ni ne le peut faire par loi non pas pour ce les dit hugh et hugh pas pour qu'il avait firent faire un statut si qu'on peut par le statut que les hospitaliers eussent les terres de templiers et en lequel les statuts peut être trouvé que les justices ne s'assentirent point car ils ne peuvent pour leur serment par la déshéritance du roi et de ses gens et disaient que ce sont contraries à loi isque ce les statuts se fit contre loi et contre raison in thirteen forty one during the struggle between edward the third and his parliament the king had been compelled to make certain important concessions in return for the parliamentary grants but when these had to be put in the form of a statute the chancellor treasurer and some of the justices protested that they would not enforce them en cas que même les statuts fussent contraires à les lois et usages du royaume les que il fût sérimenté de garder the reasons they assign are significant whether they were sincere or not for the year thirteen forty seven there is a petition on the parliament roll against a judgment made in parliament which is declared to be contre les lois du royaume et les usages approuvés in thirteen ninety seven parliament annulled the award of parliament convicting hugh de spencer and seemingly endorsed the charge that the act of edward the third affirming this award fut fait contre droit loi et raison quel est statut quant à les dix articles ne ma droiturelle ne raisonnable ne dut être de force par la loi était en contre droit et raison et en contre la loi de la terre two years later on the accession of henry the fourth the new king declared qu'il n'est pas son entente ne volonté pour tourner les lois et statuts ne bons usages mais pour garder les anciens lois et statuts ordaignés et usés en temps de ses nobles progéniteurs selon son serment the pronunciatio by which the parliament of the first regnal year of henry the sixth was opened declares the purpose of the session to be the enjoyment by all classes of their liberties and franchises which have not been repealed ne par la commune loi repellable and the statutes of the next year open with a confirmation of all such franchises bien usé et niant rappelé ne parla comme une loi rappelable some of these examples undoubtedly arise out of factional and even revolutionary struggles but the frequent and repeated insistence upon the supremacy of the common law as a justification even though it may be at times an unjust action that is justified seems to show conclusively the position occupied by the common law it was in a very real sense a fundamental law but if this law was really supreme it becomes the more necessary to try to discover the points in which it differed from other rules or enactments to ascertain as nearly as we can just what was common law from the passage quoted above from bracton it appears that custom has the force of law in england approbata more utentium and that these consuetudines are either plures et diversi i e particular customs or common custom which is consuetudo regni angliae thus he speaks of the king's retaining an outlaw's lands for a year and a day Sicut esse debet secundum consuetudinem regni nostri angliae or of waste 
contra consuetudinem regni nostri, or of an inquest secundum consuetudinem regni angliae. So he declares, et sicut papa ordinare potest in spiritualibus quod ordines et dignitates, ita potest rex in temporalibus de hereditatibus dandis well hereditibus constituendis secundum consuetudinem regni sui habet enim quod libet regnum suas consuetudines et diversas poterit enim una esse consuetudo in regno angliae et alia in regno franciae quantum ad successiones in Bracton's day the organization and powers of Parliament were still undeveloped, and the terminology of legislation was not yet fixed. His favorite term for enactments is constitutio, in which he shows his Roman and canon law training. He refers to the statute of Merton as nowa constitutio, and to a violation of it as fraus constitutioni. He says also that a writ of novel de season will not issue where a tenant has granted so much of his estate in Frank Almoin that his lord had lost his service. Quia hoc est contra constitutionem. In another place he asserts the same rule, propte constitutionem libertatis. These constitutiones are in addition to consuetudines which are in use throughout the realm. Hence many things are controlled by the law and custom of the realm. It is no accident that the writs appointing the justices for an assize of novel de season command them to do justice secundum legem et consuetudinem regni nostri angliae. Judges are so to conduct themselves, says Bracton, ut constitutione sed eorum edicta, Iuri et consuetudinibus approbatis, et communi utilitati sint convenientia. These are the rules to which Bracton refers as lex terrae et regni consuetudines and ius commune. Whether customary or statutory, it is the law common to the realm as distinguished from particular law. So in discussing waste, Bracton says, et quid debeat adjudicare ad vastum, et quid non, propter magnitudinem et parvitem, habet quae libet, patria suum modum, constitutionem et consuetudinem. And modus, he says, following the familiar doctrine of the Roman lawyers, though in a sense probably never meant by them, and here speaking of grants, legem dat donationi, et modus tenendus est contra ius commune, et contra legem quia modus et conventio vincunt legem. Of the law of succession, he says, item poterit conditio impedire descensum ad proprios heredes, contra ius commune. And because it is given to all in common, it is called common law, says the author of the Mirror of Justices, of the law with which he deals. References to the common law became more frequent as the 13th century closed. For example, it is said to be en contre la commune loi, for a subject to inflict the death penalty on a criminal. Later, in the reign of Richard the Second, the Commons complain of royal interference with la loi de la terre et comme un droit. It is not necessary to multiply instances further, though they are many. The general connotation of common law is beyond doubt. Its exact meaning becomes clearer, however, when we take note of the special law that contemporaries were wont to contrast with it. At times we find la commune loi thus designated to distinguish it from enactment. Footnote, thus a litigant was told in one Edward the Second, you are not aided by the common law, nor by special law, par la commune loi, ni par loi spéciale. In the next year another was informed that he must rely either on common law or on special law, par la commune loi, 
ou par loi spéciale, variant par ancienne loi ou par nouvelle loi, and that neither the common law nor la nouvelle loi will help him. In 1377, the Commons petitioned for the observance and confirmation of la commune loi et auxin les especiales lois et statuts et ordinances de la terre made for the common profit and good governance of the realm in the times preceding. End footnote. Or it might be the law of the church that was contrasted with it, the lex forestae, les lois d'armes, the laws of the court of the constable and marshal, the law of the staple, Roman law, or the lex parliamenti. But the special law found most often in contrast with loi commune is the consuetudo, less frequently the lex, of some particular region or district which differs in its provisions from the lex et consuetudo regni. In the second regnal year of Edward the Second, it was argued that a manor which formed a part of the king's ancient demesne was tel lieu que n'est pas à la commune loi. In a case in 1307, certain tenements were declared to be divisible selon la coutume de Everwick, York. Cases of the law of Kent are numerous. For example, it was said in the Common Pleas in the twentieth regnal year of Edward I that certain tenements are not transferred from the common law to a special law, changé hors de la commune loi en la especiale loi, unless the partibility of the tenement could be proved. Here the special law is a customary one, le usage du pays. Wales and the Marches naturally give us many examples in the Middle Ages, particularly before the enactment of Statutum Walliae. For tenements in Wales and the Marches, Article 56 of the Great Charter of John guarantees to Welshmen and Marchers trial by peers, secundum legem Walliae and secundum legem Marciae, respectively. In the 25th regnal year of Henry III, a Welsh litigant pleads quod nescit placitare secundum consuetudinem Angliae, and obtains a continuance ad deliberandum. In 1281, Edward promised Llewellyn that the laws of Wales and the Marches should not be disturbed, and informed him that the judges had been so instructed. The Statutum Walliae itself, while asserting Edward's right to declare, interpret, increase and take away from these particular laws, especially in pleas of the crown, expressly accepts the law of succession to lands, contracts, procedure, etc., which are to remain as they were, quia aliter usitatum est in walia quam in anglia, et a tempore cuius non extitit memoria. In a case arising upon a decision in the nineteenth regnal year of Edward I, the defendant answers, Quod tenementa non sunt in comitatu, Hereford, sed sunt in marcia valiae, et debent in judicium de duci secundum legem marciae, et non per legem angliae, juxta statutum de runnymede, et quod non sunt in comitatu et ideo, non deberent tractari per legem communem. The point was conceded. Two years later, Richard Fitzalan declares he is a baron of Wales, ubi est consuetudo approbata, that the barons should submit their disputes to the arbitration of a friend of both parties. In 1321, a number of persons in Wales petitioned the Chancellor to issue a writ to the Justice of North Wales to do justice secundum legem et consuetudinem parcium milarum. The law of the Scottish March, of course, was on the same general basis. In 1249, a commission consisting of twelve English and twelve Scottish knights were sworn to the observance of the Leges Marciarum. It seems clear, then, that common law is the Lex et Consuetudo Regni Angliae, Usitae et Approbatae Communi Utilitati Convenientes and that the basis of consuetudo, as of lex, is that it is approved, if not by express enactment, more utentium. 
this law is common because it is jus regni angliae enforced and observed de consensu magnatum et re publicae communi sponsione special custom is such as in like manner observatur in partibus and it might be added by certain classes or estates of the people ubi furit more utentium approbata et vicem legis obtinet and special leges are those expressly assented to by the particular persons so bound by them so we return to coke's dictum that the common law is the law common to all if our difficulties ended here it would seem rather unnecessary to labour a point so apparently obvious at such length as i have done but magna carta was not only common law it was also enactment and constantly referred to as such in order to understand its real significance we must first examine the larger question of the relation of enactment in general to the loi commune and to make this difficult question as clear as possible it seemed necessary as a preliminary to restate much that is obvious in connection with the common law itself the next problem that meets us then is the relation of enactment to the law particularly the common law in medieval england and this is a problem of great difficulty as indicated above the names of enactments of law for the realm were variable until they became stereotyped by the general acceptance of parliament's enacting power the author of the leges henry key speaking probably of henry the first's famous writ for the holding of the shire and hundred courts says the practice founded in ancient custom had lately been confirmed by a record vera nuper est recordacione firmatum the constitutions of clarendon are spoken of in the preamble to the document as ista recordatio vel recognitio cuiusdam partis consuetudinum et libertatum et dignitatum of the king's predecessors similarly the assize of clarendon is termed haec assisa as is also the assize of the forest in eleven eighty four john's charter of liberties itself is called this present charter of ours bracton speaks as we have seen of the statute of merton as nowa constitutio and elsewhere refers to a change in the law of dower made by it as brought about nowa superveniente gratia et provisione in a case in the forty-third regnal year of henry the third one of its sections was referred to as provisio de merton the edictum de kenilworth is well known and it was so called by contemporaries the statute of winchester is cited by the author of the mirror of justices as la constitution de Winchester. in the reign of henry the third the word statute begins to be prominent but at first hardly in any technical sense and alternative with other terms for example in the thirty-ninth regnal year of henry the third the statement is made that a rule in concilio apud merton provisum fuit et statutum concerning the procedure on a writ of right post illam constitutionem so in the fifty-second regnal year of henry the third mention is made of the pardon for transgressors in the time of the recent war occasione provisionum seus statutorum exonii non observatorum by the time of edward i however it is evident that statute is becoming a technical term and the other names cease to be applied to the same enactments so the author of the mirror in the third chapter of his first book des premiers constitutions tells us that alfred ordained pour usage perpetuel that his nobles should assemble at least twice a year pour parlementer sur le guimont du peuple dieu par celle les statues he says divers ordinances were made in times subsequent 
the statutum de marleberg is referred to in pleas of the fifth and sixth years of the reign in michaelmas term the thirteenth and fourteenth regnal years of edward i judgment was given under a rule quod constitutum fuit per regem per secunda statuta west monasteriensia it is unnecessary to continue further a list which grows rapidly longer after this date statute has now become the usual word for a certain kind of enactments of parliament and it is sometimes applied to acts such as the one known as de asportatis religiosorum which are known to us only in forms not usual in statutes some of them being found only in the form of writs the uncertainty of some of these so-called statutes may be due to a looseness in the application of the term which disappeared later when the word invariably conveyed one definite and technical meaning statutum seems to be a popular rather than a technical term before the reign of edward i and it is possible that the non-technical employment of it may have survived longer in isolated cases to the confusion of the modern historian end of section eight Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Magna Carta and the Common Law by Charles Howard McIlwain, Professor of History and Government, Harvard University. Part 2 our real difficulty arises with the question what was the real nature of these statuta after the meaning of the word had been fixed and how did they differ if at all from the law that preceded them and from enactments which were not termed statutes the subject of the relation of enactment to the law which precedes as that relation was understood in the later middle ages is a subject that has received a good deal of attention in recent years we have passed beyond the naive view that men of the middle ages must have understood that relation just as we understand it today we are trying to discover what the men of that time really thought about it for example mr lapsley's view that the well-known declaration of parliament in thirteen twenty two seeming to require the participation of all the estates of the realm in binding legislation applied merely to such constitutional arrangements as had been effected by the ordinances of thirteen eleven or professor merriman's interpretation of parliament's legislative functions as the repealing rather than the enacting of law as an alternative interpretation i submit an explanation which might be summarized as follows first enactments of substantive law in england in the later middle ages were made for the general purpose of affirming the law already approved or of removing abuses which hindered its due execution pour sûrement garder les lois overdue execution et astif remedy pour abusion de la loi en usurpation such affirmance implied frequent interpretation the supplying of additional penalties to secure proper execution and even supplemental enactments for the same purpose this eventually led to changes in the law itself but such changes came gradually and in the main only incidentally and were not the main purpose of enactment repeal of the laws used and approved is in the beginning not thought of it comes very gradually and in the guise of the removal of provisions which have wrongfully interpreted or added to the old law and tended to the introduction of abuses rather than the removal of them the substance of the old law itself is in theory not repealable at least in early times when statutes are repealed the oft-repeated reason is that they are against the law of the land or prerogative 
repeal is strictly in the beginning nothing more than a remedy pour abusion de la loi en usurpation occasionally in times of disorder whole parliaments were repealed in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries but the reason alleged is usually that their summons is irregular or their acts unlawful it is only at a comparatively late period that the repeal of statutes is openly avowed as one of the purposes of parliament even then such a power is hardly considered as reaching the central principles of the common law on the contrary an examination of parliamentary rolls of the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries will show that the first business of a parliament is the re-enactment or affirmance of the whole body of the fundamental law including the statutes of the king's predecessors this is nearly always stated among the purposes of the parliament in the pronunciationes and it is almost invariably prayed for first among the petitions of the commons it would not be beyond the truth to say that in this period parliament was in its legislative capacity above anything else an affirming body for such affirmations en bloc are almost invariable it is only in the latter part of this period that the commons in their petition for the affirmance of preceding enactments begin to add the significant phrase et ni en repelle there is a remarkable and possibly not accidental similarity between these repeated affirmations at the opening of each parliament and the earlier proclamations of the king's peace at the beginning of each reign second participation in the enactment of such laws is based on the theory that the binding enactment of a law can be made only by those whom it touches it must be a law approbata utentium to use bracton's phrase if an enactment is to bind the clergy the clergy must assent to one binding the baronage the barons must assent a provision affecting merchants only is binding on account of their consent alone and the law of particular districts is recognized as valid more approbata utentium but likewise what touches all should be approved by all footnote this famous sentence appeared in the writs of summons to the clergy for the model parliament of twelve ninety five the writs begin as follows sicut lex justissima provida circumspectione sacrorum principum stabilita hortatur et statuit ut quod omnes tangit ab omnibus approbetur sic et nimis evidenta ut communibus periculis per remedia provisa communiter obvietur the lex here referred to is probably from justinian's code five fifty nine five where nothing of a political character is referred to but only the common action of several co-tutores appointed under a will or otherwise the original words are ut quod omnes similiter tangit ab omnibus comprobetur it is interesting to note that in the supplementary title de regula juris at the end of the sext published three years after edward's writs in twelve ninety eight boniface the eighth includes this maxim as regular twenty nine quod omnes tangit debet ab omnibus approbari End footnote. and what touches all is the law common to all the lex communis lex terrae lex regni on this basis of consent glanville had tried to fit feudal conditions into roman terms by saying that the people had enacted a law that had been approved by immemorial custom much in the same way that roman lawyers ages before him had interpreted the uti legacit of the twelve tables in the development of the law of testamentary succession if this were true it would not be absurd to assimilate english custom with roman lex it certainly was observed pro lege all this is clear enough for local and particular customs but what of the common law 
how can it really be said to be enacted affirmed and approbata utentium omnium for much of the thirteenth century the baronage lay and ecclesiastical made good their claim that they alone were the populace that all included none beyond themselves populace is frequently used in that sense at that time and their assent seems to have been considered the assent of the realm but by the fourteenth century this was changed other communes besides theirs were making themselves felt in the national councils the communitas baccalariae angliae and the communities of the towns who considered themselves a part of the communitas angliae to which the lex communis applied it is a striking fact that edward's principle that what touches all should be approved by all was carried no further than those communities until the reform bills of the nineteenth century those had a right to participate in the enactment of common law to whom common law applied and by the fourteenth century the communes of the counties and the towns were able successfully to vindicate in parliament their claim to be a part of the populace to which that law and all provisions affirming it were common it is clear that such a principle could not be enforced and could indeed hardly arise before the composition of parliament was settled on the basis which it retained until the legislation of the nineteenth century naturally while that composition was still unsettled this principle was doubtful even if a law must be utentium approbata how could the whole communitas angliae consent in parliament at first apparently while the composition of parliament fluctuated there was doubt as to the validity of an enactment until it had been proclaimed locally throughout the realm only gradually did the theory arise that the whole of england was constructively in parliament that they were all assumed to be there consenting to what parliament did the theory of representation was complete in the fourteenth century the fact that much of the representation was only virtual need give us little concern when we remember that this remained equally true for five hundred years after and that to a certain extent it is true today this theory then did not necessarily give to the estates in parliament alone the right to legislate for particular persons classes or places that might be done by the king by charter or otherwise with the assent of those only who were affected neither did it require the assent of all the estates in parliament unless that assent was given to some enactment which touched them all the one thing that obviously did touch them all was an enactment affecting the lex communis to that the assent of all was necessary third this theory of the participation of the estates in enactment if true will in part explain the nature of the enactments of parliament themselves statutes are enactments of law perpetuellement à durée if this law happens to be common then all must assent but the real distinction between statute and ordinance which gave coke so much trouble does not arise from the difference between enactments of common law and other enactments nor from the fact that the king lords and commons must all unite upon a statute while this is not necessary for an ordinance as coke thought the real difference is that a statute in its original meaning is an affirmance of law if it is in affirmance of the common law it shares the nature of the law it interprets and i have tried to show that one of the characteristics of that common law is its permanence and its supremacy in the realm like the law it authoritatively interprets a statute in affirmance of the common law is permanent also it has become in a sense a part of that law statutes affecting law other than common are for a long time less numerous and less important 
and the name statute was probably applied to them later than to acts for the whole realm and on the analogy of the latter but the essential characteristic in all cases seems to be the purpose on the part of those enacting that their work shall endure for all future time a characteristic that parliamentary statutes were conceived to have because their origin was traceable to the affirmance of a law that was permanent extending a tempore cuius non extitit memoria this theory is weakened somewhat in the fifteenth century but it is safe to say that this is the general conception of parliamentary legislation from the thirteenth century on statutes are enactments perpetuellement à durée it is their permanence that makes them statutes and necessitates somewhat greater formality in their promulgation than is necessary in acts of a character less permanent and therefore less important ordinances on the other hand are temporary provisions which are not considered to affect the permanent law unless they are re-enacted in form of a statute as they often were the essence of a statute then is permanence that of an ordinance is its temporary character statutes in affirmance of the common law had to be assented to by all so had ordinances if they touched all the estates represented in parliament both statutes and ordinances are found that touch fewer classes when they are only those classes so affected need assent in order to make them binding law for them these distinctions are like the conception of affirmance much clearer in the fourteenth century than in the fifteenth when many of the older ideas of parliament's functions are becoming blurred and precedents are beginning to form which are later to furnish the basis for the modern theory of legislative sovereignty these are the three chief points which the contemporary records seem to me to indicate in regard to the nature of enactment before taking up their bearing on the history and nature of magna carta i shall set forth a few of these records under the three headings mentioned above and first under that of one the affirmance of common law in this connection nothing is more significant than the words of the preambles of edward the first's two remarkable statutes of westminster which more than anything else he did justify the application to him of the title the english justinian footnote the enactments of the statute of westminster first three edward the first twelve seventy five are said to be made because the king desired quote, to redress the state of the realm in such things as required amendment for the common profit of holy church and of the realm and because the state of the holy church had been evil kept and the prelates and religious persons of the land grieved many ways and the people otherwise entreated than they ought to be and the peace less kept and the laws used and the offenders less punished than they ought to be by reason whereof the people of the land feared less to offend end quote. the second thirteen edward the first is in some respects more explicit as is also the statute of gloucester six edward the first twelve seventy eight and many others of this reign so remarkable in this respect edward's preambles are much more instructive than later when parliamentary enactment had become a matter of course prefaced by stereotyped phrases or by none at all End footnote. one statement in the preamble to the second statute is particularly interesting it recites the fact that at gloucester in the sixth year of the reign certain statutes had been passed but that certain cases remained undetermined quidam casus in quibus lex deficiebat remanserunt non determinati quidam enim ad reprimendum oppressionem populi remanserunt statuenda hence the present statute commenting on this the author of the mirror says Quote, what is said in the second statute of westminster as to the failure of law in divers cases is open to objection 
because for all trespasses there is law ordained though it may be disused forgotten or perverted by those who know it not and the first three articles are no statutes but merely revoke the errors of negligent judges end quote. The first of these three articles is the important enactment De Donis Conditionalibus, which certainly does do nothing but restore the law as it was before judicial decision modified it. In his biting comments on this and the other important enactments of the early part of Edward's reign, the same author says, for example, one is no statute but the revocation of an error, another affirms rather than repeals an error another though it is but common and ancient law gives insufficient remedy another is merely the revocation to right law of a prevailing error another is a novelty injurious to the lords of fees another seems rather error than law another no statute but lawless will and pleasure another is founded upon no right another is not founded on law while others are just humbug truth for they are not regarded he also refers to alfred's laws as a statute under which quote, divers ordinances were made by divers kings down to the present time which ordinances are disused by those who are less wise, and because they are not put in writing and published in definite terms. End quote. The form of the coronation oath, which remained with but few modifications until the accession of William and Mary, was probably used first at the coronation of Edward the Second. It was certainly used at the coronation of Henry the Fourth in it there is one promise that was not demanded before quote, con cadis justas leges et consuetudines esse tenendas et promitis per te eas esse protegendas et ad honorem dei corroborandas quas vulgus elegerit secundum vires tuas respondebit concedo et promito End quote this is the oath so much referred to by the king and by parliament in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries and its importance is very great in the history of enactment the celebrated ordinances of thirteen twelve provide that all the statutes made en amendement de la loi et au profit du peuple by the king's ancestors soit gardé et maintenu si avant comme être devien par loi et raison provided they are not contrary to the great charter the charter of the forest or the present ordinances and that if any statute were made contre la forme sudite soit tenu pour nul et tout autrement défait two entries on the parliament roll for thirteen forty three during the struggle of the king and parliament are instructive on this point it was agreed that the statute of two years before the fifteenth regnal year of edward the third soit de tout repelle et aniante et perde non des statuts comme celle qui est préjudicielle et contraire à loi et usage du royaume et au droit et prérogative de notre seigneur le roi but as there are certain articles embraced in the said statute which sont raisonnable et accordant à loi et à raison the king and his council agree that these articles together with others agreed upon in the present parliament soit fait et statut de novelle on the advice of the justicie et autres sages et tenu à toujours in the same parliament the commons pray that the statutes concerning grants be observed the king replies that since he perceived that le dit statut fut contre son serment et en blemissement de sa couronne et de sa royalté et contre la loi de la terre en plusieurs points it should be repealed but he wishes that the articles of the said statute be examined 
and that such as are found honourable et profitable pour le roi et son peuple soit refait en nouvelle statue et garde des sorts in thirteen forty seven the commons petitioned that a plaintiff recovering damages on a writ of trespass should have execution on the defendant's lands but were answered by the king that this could not be done sans estatue upon which he desires the advice of his council and will do what seems best pour son peuple in thirteen forty eight the commons prayed that the king would give no response changing their petitions as a result of any bill presented in parliament in the name of the commons by advice of the prelates and grands the king replied to these petitions touchant de la loi de la terre que les lois eu et usées en temps passé ne le process d'icel usé ce en arrière ne se pourront changer sans en faire nouvelle estature à que chose faire le roi ne pouvait donc ne encore peut entendre par certaines causes mais à plus tôt qu'il pourra entendre he with his council will ordain touching those articles and others touchant amendement de loi according to reason and equity for all his lieges and subjects and for each of them a very important entry occurs in the roll for the twenty-fifth regnal year of edward the third where the parliament interprets the law of succession notre dit seigneur le roi veuillant que tout doit et avoir fuis out et la loi en ce cas déclare et mise en certaine fit charger les prélats comtes barons et autres sages de son conseil assemblés à ce parlement à faire délibération sur ce point les queues d'un instant ont dit que la loi de la couronne d'angleterre est et adeste toujours tielle laquelle loi notre seigneur le roi les dix prelats comtes barons et autres grands et toute la commune assemblée et l'ondit parlement approuve et affirme pour toujours for much of the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries the parliaments are regularly opened by a pronunciatio such as the one which states among the chief reasons for the summons que les estatues faits se en arrêt pour amendement des lois de la terre et du peuple ne sont pas gardés ni usés en leur effet another which urges that the good laws and customs be guarded and preserved and violators punished another asking the commons for information comment ces lois de sa terre et les statues sont gardés et exécutés or one which announces that it is the will of the king that the laws seraient tenus et gardés and promises that by letters under the secret seal or privy seal or otherwise la commune loi ne serait disturbée ni le peuple en leur poursuite aucunement délayé for the same period the petitions of the commons usually begin with a prayer such as the one in thirteen seventy nine which asks among other things that the common law of the land be held as used in the time of the king's ancestors as seen in many of the instances given above affirmance and interpretation often go together in reenactments of the law as well as supplementary provisions of great importance but bracton was expressing the conception of his time in distinguishing what adds to the law from what is contrary to it non destruitur quod in melius commutatur so he says a writ is quashed if contra jus et regni consuetudinem et maxime contra cartam libertatis si autem praeter jus fuerit impetratum dum tamen fuit ratione consonum et non iuri contrarium erit sustinendum dum tamen a rege concessum et a concilio suo approbatum the general business of a parliament was well stated in the pronunciato of the parliament of the thirty-eighth regnal year of edward the third to be les lois coutumes et statues et ordinances en son temps 
et en temps de ses ancêtres faites maintenir et si nul soit que besoigne déclaration ajustement ou hartement selon le cas temps et nécessité en ce moment de leur bon avis et conseil déclarer ajouter retrairer et amender The great importance of affirmance in enactment is also illustrated in the limits which were set to the king's dispensing power. The one kind of statute with which he might not dispense was the kind passed in affirmance of the law. End of section 9「of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Magna Carta and the Common Law by Charles Howard McIlwain, Professor of History and Government, Harvard University. Part 3. 2. Participation. It would be rash to say that the principle underlying the participation of the various classes represented in the English Parliament came entirely from feudalism. There are precedents in Rome, and precedents in England and on the continent after the fall of the Roman Empire of quite another kind, but these came to the men of the later Middle Ages through a feudal channel. To put it in another way, Feudalism is the stage through which English institutions had passed and were still passing at the time when the common law was forming and the functions of Parliament developing and the participation of the estates in legislation can no more be understood without taking this into account than can the existence of these estates themselves. Behind them all lies the courier of the lord in which the laws of the fief are found and applied by all the tenants who owe suit there and have the corresponding right to be tried only by the pares curtis the court of the king was the curia regis and the laws found there by its suitors were the lex terrae but while tenants in chief alone might find those laws they had not made them for a long time the barons were able to make good their claim that they were the populace and through that fiction might alone interpret and enforce the law but this fiction never destroyed the underlying theory that law was approved consensu omnium utentium and just so soon as other classes became strong enough they asserted their right to assent to enactments affecting themselves precedents might be found as early as the preamble to alfred's laws and the indefinite right of the people to ratify the election of a king as it appears in the norman period a right to be traced back no doubt to much the same origin as the similar procedure in the choice of the popes before the constitution of the papacy was definitely formed but it seems best to go back no further than the thirteenth century a beginning might be made with the clear statement of bracton who mentions the leges anglicanae et consuetudines quae quidem cum fuerint approbatae consensu utentium et sacramento regum confirmatae mutare non poterunt nec destrui sine communi consensu et concilio eorum omnium quorum concilio et consensu fuerunt promulgatae enactment and interpretation by the king and his courier are permissible without this concilium omnium since they do not destroy but only improve the law in melius tamen converti possunt etiam sine eorum consensu quia non destruitur quod in melius commutatur so also things nova et inconsueta et quae prius usitata non fuerint in regno si tamen similia evenerint per simile judicentur 
si autem talia nunquam prius e venerint et obscurum et difficile sit eorum judicium tunc ponantur judicia in respectum usque ad magnum curiam ut ibi per concilium curiae terminentur when however anything is enacted it is communi consensu omnium in theory even though not in fact we know that the barons alone enacted what bracton calls quidam constitutio quidicitur constitutio de merton yet he says one of its articles provisum est et concessum ab omnibus the sentence of excommunication pronounced in 1253 against violators of Magna Carta, or the liberties of the Church, well antiquas regni consuetudines approbatas, is followed by a ratification under the seal of the King and certain magnates, concluding with a warning that if any additions are made to the document, Dominus Rex, et predicti magnates omnes, et communitas populi, protestantur publicae quod in ea nunquam consensurunt nec consentiunt set de plano eis contradicunt it seems pertinent in this connection also to refer again to the form of the coronation oath which seems to date from thirteen o seven under which the king promised to hold protect and strengthen the just laws and customs quas vulgus e legerit the word vulgus was not used by accident nor e legerit either the consensus omnium includes theirs in theory at least even though it be often merely the tacit assent to immemorial custom participation in grants need not detain us the word consuetudines customs had in the middle ages as it has now a double meaning and undoubtedly it was the desire for a larger participation in grants rather than in enactments that led to the application by edward i to the magnum concilium in larger measure than before of the old principle that what touches all should be approved by all the vindication of the right of consent to grants was understood and is understood now for participation in legislation more proof is needed but fortunately it exists for example in thirteen sixty four the rolls of parliament refer to certain good purveyances and ordinances passed with assent of duc comte baron noble et commune et tous autres que la chose touche some of these are referred to later in the role as a statue. In 1354, the Commons complain of the ordinance of the staple lately passed in the Council at Westminster. They insist that such matters can be determined only in Parliament because they really concern the King and all his people. They declare that they have inspected these provisions et qu'elles leur semblèrent bonnes et profitables pour notre seigneur le roi et tout son peuple soit affirmées en ce parlement et tenues par les statues à durer pour toujours à quelle prière le roi et tous les grands s'accordent uniment et sainte toutefois que si rien soit ajouté soit ajoute ou que rien soit ajouté soit ajouté en parlement quelle heure que métier en sera et ne mis en autre manière. In 1363, the rolls say, Etissant le Parlement continue sur traité de diverses choses, touchant si bien les pétitions baillées par les communes et autres singuliers personnes, comme les besoignes du roi et son royaume. In 1371, the Commons recite the statute ordering que nulle justice par mandement de grand ou privé seal ne laissera de faire commune loi et droit au parti, and pray that it be observed, and que par commandement du roi ne priez des gens privés, notre, la commune loi ne soit de ni bestornée. 
in the fifty-first regnal year of Edward the Third, the Commons petition not to be bound by any statute or ordinance made without their consent, and that statutes made in Parliament be annulled only there, et ceux de commanation du Parlement. They pray more especially that they be not bound by any statute or ordinance granted on petition of the clergy to which they have not consented. Ne que vous dites commune ne soit obligé par nulle constitution qu'ils sont pour leur avantage sans assent de vos dites communes, car eux ne veuillent être obligés à nul de vos statuts ni ordinances faits sans leur assent. The response is, soit cette matière déclare en especial probably because it might be a nice question whether the matters objected to were not really things which touched only the clergy rather than tout son peuple and therefore such as might rightly be determined without the commons assent in the midst of the troubles of the year thirteen eighty one an interesting entry is found in the rolls of parliament the chancellor en plein parlement asks the opinion de tous les on the repeal of the manumission recently granted to the serfs to which the lords spiritual and temporal the knights citizens and burghers responded with one voice in favour of the repeal ajoutant que telle manumission ou franchise des naïfs ne ne peut être fait sans leur assent qu'on le grandre intéresse Eight years later, the Commons petitioned that neither the Chancellor nor the Council, after the dissolution of Parliament, should make any ordinance en contre la commune loi, ni les anciens coutumes de la terre, et les statuts devant ses heures ordonnées, ou à ordonner en ce présent Parlement, un scorche la commune loi à tout le peuple universel. The proclamations for the publication of statutes, or of Magna Carta, and the pronunciationes and petitions in Parliament, also furnish considerable general evidence on this point. In all these, the matters upon which the whole Parliament has acted are expressly stated to be articles pour le commun profit du peuple et du royaume as in the royal proclamation of the confirmation of magna carta in 1297 or a grant à son peuple pour le prix de son royaume in the articuli super cartas of 1300 so a mandate to the justice of chester in 1275 orders him to publish in chester certain provisions and statutes enacted by the magnates for the good of the realm and for the relief of the people such expressions are common later in the pronunciation du parlement but they are not found after edward the second's reign in cases where the commons have not assented for example in thirteen fifty one there is mention made of les statuts faits pour amendement des lois de la terre et du peuple in thirteen seventy eight of the good laws and customs of the realm in 1397, loi juste et honnête universellement, par que si bien les grands comme les petits dus être gouvernés. The king wishes to know if any of his subjects have been hindered in obtaining remedies par la commune loi et sur s'être conseillé par tous les états du Parlement, et en faire bonne et du remède en ce présent Parlement. In 1414, the king desires the preservation of les bonnes lois de sa terre, and also asks Parliament pour faire autre loi de nouvelle à l'aise et profit de ses lieges. The language is somewhat different from what would have been thought of a century earlier, but the principle is the same. The petitions of the commons, like the pronunciationes in the king's name, seem to make this distinction also. In 1341, the Commons pray for the observance of Magna Carta and des autres ordinances et statuts faits pour profit du commun peuple, entendant les points de la dite chartre, ensemblement ou les autres perpétuellement à durée. 
again in thirteen sixty eight they petition for the maintenance of the charters et tous les estatuts faits devant ces heures pour profit de la commune the next year they ask that the statutes be maintained si bien les statuts de la forêt comme tous autres statuts les queues doivent suffire à bon gouvernement s'ils soient bien gardés very important is the careful answer of the archbishop of canterbury in thirteen ninety nine to the prayer of the commons to be excused from taking part in the judgments of parliament it is true he says as the commons have set forth that they need not take part in parliament's actions sauf qu'on est statue à faire ou en grande et subside ou telle chose à faire pour comme un profit du royaume le roi veut avoir especialement leur avis et à son this evidence of the necessity for the advice of the commons on matters pour comme un profit is supplemented by proof of the converse that matters which were clearly not of this character which affected particular classes only needed no ratification by the commons to make them binding law for those whom they did affect so we find a regulation of the exception of nefty by le conseil en parlement in thirteen forty seven and an accord in thirteen thirty one by which the lords agree que nul grand de terre will aid any robber but give aid to the justices in punishing them in the fifty first regnal year of edward the third to a request of the commons for an ordinance regarding foreign merchants the king answers that he and the magnates will consider and ordain what is best matters specially affecting the clergy are among the most valuable on this point in thirteen eighty nine the two archbishops made a protestation in full parliament that they do not assent to any statute of that parliament nunc noviter e dito nec antiquo pretenso inuato which is in restriction of potestas apostolica or the liberties of the church in thirteen ninety seven the prelates protest that they cannot assent to any enactment of the king or the temporal lords touching the rights of the pope there is no mention of the commons the commons had in fact petitioned that the king would with the advice of such sages and worthies as he pleased at the next parliament ordain such changes in the statute of provisors as seemed reasonable and profitable in their discretion in the same year a committee of parliament consisting of lords and knights but commissioned par vertu et autorité du parlement de la sang des seigneurs spirituels et temporels annulled the duke of hereford's patent in fourteen thirty three the commons prayed for a modification of the statute of the staple of calais and were answered that it should be done as they desired savant tout fois au roi père et autorité de modifier même les statuts qu'on lui plaira par avis de son conseil selon ce que mieux lui semblera pour le profit du roi et du royaume three varieties of parliamentary enactment enactments of parliament are referred to in contemporary official records under various names provisiones établissements stabilimenta constituones accords awards ordinationes statuta and a number of others most of the treatment of the points vital to this paper may be included however under the last two of these and that treatment need not be very long after the many excellent discussions of this subject from the seventeenth century to the present footnote see among others fourth institute prin irenacus redivivus animadversions on coke's fourth institute whitelock notes upon the king's writ roughhead's preface to his edition of the statutes introduction by the commissioners to the statutes of the realm also reprinted in cooper's public records hargrave and butler's notes to coke on littleton Amos's notes to Fortescue's De Laudibus Legum Angliae, Gneist, English Constitutional History, English translation, 
Maitland, Constitutional History. Hatchek, Englisches Staatsrecht. Anson, Law and Custom of the Constitution, 4th edition. End footnote. The treatises referred to above quote or cite most of the important precedents in the rolls of Parliament, and it would therefore be useless to give here more than a few of these. In 1324 was passed the statute concerning the lands of the Templars, which was afterwards objected to as against law. The statute was made by the king and magnates only, but it was declared to be concordatum, provisum et statutum, pro lege, in hac parte perpetuo duratura. Two years later the king replied to a petition of the commons, that certain ordinances should be viewed and examined, et les bonnes soient mises en estatut, et les autres soient oustes. The statute of purveyors, passed by the king, lords, and commons, is followed by five additional articles, which are to be in force without change until the next parliament. Just following these articles there is a note on the statute roll, et memorandum quod in parliamento predicto concordatum fuit quod articuli predicti non tenerentur pro statuto probably the most conclusive entry in the rolls of parliament occurs in thirteen forty where a committee is chosen consisting of knights and burgesses as well as lords who are instructed to look over the records of that parliament from day to day and cause Mettre en estatut les points et les articles que sont perpétuels. Lequel est statut notre seigneur le roi, par assain de tous en dit parlement estant, commanda d'engrosser et en sciller et fermement garder par tout le royaume d'Angleterre. Et sur les points et articles qui ne sont mis perpétuels, uns pour un temps, si à notre seigneur le roi, par assain des grands et communes, fait faire et ensiler ses lettres patentes. In the fifteenth regnal year of Edward the Third, an interesting case occurs. Apparently, the previous petitions of Parliament had been assented to, but not authenticated as statutes by the Great Seal. Now, as a condition of the payment of an instalment of a previous grant, the demand is made that these be affirmed as granted by the king. C'est à savoir les points à durer par estatut et les autres par châtre ou patent, et livrés au chevalier des comtés sans rien payer. The word ordinance does not occur. In 1344, the commons pray that the provisions, ordinances and accords made in a previous parliament soit affirmé par estatut perpétuellement à durer. In 1347 they petition that a provision already agreed on in council, without delay, be made selon la forme de l'estatut, and the king promises that that article and the points contained in it soit tenu et gardé en tout point, selon la forme de statut en fait. The Statute of Provisors in 1350 cites Edward I's Statute of Carlisle, lequel estatut tient toujours sa force. A perfectly clear instance is found in 1354. William de Charichel, the Chief Justice, announces among the causes of the summons the permanent fixing of the staple. The council had made certain provisions or ordinances which had been published throughout the realm, and that council had included prelates, lords, justices, sergeants, and others of the commune. But now, pour ce que notre seigneur le roi et les autres, si bien grand comme commune, qui lors était au dit conseil, verrait que la dite estable se tendrait et durait perpétuellement et royaume et terre avant si à même notre seigneur fait se mendre son parlement à ce jour de lundi au fin que les ordonnances de la dite étable soient récitées en même le parlement et si rien soit à ajuster qu'il soit à juste 
et soit à durer perpétuellement comme est statue en parlement another case equally important is found in the first regnal year of richard the second the commons in that year prayed the king that the petitions of the recent parliament which were pour profit de son peuple no doubt to distinguish them from the bills presented by individuals should be now shown to the commons and that such as had been assented to in the form le roi le veut soit affirmé pour estatue ce qui est dit aux communes touchant partie des dites petitions que ce ne fuit que ordonnance et ne mis estatue que ce puisse être vu et rehercé aux communes et ce qui raisonnable est que y soit ordonné pour estatue the next year the commons pray that bills of private persons receive no response but that their own petitions be answered a remedy ordained before the dissolution of the parliament and upon that et sur ce du estatut soit fait en ce présent parlement et en s'il est à demeurer en tout temps à venir in the third year of the same reign the commons petition that an existing ordinance soit mise en estatut en affirmance du sel and the king replied soit même l'ordonnance tenue et gardée pour estatue in thirteen ninety nine mention is made of certain statutes que semper ligarent donec auctoritate alicuius alterius parliamenti fuerint specialiter revocata many instances might be given to show that this distinction between statute and ordinance apparently perfectly clear as to form at least in the time of edward the third was becoming much less so in the fifteenth century these illustrations seem to show that there was a double difference between a statute and an ordinance a difference in subject matter and one of form and effect statutes were in the beginning affirmances of the ancient law other kinds of enactment were employed for temporary administrative measures at the opening of parliament the whole body of the ancient customary law together with the two charters and all previous statutes was affirmed or confirmed this was on the analogy of the earlier declarations of the king's peace at the opening of a reign and it is the nearest approach medieval england shows toward a fundamental law before the days of modern written constitutions this was the most authoritative way in which a fundamental law could be promulgated after the affirmance came as indicated in the pronunciationes the removal of abuses or of enactments contrary to or impeding the execution of this fundamental law and the enactment of legislation supplemental to it which might be of sufficient importance to be classed with that law itself and therefore put into a statute or statutes as we have seen one of the chief characteristics of the law so affirmed interpreted cleared or improved is its permanence and the instances given above show clearly enough that the test of a statute is the question whether the enactment made by it is really incorporated into this law along with it perpetuellement à durée and to be affirmed along with it in all subsequent parliaments the inference is clear then that in the beginning probably all statutes were of this kind but composed as they were of such subject matter it is evident that their enactment is more important than other acts of a parliament as such they required a different mode of authentication than less important acts they were sealed with the great seal and engrossed upon the statute roll as a part of the permanent law after which they were sent to the chancery and the courts of the two benches and also to ireland and elsewhere in cases where this was necessary copies were also sent to the sheriffs of the counties ordering their proclamation preservation and enforcement within the counties this authentication was in the hands of the council 
consisting largely of the judges, or in special cases of a committee, who went over the Parliament roll during or after the Parliament, which led to many omissions and some changes and additions, sometimes complained of by the Commons. Ordinances originally, as temporary law, were not affirmed generally at the opening of Parliament, as the charters, ancient law, and previous statutes were. They also required a less formal mode of authentication than statutes. Without a formal engrossment, they could be taken by the council as the basis for royal writs, charters, or letters patent, by which they were published and their enforcement secured. As time went on, the distinction between the subject matter of statutes and of ordinances became less marked. The difference came to be regarded more as a difference of form, though the real distinction did not disappear until the fifteenth century. Thus, in case of an enactment such as the ordinance concerning apparel in the thirty-seventh regnal year of Edward III, where the subject was new, there might be a question whether this was fundamental or not, and the Parliament was asked whether it preferred the form of a statute or of an ordinance. S'il voulait avoir les choses issantes, accordé mi par voie, de ordinance ou de statut. They answered that they preferred the form of an ordinance, in order that it might be changed if necessary at the next Parliament. In the fifteenth century the distinction seems to be largely disregarded, as temporary acts are termed indifferently statutes or ordinances. In the half-century embraced by the reign of Edward III, however, when the original distinction is still clearly preserved, there seems no doubt that a perfectly well understood difference existed between a statute perpetuellement à durée and an ordinance pour un temps. It would hardly have been necessary to enlarge so much on this point, but for the evident confusion existing even in the minds of the latest writers on this important subject. Thus Sir William Anson says, the ordinance, quote, is an act of the king or of the king in council. It is temporary and is revocable by the king or the king in council. The statute is the act of the crown, lords and commons. It is engrossed on the statute roll. It is meant to be a permanent addition to the law of the land. It can only be revoked by the same body that made it, and in the same form. End quote. He proceeds to prove this by an entry from the roll of 1340, which is certainly the clearest statement of the real difference to be found in the rolls of Parliament. But an examination of it shows and this is corroborated by dozens of other instances, that the ordinances in this case, as well as the statutes, were assented to by king, lords, and commons. It proves his statement that the statutes were permanent law and the ordinances temporary provisions. It expressly contradicts his other assertion that an ordinance is necessarily quote, an act of the king or of the king in council in distinction from a statute to which the Commons' assent must be added. It is said in the excellent preface to Roughhead's edition of the Statutes that the real difference between the subject matter proper to a statute and to an ordinance lies in the distinction between ancient law and nouvelle loi, which is undoubtedly true, but I think hardly in the sense in which Roughhead meant it. He says many acts were not entered upon the statute roll, quote, for if the bill did not demand nouvelle loi, that is, if the provision required would stand with the laws in force, and did not tend to change or alter any statute then in being, in such case the law was complete by the royal assent on the Parliament roll, without any entry on the statute roll, and such bills were usually termed ordinances. End quote. But the term nouvelle loi, as used in the rolls themselves and in the yearbooks of the time, does not seem to mean new law so much as new enactment. Acts in affirmance are continually spoken of as nouvelle loi in distinction to the ancient law lying behind it. 
and while the rest of his statement seems to be completely supported by the rolls themselves this assertion and his inference based upon it seem to go too far end of section ten of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Magna Carta and the Common Law by Charles Howard McIlwain, Professor of History and Government, Harvard University. Part 4 one more point in regard to enactment seems in need of explanation before we are in position to form a true estimate of magna carta at this time and that is the legal necessity and the legal effect of the publication of statutes the sealing engrossing and publication are the outward marks of an early statute the procedure is so fully described in the introduction to the statutes of the realm that it need not be repeated here their publication however was so important a part of the authentication of statutes in early times that a statute is usually referred to before the middle of the fourteenth century as statutum editum in a certain parliament or year the theory of representation is found surprisingly early in england but so long as the composition of parliament was uncertain publication in the counties must have been of even greater importance than it was afterward it is probable that some doubt existed in this period as to the reality of the assent omnium utentium unless a statute had been actually proclaimed locally throughout the realm this probability is strengthened by the cases where the king who alone could give effect to an enactment saw fit temporarily to suspend its operation in the later middle ages there is considerable evidence of the existence of a suspending power on the part of the king notwithstanding the summary dismissal of it as pretended by the parliament in sixteen eighty nine it seems certain however that when the composition of parliament settled down into its final form such doubts if they existed were swept away by the full acceptance of the theory that the whole body of the people were constructively in parliament and therefore were bound by all its statutes on their mere enactment without publication though the publication was actually continued until the invention of printing made it no longer necessary this view was stated with vigour and clearness in the thirty-ninth regnal year of edward the third in the case of rex versus the bishop of chichester the prosecution was under the statute of provisors and sergeant cavendish counsel for the bishop set up as a part of his defence that this enactment was not binding because it had not been published in the counties he was answered by sir robert thorpe the chief justice quote, granting that proclamation was not made in the county nevertheless every one is considered to know what is done in parliament for so soon as parliament has concluded anything the law presumes that every person has notice of it for the parliament represents the body of all the realm wherefore it is not necessary to have proclamation where the statute took effect before End quote it now remains to apply these deductions to magna carta and to edward i's mandate requiring its enforcement by his judges as common law john's charter was in form a royal grant guaranteeing rights almost all of which had already existed by feudal custom or otherwise it was granted primarily to his tenants-in-chief and their homines it was a feudal rather than a national document and the grantees were probably then conceived to include none lower than vavasours but the reign of henry the third was from the point of view of the development of institutions almost a revolutionary epoch 
the loss of normandy and other influences brought about in this period a remarkable development in the idea of nationality which is reflected in the growth of the national assembly and in other respects this influence can be seen in magna carta in addition to the extension of john's articles on the forest into a new separate and more detailed charter magna carta itself was reissued three times with new clauses defining interpreting and enlarging some of the original articles of a permanent nature and omitting the parts obviously temporary in addition it was solemnly confirmed by an excommunication against all who should break or change it and it was confirmed by the statute of marlborough an examination of these documents and incidental inferences in other writings of this reign official and non-official leads to the conclusion that contemporary ideas of the nature of magna carta greatly changed during this period it was now seen that this was more than a carta libertatum it was a carta libertatis though originally granted only to feudal homines it was now applied to all liberi homines though conceded at first as by royal favour in this period it comes to be regarded as a solemn affirmance of fundamental rights guaranteed to all and approved by all for the year twelve twenty five the annals of dunstable in speaking of the reissue of magna carta in that year say that in the colloquium generale in london quote, post multas vero sententiarum revolutiones communiter placuit quod rex tam populo quam plebi libertates prius ab eo puero concessas iam maior factus indulcit the sentence of excommunication in twelve fifty three condemns all who shall violate infringe diminish or change the rights of the church the ancient and approved customs of the realm et praecipue libertates et liberas consuetudines quae in cartis communium libertatum et de foresta continentur Bracton calls the third reissue of Magna Carta Constitutio Libertatis, or Constitutio merely, and as we have seen, Magna Carta is referred to officially in the nineteenth regnal year of Edward I as Statutum de Runnymede. The author of the Mirror of Justices mentions it as La Constitution de la Chartre des Franchises. By 1297 it has become la grande chartre des franchises d'angleterre proclaimed pour le commun profit du peuple et du royaume or magna carta domini henrici condam regis angliae de libertatibus angliae though to pope clement v it is only concessiones warii et iniquae by the time the word statute has come to have a definite meaning we begin to find that term also applied to magna carta in the fifteenth regnal year of edward the third the commons strengthen one of their petitions by reference to quote, les points de la grande chartre faits par les nobles rois et ses progéniteurs et les grands du royaume sages et nobles à donc pierre de la terre et puis souvent confirmés de divers rois et puis multe des autres ordonnances et statuts faits pour profit du commun peuple en tendant les points de la dite chartre ensemblement ou les autres perpétuellement à durée sans être enfreint sinon par accord des assons des pierres de la terre et ce en plein parlement in fourteen thirty two the commons appeal to the statute of the great charter confirmed by divers other statutes thus it is clear that magna carta had come to be considered an enactment much in the original sense of a statute in affirmance of ancient law the quotation above from the roll of the fifteenth regnal year of edward the third brings this out clearly 
it also shows that magna carta was regarded as common law with its interpretations it is such statements as this that enable us to put magna carta in its true setting in the fourteenth century but there is another phrase in the same quotation from the roll of the fifteenth regnal year of edward the third a pui mult magna carta while much the same in character as other statutes in binding force is classed far above them while it is said they may be changed in parliament this statement does not include magna carta itself we shall see later that this distinction was constantly made magna carta had in fact from the time of henry the third been recognized as in some sense a law fundamental henry the third's reissue of twelve twenty five was the form considered final we have evidence of this as early as bracton's time in a quotation given above bracton says a writ is to be quashed si impetratum fuerit contra jus et regni consuetudinem et maxime contra cartam libertatis the author of the mirror in his fifth book de abusion begins with magna carta comme la loi de ce royaume fondée sur quarante points de la grande chartre des franchises soit désusée damnablement par les guilleurs de la loi et par un statut plus fait contrario à aucun de ces points he then proceeds to enumerate the default of the various articles of the charter implying that they are in affirmance of the law fondi sur droit though in some cases incomplete defectif but he has no doubt that they render invalid destruit any subsequent statute inconsistent with them and he declares what is said of this statute merton is to be understood of all statutes made after the first making of the great charter in the time of henry the third for it is not law that any one should be punished for a single deed by imprisonment or any other corporal punishment and in addition by a pecuniary punishment or ransom in the fourteenth regnal year of edward the first the sheriffs of london had been violating the article of magna carta guaranteeing judgment by peers Quote, et justicari dicunt quod dominus rex hoc nullo modo concedere secundum magnam cartam angliae sed est ultra regiam potestatem et contra omnem justitiam etc the so-called statute de talagio non concedendo provides that if against the ancient laws and liberties or against any article of magna carta any statute had been published by the king or his predecessors or any customs introduced such statutes and customs quote, vacua et nulla sint in perpetuum end quote. we have seen that the confirmation which was actually enacted at that time declared null not previous acts but jugement donné désormais the terms of the letters patent of confirmation in 1301 are very interesting there it is declared that quote, si que statuta furent contraria dictis cartis well alicui articulo in eistem cartis contento ea de communi concilio regni nostri modo debito emendentur well echiam ad nullentur the difference between this provision and that of the confirmation of 1297 as well as the possible relation of both to the provision in the so-called statute de talagio non concedendo is very significant by 1301 the normal way of obtaining the common council of the realm on the amendment or annulling of any law the modus debitus had certainly become an enactment by parliament an accord or judgment of parliament was le plus haut le plus solemn jugement de cette terre an award fait en la plus haute place en le royaume 
whether in dealing with magna carta parliament should act in its judicial capacity or in a legislative way by statute no more effective sanction could be devised in those days the confirmation of 1301 must be considered as an honest attempt to secure enforcement in the most effective manner known of the provisions of magna carta it would seem fair to say then that magna carta was considered a really fundamental law and that the confirmation of 1301 first authorized the manner of confirming it which was regularly followed until all confirmations ceased after this confirmation no additions were made to the charter and it became the custom to confirm it as a matter of course at the beginning of each parliament this is as near to a fundamental law as the conceptions of medieval englishmen could reach we should not expect to find more parliament was not content in the years following merely to confirm magna carta it occasionally declared in general terms that all inconsistent acts should be void the famous ordinances of thirteen twelve declared that any such acts soit tenu pour nul et tout autrement de fait in thirteen sixty eight in response to the commons petition the king promised that the charters should be observed and that any statute passed a contrary soit tenu pour nul the statutes of that year add these words to the usual confirmation in thirteen seventy six the commons complain of infringements of magna carta par sinistre interpretation d'aucun genre de loi and pray that it be observed notwithstanding any statute ordinance or charter to the contrary the same request was made in another parliament in the same year a similar one is found in thirteen seventy nine in the first regnal year of henry the fourth the commons petition for the repeal of a statute of the king's grandfather which they allege to be expressement fait en contre la tenure et fait de la grande chartre in thirteen ninety seven parliament declared the award of parliament against the dispensers void as against law right and reason and against magna carta in thirteen forty one the peers prayed that infringements of magna carta should be declared in parliament and par les pierres de la terre du mont redressé during the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries the practice continued of confirming magna carta as is proved by both the parliament and the statute roll but it would serve no purpose to refer to any of these numerous confirmations which are usually brief and stereotyped in form the regularity of the practice was recognized in thirteen eighty one in a petition of the commons praying since by the great charter it was ordained and affirmed communement en tous autres parlements that law be not denied or sold to any one that therefore fees be no longer taken by the chancellor for writs the confirmations of these years vary in the comprehensiveness of their statements but they almost invariably include magna carta the charter of the forest and former statutes in the fifteenth century the reference to these statutes but not to the charters is usually limited by the phrase a ni en rappelle sometimes the commons try to go further than a mere confirmation in thirteen forty one they petitioned that all the great officers of the realm be sworn to observe magna carta and the other laws and statutes that magna carta be publicly read and affirmed by oath and that penalties be inflicted on sheriffs or other ministers of the king who failed to enforce its observance in thirteen fifty four they petitioned for the reading of magna carta in thirteen seventy seven at the opening of the new reign the commons again asked that it be read in parliament and this was done it was read again in the parliament of thirteen eighty occasionally there is a demand that the charter be not merely read but officially interpreted in thirteen seventy seven this demand goes further 
the charter was not only to be read but it was to be declared point by point by the members of the continual council with the advice of the judges and sergeants or others if necessary the points so declared and amended were to be submitted to the lords and commons at the next parliament and then être encressé et affirmé pour estatut s'il sembla à eux qu'il soit à faire ayant regard de comment le roi est chargé à sa couronnement de tenir et garder la dite chartre en tous ses points the king in general terms promised that it be read and observed but ignored the request for interpretation if space permitted many instances might also be given of parliament's solicitude not merely for general confirmations of the charter but also for the observance of its specific provisions by the courts magna carta in the later middle ages is looked upon and treated as an enactment in affirmance of fundamental common law to be confirmed and observed as a part of that law but undoubtedly all other enactments of such law are regarded as pui mult the evolution of a constitutional law in america has generally been considered by british writers as without precedent in earlier english institutions such a view is hardly supported by a study of those institutions in the middle ages before the modern doctrine of the legislative sovereignty of parliament had taken definite form but it seems hardly possible completely to identify the fundamental law of medieval england with the usual modern forms of such a law in fact the content of that law of which magna carta is the best example was not entirely nor mainly constitutional rigid constitutions are a development of modern times to us it seems natural to place the framework of government in a class by itself we think of it alone as the fundamental law we go so far as to make of fundamental and constitutional practically equivalent terms this was not done in medieval england for the englishman of that day the fundamental law did indeed include the law of the crown but it included also the law of the realm and the second bulked larger than the first even what we might be tempted to call the law of the constitution was in those days what it still remains in england and even in great measure in the united states notwithstanding our written constitutions quote, little else than a generalization of the rights which the courts secure to individuals end quote though this be true an added interest is undoubtedly given to a study of the earlier manifestations of the idea of a law fundamental by the growing tendency in certain quarters in england arising out of the recent and almost revolutionary constitutional changes to demand that the structure of the state be placed above and beyond the possibility of change by the ordinary law-making organ End of section 11. Section 12 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Influence of the Magna Carta on American Constitutional Development by H. D. Hazeltine. Part 1. For seven centuries, Magna Carta has exerted a powerful influence upon constitutional and legal development. During the first four centuries after 1215, this influence was confined to England and the British Isles. With the growth of the British Empire during the last three hundred years, the principles of the Charter have spread to many of the political communities which have derived their constitutional and legal systems from England and which have owed in the past, or which still owe, allegiance to the mother country. The earliest, and perhaps the most important phase of this imperial history of Magna Carta, 
is its effect upon the constitutions and laws of the american colonies and of the federal union that was established after their war of independence in this story of the charter's influence upon american constitutional development three separate periods should be distinguished the colonial period which began with the granting of the first virginia charter by james i in sixteen o six and which ended about seventeen sixty was followed by the epoch of the american revolution with the treaty of paris in seventeen eighty three in which great britain acknowledged her former colonies to be free sovereign and independent states the present period of national existence had its definite beginnings each one of these periods is closely related to earlier events and ideas in the history of england and of the colonies together the three periods constitute american constitutional and legal evolution as a whole but this american evolution is one that rests for its foundation upon the long centuries of english development that preceded its own beginnings and that bears also in a marked degree the imprint of constitutional and legal changes in england during the period of colonization and even in later times indeed rightly to understand the constitutional and legal history of the colonies and of the united states of america in each period of which magna carta plays a role we should not forget that the englishmen who settled in america in the seventeenth century inherited all the preceding ages of english history to them belonged magna carta and the common law to them belonged the institutions and ideas that were inextricably bound up with magna carta and the common law to them belonged the legal traditions of the tudor age the age that immediately preceded the period of colonization the colonies did not fail to enter upon their inheritance and the result has been that colonial institutions and principles both of public and of private law retained much of the tudor and the pre-tudor tradition and that even today american institutions and principles bear the impress of its influence for england the seventeenth century was the first great age of the empire the age of commercial and colonial expansion not only in the west but in the east and it was the age also of the momentous struggle at home between the crown and parliament between the claims of royal prerogative and of parliamentary supremacy in america the century was preeminently the age of settlement and the growth of chartered colonies either of proprietary or corporate character this american development constituting one phase of english expansion and it was likewise the age in which the results of constitutional conflict in england exerted their first influences upon the development of the colonial institutions and of colonial legal and political ideas the growth of the colonies in america meant from the very beginning the extension of english institutions and laws to these little englands across the sea to their birthright of the english traditions of the sixteenth and earlier centuries was now added the gift of the constitutional and legal principles established in seventeenth-century england the england of stuart kings of commonwealth and protectorate of revolution for the changes in the public and private law of england during the century directly and vitally affected constitutional and legal growth in the colonies as the common law emerged at the end of the century enriched by judicial decisions and constitutional enactments the fundamental principles which they embodied were added to the common law heritage of englishmen in the colonies thus like magna carta itself the great constitutional documents of the seventeenth century such as the petition of right the habeas corpus act and the bill of rights have a colonial as well as a purely english history to these statutes as to magna carta the colonists turned as the documentary evidence of the fundamental rights and liberties of all englishmen whether they resided in the homeland or in the english communities of america perhaps the most important feature of american history before the revolutionary epoch 
was the gradual transition from chartered colonies to royal provinces and owing to british colonial and commercial policy of the times the tightening of imperial control through crown and parliamentary agencies although the constitutional changes in england during the eighteenth century including the further development of parliamentary sovereignty vitally affected the relationship between the colonies and the home country yet they failed to influence in any marked degree purely colonial constitutional development footnote lowell government of england volume two page four seventy two expresses this forcibly when he says american institutions are still in some respects singularly like those of england at the death of queen anne thereafter the changes in the british constitution found no echo on the other side of the atlantic largely no doubt because taking the form of custom not of statute they were not readily observed End footnote. from the early eighteenth century down to the present day american institutions have developed in the main along their own lines largely upon the basis of english development in the seventeenth and earlier centuries colonial development in the seventeenth century and american political thought and constructive statesmanship of the eighteenth nineteenth and twentieth centuries this striking divergence of american from english institutions dating from the early eighteenth century is in sharp contrast with the history of the law throughout the eighteenth century though perhaps less in the period of the revolution english common law continued to influence the development of colonial legislation and judicial decisions and even today the american system of common law and equity is in its fundamental characteristics the same as that of england so too in certain leading features of constitutional law as distinct from constitutional institutions such as the american system of three coordinate departments of government and the power of the judicature to declare an act of the legislature null and void because in conflict with the written constitution we see a striking persistence of english principles rights and liberties of englishmen embodied in magna carta the bill of rights and other constitutional documents became vital features of colonial constitutional law and have continued throughout the revolutionary and national epochs to the present day to be essential elements of american constitutional law the story of the influence of magna carta on american constitutional development is but one phase of the whole history of english institutions and law in america and this in turn is but one chapter in the history of a broader a further reaching development the extension of english laws and of english common and statutory law to the many political communities that have formed or still form parts of the british empire in studying magna carta in america we are concerned therefore with one feature and one only of this whole vast process but just as the influence of magna carta in england itself cannot be understood apart from the long history of the ever-changing body of rules and principles that go to make up the system of english common law of which the provisions of magna carta form only a part so too an understanding of the influence of magna carta in america can only be reached by considering this great legal document as but one of the many sources of english common law in its american environment in the present paper certain main features of the american development throughout its three periods will be suggested but without any attempt at exhaustive consideration part one one from the very beginning the colonists claimed that they were entitled as englishmen to the law of englishmen the common law as a great corpus juris based on the decisions of the courts and on the statutory enactments of parliament a body of the rules of private and public law which secured to englishmen their rights as private individuals in their relations one with another and also their rights and liberties as subjects of the crown 
it was this common law of england which the various colonies acting through their executive legislature and judicature adopted or received either partially or wholly as the law adapted to the needs of english communities in america along with the english law thus received by the colonists there grew up in the various american communities new rules and principles based on colonial customs the reformative skill of colonial lawmakers and in the puritan colonies of new england natural or divine law footnote in claiming the common law as their own the colonists were but applying coke's doctrine that the law and custom of england is the inheritance of the subject End footnote. if for the moment we view the whole system of english common law as partly public and partly private law even though english legal thought does not draw a sharp distinction between the two we may the more easily grasp the early attitude of the colonists towards the law of the homeland Reinch has expressed this attitude in these words english colonists in their general ideas of justice and right brought with them the fruits of the struggle for law in england most of the colonies made their earliest appeal to the common law in its character as a monument of english liberty that is considering more its public than its private law elements footnote hallam constitutional history of england volume three nineteen o six page three thirty eight in quitting the soil of england to settle new colonies englishmen never renounced her freedom such being the noble principle of english colonization circumstances favored the early development of colonial liberties End footnote. or in channing's phrase so far as the english common law protected them from the english government and from royal officials they looked upon it as their birthright so far as it interfered with their development it was to be disregarded if we bear this fact in mind we shall see more clearly that english constitutional statutes and cases were as their birthright of fundamental importance to the english colonists of america in their struggles with colonial and imperial authorities in the earlier stuart reigns magna carta as the greatest of all english statutes of liberty was regarded by the colonists as a bulwark of their rights as englishmen as the seventeenth century advanced the great constitutional struggles in england were reflected in the colonies and the petition of right the habeas corpus act the bill of rights and the act of settlement seventeen o one took their place beside magna carta in the minds of the colonists as statutory guarantees of the rights of englishmen both at home and away from home in respect of life liberty and property it is for this reason that we must view magna carta in its history in the colonies as only part though a most valuable part of the whole body of english constitutional law the common law in its character of public rather than private law and the common law as it is found in constitutional cases and constitutional statutes as englishmen owing allegiance to the crown and settling upon land claimed by england as under its sovereignty the colonists were it would seem entitled to the rights of englishmen embodied in magna carta and other sources of common law without further sanction of royal charter or colonial legislation but not only did royal charters to the colonists secure these constitutional rights they were incorporated also in colonial legislation two the granting of the first virginia charter by james i in 1606 marks the real beginning of english settlement in america and the opening of a new era in the history of colonization in general in this famous document the final form of which was in part the work of coke himself the king not only claimed the right to colonize a large portion of the territory of the new world but he asserted the principle that english colonists in this territory were to enjoy the same constitutional rights possessed by englishmen in the homeland this principle had been embodied in the elizabethan patents to gilbert and raleigh but the colonizing experiments of these adventurers under the queen's authority 
had produced no permanent results, and it was not until after James's patent to the Virginia Company that the principle first took root in American soil. Also, we do, reads James's charter, for us, our heirs and successors, declare by these presents that all and every persons being our subjects, which shall dwell and inhabit within every or any of the several colonies and plantations, and every one of their children, which shall happen to be born within any of the limits and precincts of the said several colonies and plantations, shall have and enjoy all liberties, franchises, and immunities within any of our other dominions, to all intents and purposes as if they had been abiding and born within this our realm of England, or any other of our said dominions. It was this principle, repeated in many later charters to the American colonies, which gave to English colonization one of its most distinctive characteristics. In the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, the colonists of other countries were not privileged to enjoy the constitutional guarantees of the inhabitants of the colonizing states themselves. On the contrary, colonists were viewed as persons outside the constitutional and legal system of the home country itself. It may well be questioned, as already suggested, whether the solemn declaration of the principle by English sovereigns was essential to the valid extension of English laws and constitutional privileges to the colonists. Rather, it is true to say that the colonists who settled on territory claimed by England, and who recognized their allegiance to the English crown, carried with them, whether the king willed it or not, so much of the English constitutional and legal system as was applicable to their situation. The government of Plymouth rested throughout its history upon the Mayflower Compact, not upon royal charter. Penn's patent as proprietor in 1681, unlike the other colonial charters, contained no provision to the effect that the inhabitants of the colony should be deemed subjects of the crown, and as such entitled to all the liberties and immunities of Englishmen. But as the territory of the colony was claimed by England, and as the allegiance to the crown was reserved, it would seem clear that the colonists were subjects, and as such entitled to all the privileges of Englishmen. This, at any rate, was the opinion of the great Chalmers in regard to Penn's patent. But, whatever view we may hold upon this question, a solemn enunciation of the principle in royal charters furnished a solid documentary basis for the claim of the colonists that they possessed the rights of Englishmen. Royal charters were held by the colonists to be solemn compacts between the king and themselves, and these solemn compacts constituted the earliest written constitutions of the colonies. Embodied as they were in these fundamental instruments of government, their constitutional rights as Englishmen seemed to the colonists unassailable. Time and time again, in their struggles with colonial and imperial authorities, the colonists relied upon their charters as the documentary evidence, the written title of rights secured to them, as to all Englishmen, by Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and the general principles of the common law. The declaration of the royal charters thus acted as a powerful factor in the spread throughout the colonies of English constitutional principles, including the rights and liberties secured by Magna Carta and its confirmations. 3. There is another feature of the royal charters which deserves attention. Their expressed declaration that the colonies may legislate for themselves, so long as the laws thus enacted conform to the English legal system. Thus, by way of example, the Massachusetts Charter of 1691 explicitly says, and we do further grant to the said governor and the great and general court full power and authority from time to time to make all manner of wholesome and reasonable orders, laws, statutes, and ordinances, directions and instructions, either with penalties or without, so as the same be not repugnant or contrary to the laws of this our realm of England, as they shall judge to be for the good and welfare of our said province. 
this grant of legislative power to the colonies produced important results not the least of which was the growth of a body of colonial statutory law adapted to the needs of the new english communities across the sea both in form and in substance much of this written law of the colonies was a reenactment of the common and statutory law of england and thus conformed to english legal traditions and to the requirements of the charters on the other hand the colonial legislatures introduced into their laws and codes many new features especially adapted to local conditions some of these features were archaic in character while others in their spirit of reform were actually in advance of contemporary law in the mother country in the puritan colonies of new england the law of god gave a peculiar color to the whole legal system while in all the colonies local customary law moulded in important respects the decisions of the courts and the colonial legislation not all the resources of imperial control possessed by the crown and parliament could keep the growing american communities with their novel conditions and special needs within the strict confines of the legal system of the mother country incorporated in this statutory law of the colonies were many principles of english constitutional law derived from the decisions of english courts and from the great charters and statutes of english liberty of special interest to us in our present study is the embodiment of various rights and liberties of magna carta in the colonial written law even in the puritan colonies of new england which in theory based their earlier legal system upon the word of god and which in fact of all the colonies departed furthest from english judicial models we find important features of magna carta placed in colonial legislative enactments indeed in these and other vital respects english common law formed a greater element in puritan law than the puritans themselves at the time suspected and then even present-day students of the system attracted by the frequent citation of scripture in decisions and statutes are oftentimes aware the laws of all the colonies deserve a long and detailed study with special reference to their incorporation of the provisions of magna carta but for our present purpose it must suffice to draw attention to illustrative instances of this process in early massachusetts the struggle for written laws as opposed to the exercise of wide discretionary powers on the part of the executive and judicature finally resulted in the enactment of the famous body of liberties in the discussions that preceded this legislation john winthrop had argued in his tract on arbitrary government that it was unwise to place too great a restraint upon judges who should decide cases in accordance with divine justice as revealed in the bible still even winthrop admitted that for the purpose of restricting capital punishment and of making men's estates more secure against heavy fines it would be well to have a general law like magna carta the general position of the colonists was that their liberties were not safe from arbitrary power because these liberties were not embodied in positive law winthrop in his history of new england says the deputies having conceived great danger to our state in regard that our magistrates for want of positive law in many cases might proceed according to their discretion it was agreed that some men should be appointed to frame a body of grounds of law in resemblance to a magna carta which being allowed by some of the ministers and the general court should be received for fundamental laws accordingly at the general court twenty fifth may sixteen thirty six it was ordered that a body of laws agreeable to the word of god to be the fundamentals of this commonwealth should be drawn up and submitted to the general court as a result of this action the body of liberties finally became the law of the colony in sixteen forty one although the word of god figures prominently in this code the lawmakers seem also to have followed in some sections the model of magna carta and of the english common law thus for example in its first section 
the body of liberties echoes the spirit of chapter thirty nine of magna carta by declaring that no man's life shall be taken away no man's honor or good name shall be stained no man's person shall be arrested restrained banished dismembered nor any ways punished no man shall be deprived of his wife or children no man's goods or estate shall be taken away from him nor any way indamaged under color of law or countenance of authority unless it be by virtue or equity of some express law of the country warranting the same established by a general court and sufficiently published or in case of the defect of a law in any particular case by the word of god and in capital cases or in cases concerning dismembering or banishment according to that word to be judged by the general court in sixteen forty six there arose an important controversy as to the constitutional guarantees of the body of liberties and other massachusetts laws which involved a careful examination of the provisions of magna carta by the colonists certain residents of the colony led by robert child discontented largely by reason of the religious policy of the colonial authorities addressed the general court declaring that a settled government in accordance with the laws of england did not appear to them to have been established and that they did not feel secure in the enjoyment of their lives liberties and estates as free-born english subjects they petitioned therefore for the establishment of the wholesome laws of england that they might thus be admitted to the liberties to which all free englishmen were accustomed both at home and in the colonies in their reply to the petitioners the general court compared at length the provisions of the body of liberties with those of magna carta and the principles of the common law the court maintained that this comparison demonstrated the fact that english and colonial laws were in agreement in all fundamental particulars and that indeed civil liberty in massachusetts under the body of liberties was as well protected as it was in england under magna carta and the common law the general court also sent in sixteen forty six an address to the long parliament in which it was declared that the government of the colony was framed in accordance with the colonial charter and the fundamental and common laws of england and conceived according to the same taking the words of eternal truth and righteousness along with them as that rule by which all kingdoms and jurisdictions must render account of every act and administration in the last day they then tried to prove the truth of their statement by setting forth in parallel columns the fundamental and common laws of england and the laws of the colony in this comparison magna carta was viewed by the general court as the chief embodiment of english common law connecticut following the example of massachusetts early enacted a law embodying fundamental rights and liberties and trial by jury together with other english institutions and practices became part of the colonial system so too in sixteen forty seven rhode island adopted a code of civil and criminal laws based in part upon english laws that were thought adapted to the needs of the colony prefixed to these laws was a reaffirmation of chapter thirty nine of magna carta prohibiting arbitrary arrests and punishments and a declaration that by law of the land lex terre was meant the law enacted by the general assembly of the colony itself not the law of england unless adopted by the assembly as colonial law the new york charter of liberties of sixteen eighty three was the first statute enacted by the colonial legislature after the english conquest of dutch new netherlands this statute framed expressly for the colony by the duke of york secures a jury trial to all inhabitants of the colony and contains many of the provisions of magna carta the petition of right and the habeas corpus act although the charter of liberties never received the royal assent because it savoured too strongly of popular freedom and seemed to run counter to the crown's prerogative and the legislative supremacy of parliament 
yet the colonists always claimed that it was operative in protection of their constitutional liberties the colonial assembly of maryland passed a bill in 1638 to recognize magna carta as a part of the law of the province the act expressly declared that the inhabitants shall have all their rights and liberties according to the great charter of england the act was however disallowed by the king because the attorney general expressed himself as uncertain how far the enactment thereof will be agreeable to the constitution of this colony or consistent with the royal prerogative in seventeen twelve the colonial legislature of south carolina by special act adopted the english common law as a rule of adjudicature and also one hundred and twenty-six english statutes selected by chief justice trott as applicable to colonial conditions included among the english statutes thus put in force by the colonial legislature were magna carta and the other great english statutes which declared the rights and liberties of the subject the similar adoption of english common law and statutes was effected by the legislature of north carolina in seventeen fifteen a striking illustration of the attention paid to magna carta by colonial lawmakers is found in the history of virginia in the middle of the seventeenth century a sharp controversy arose in this colony as elsewhere in america in regard to lawyers in seventeen fifty six certain colonial acts hostile to lawyers were repealed but in the following year a proposition for the ejection of lawyers was carried thereupon a new act was passed by the legislature forbidding any person to plead or give advice in any judicial proceedings for reward the governor and council did not look with favor on this act but they promised to give their assent to the measure so far as it shall be agreeable to magna carta an examination of the terms of magna carta was then made by a committee who reported that they failed to discover in them any prohibition of the colonial legislation in question these and other colonial acts and codes which might be instanced prove that the colonial legislatures representing in general the wishes of the colonists as opposed to those of royal officials embodied principles of english common law including provisions of magna carta the bill of rights and other great constitutional statutes in the written law of englishmen within the oversea provinces in general colonial legislation which is an important feature of the working of early american self-government was subjected to imperial control by reason of the requirement that colonial acts must receive the assent of the crown acting through the royal governors and the executive authorities in england that the royal veto which remained in full vigor in the relations of the crown to the colonies long after its disuse in respect to acts of the english parliament was employed to safeguard the interests of the royal prerogative is strikingly illustrated by the history of colonial acts which embodied magna carta and other english legal guarantees of the rights and liberties of the subject attention has already been drawn to the fact that the maryland act of sixteen thirty eight enacting magna carta was disallowed by the crown because it might be inconsistent with the royal prerogative and that the new york charter of liberties of sixteen eighty three embodying magna carta the petition of right and the habeas corpus act never received the royal assent similarly sir john somers by reason of the fear that it might prejudice the royal prerogative and the legislative supremacy of parliament advised the disallowance of the massachusetts habeas corpus act on the ground that the right to that writ had never been conferred on the colonists by a king of england and that the guarantee of a speedy trial in magna carta was inapplicable to the status of colonists various other acts of colonial legislatures which merely repeated provisions of magna carta were likewise vetoed by the crown footnote bancroft in his history of the colonization of the united states remarks 
if the declaratory acts by which every one of the colonies asserted their right to the privileges of magna carta to the feudal liberty of taxation except with their own consent were always disallowed by the crown it was done silently and the strife on the power of parliament to tax the colonies was certainly adjourned End footnote. it is clear that the exercise of the royal veto which always in theory and many times in practice acted as a wholesome restraint upon unwise colonial legislation and served to keep the law of the colonies in general harmony with english law worked injustice to the colonists and sought to deprive them of their rightful privileges and liberties as english subjects including the guarantees of magna carta and other english constitutional statutes the exercise of the royal veto particularly when it encroached upon their rights and liberties as englishmen was irritating to the colonists but proved in most if not all cases ineffective by disregarding the royal veto by enacting new measures essentially like the ones vetoed and by other similar devices the colonists practically nullified the royal prerogative of disallowance footnote the disregard of the royal veto by the colonists is an excellent illustration of the way in which englishmen in america following the example of their kinfolk at home were acquiring a constitution by robbing the crown of its prerogatives End footnote. in effect therefore much of the colonial legislation which incorporated the principles of magna carta and other constitutional features of the common law remained in force in the colonies indeed the whole history of magna carta and english constitutional liberties as incorporated in the acts and state papers of the later colonial period the revolutionary epoch and the early national era proves the persistence of the legal guarantees of the english constitution in america for the maintenance of what they viewed as the rights of all englishmen the colonists were not only willing to face the crown and parliament in constitutional struggles but also in armed conflict when the time of their independence came the people still insisted as we shall see later on the incorporation of their fundamental rights and privileges in the federal and state constitutions the parts of these instruments containing the declaration of rights being known as bills of rights four it is worth noting that magna carta became a generic term which included various documents of special constitutional significance attention has already been drawn to the fact that the massachusetts bill of liberties of sixteen forty one was framed in winthrop's words in resemblance to a magna carta the act of the new york legislature of sixteen eighty three which was known as the charter of liberties and privileges and the pennsylvania charter of privileges which was the fundamental law of the province from seventeen o one to seventeen seventy six and the most famous of all colonial constitutions may also perhaps be reckoned in this category the instructions issued by the virginia company in sixteen eighteen to sir george yardley as governor are known to virginian writers as the great charter and the term is said to be found also in some of the land grants but while this document was undoubtedly of great importance in the constitutional development of the colony it is perhaps going somewhat too far to liken it to a magna carta the use of the term great charter is instructive however as showing the influence of magna carta upon legal terminology another illustration may be taken from the history of the carolinas in sixteen sixty eight the proprietors of northern carolina authorized the governor to grant land on the same terms and conditions as those that prevailed in virginia the colonists always referred to the instrument containing this authorization as the great deed of grant and regarded it as a species of magna carta a point of even greater importance for our present purpose is that constitutional documents granted by colonial proprietors sometimes contain the clauses of magna carta itself thus for instance in the constitutions granted by the proprietors of new jersey and pennsylvania in the latter part of the seventeenth century 
careful provision is made for the protection of personal liberty and of property and the familiar phrases of magna carta reappear footnote as william penn seems to have had a hand in the framing of all these documents which embody the phrases of magna carta it is instructive to observe that in sixteen seventy when he was indicted in an english court for being present at an unlawful and tumultuous assembly in gracechurch street and there addressing the people in contempt of the king and of his law and against his peace penn claimed for himself the rights of englishmen as set forth in magna carta and its confirmations penn's case may be studied in the sixth volume of howell's state trials End footnote. as a result of the constitutional struggles in england during the seventeenth century the petition of right and the bill of rights similarly served as models for colonial constitutional documents while after the american revolution the bill of rights in which fundamental civil rights and liberties are declared takes its place as already observed as an established feature of the constitutions of the federal and state governments thus the very names of magna carta and the bill of rights were transmitted to america through the influence of the english constitution and terminology in this case as so often in the history of institutions and laws masked no mere shadow but the very flesh and blood of living rights five hitherto we have considered the embodiment of the principles of magna carta in the written law of the colonies in royal charters colonial laws and codes and colonial documents of constitutional significance a further question suggests itself in regard to the unwritten law of the colonies were the provisions of magna carta incorporated in case law in a massachusetts case of sixteen eighty seven the defendant pleaded that magna carta and the statute law secure the subject's properties and estates to this one of the judges replied the rest of the court by silence assenting we must not think the laws of england follow us to the ends of the earth but such a judicial utterance is characteristic of the general attitude of massachusetts and of the other puritan colonies their legal system avowedly based on the law of god contained many english features but only in case they had been expressly adopted by the colonial authorities were they viewed as binding it was but natural therefore for the massachusetts judges to declare that they were not bound by magna carta itself which as a complete document had never been adopted by the colony but through the body of liberties and possibly other colonial acts certain provisions of magna carta were taken up into massachusetts law in general we may say that principles of magna carta and the common law actually adopted by the legislatures of the colonies as their own law undoubtedly bound the colonial courts unless such enactments had been effectively vetoed by the crown and in this connection it should not be forgotten as we have already observed that the veto of the crown often proved of no avail in checking the growth of colonial statutory law even though that law seemed to the crown to be infringing upon its prerogative in colonies where magna carta was adopted as a complete instrument and where the royal veto if it was applied proved ineffectual it would seem that the courts must surely have applied its provisions in the cases that came before them it has been impossible to examine the court records many of them still in manuscript from this point of view but it may be supposed that their careful study would disclose many cases where the courts applied the colonial magna carta if one may be allowed the term just as they applied in general the principles of the colonial common law it may well turn out on further research that in at least four distinct ways the courts embodied the principles of magna carta in colonial case law first in cases interpreting and applying colonial legislation such as the massachusetts body of liberties the rhode island code of sixteen forty seven and the new york charter of liberties of sixteen eighty three which contained certain provisions of magna carta 
secondly in cases interpreting and applying colonial acts which adopted the whole text of magna carta thirdly in cases decided under colonial acts which adopted the whole of the english common law as the rule of colonial adjudicature fourthly and in general in decisions of the many courts that were engaged together with other institutions of the colonies in adopting and adapting either consciously or unconsciously such portions of the english law as best suited the legal requirements of the colonial communities this view that colonial case law will be found on examination to embody principles of magna carta is strengthened by the well-known fact that in judicial proceedings of the period parties frequently claimed the rights of every free-born english subject six there is abundant evidence that in the political and constitutional controversy of the colonial period the rights of the colonists as englishmen played a vitally important part in these disputes magna carta and other english statutory guarantees of the subject were relied upon as the source of political privilege and civil right an illustration of this is to be found in the dyer affair in new york during the governorship of edmund andros complaints as to the administration of andros and even suggestions that new york officials had been guilty of peculation and extravagance resulted in the duke of york's summons to andros in 1680 to return to england for the purpose of rendering an account of his doings before his departure from the colony andros had neglected to renew the customs duties learning that the duties had thus legally expired colonial merchants declined to pay the imposts which the duke's collector william dyer continued to levy having seized a vessel and her cargo dyer was successfully sued by the owner for unlawfully detaining property which was not his own and he was also indicted for high treason the indictment charging him with having contrived innovations in government and the subversion and change of the known ancient and fundamental laws of the realm of england contrary to the great charter of liberties contrary to the petition of right and contrary to other statutes in these cases made and provided on appealing his case to england dyer was successful there and andros also exculpated himself despite all this however the colonists still refused to pay the duties levied on the authority of james channing in his history of the united states has drawn attention to the fact that this movement was the first colonial rebellion against taxation from england and that the words of dyer's indictment carry one backward to the times of the puritan rebellion in england and forward to the days of otis henry and dickinson in america looked at from the point of view of the rights of englishmen away from home the dyer case is a striking instance of the colonists dependence upon magna carta as the bulwark of their liberties a further illustration may be taken from the history of massachusetts in this as in other colonies questions in regard to the governor's salary loom large in the political controversy of the times the assembly of massachusetts insisted on making temporary salary grants thinking by this means to secure a real control over the governor's actions the governor's contention on the other hand was that permanent provision should be made for his salary thus ensuring his free judgment in matters of legislation on the analogy of english provision for the crown by a permanent civil list in one of governor burnett's messages to the assembly in seventeen twenty eight in regard to the salary question he drew their attention to the provision in the colonial charter that they were to pass wholesome and reasonable laws which were not harmful to the english constitution the members of the assembly caught up this reference to the charter and contended that the governor himself had thus admitted that they possessed the rights of englishmen in support of their contention they then proceeded to trace their rights as englishmen not only to the english legislation of the stuart and tudor periods but also to the english constitution in the time of edward i and henry the third and even to magna carta itself 
the exciting events that followed did not result in a settlement of the controversy in burnett's time and only under his successor belcher was it finally arranged that the governor with the consent of the english government should receive an annual grant to be voted at the beginning and not at the end of the sessions of the assembly the course of this controversy thus forms an interesting chapter in the history of magna carta as the foundation of colonial rights in opposition to the claims of the crown and of royal governors seven the importation from england as well as the colonial publication of english statutes and documents law reports and juristic treatises diffused especially in the eighteenth century a knowledge of the common and statutory law and thus acted as a very considerable factor in the extension of its principles including the principles of magna carta and the english constitution throughout the colonies footnote nearly all the law books of the colonists were imported from england only thirty-three were printed in america before seventeen seventy six End footnote. prominent among the books in the hands of the colonists were those dealing with the rights and liberties of englishmen thus among the first seven books printed in the colonies were halls's the englishman's rights sixteen ninety three pettit's lex parliamentaria seventeen sixteen Summers's the security of englishmen's lives seventeen twenty and the fifth edition of henry Kerr's english liberties or the free-born subjects inheritance seventeen twenty one the last of which contained magna carta the petition of right the habeas corpus act and various other english statutes as well as some of the leading english constitutional decisions and a general account of the liberties of the subject trial by jury and other constitutional matters both in public and in private libraries were to be found copies of yearbooks english reports magna carta and collections of english statutes and the classics of english literature such as the works of glanville britton fortescue prynne bacon selden cook plowden hale and blackstone in this way the printed text of magna carta and the commentaries of the english jurists upon that text played their own special part in the legal education of the colonists and thus in their adherence to the charter's principles of constitutional liberty one or two interesting facts will illuminate this textual power thus in sixteen forty seven the governor and assistants of massachusetts ordered the importation of two copies each of cook on magna carta and various other books of english law to the end that we may have better light for making and proceeding about laws as early as sixteen eighty seven william penn published at philadelphia an edition of magna carta the confirmation of the charters and the so-called statute de talagio non condescendo accompanied by an address to the reader wherein the colonists were exhorted not to give away anything of liberty and property that at present they do enjoy but take up the good example of our ancestors and understand that it is easy to part with or give away great privileges but hard to be gained if once lost as a silent teacher of english notions of liberty not only in massachusetts and pennsylvania but in the other colonies as well the printed text of the charter exerted its own unique influence upon the legal and political ideas and the actual institutions of the americans eight throughout the colonies there existed a deep distrust of the legal profession most of the colonial judges were laymen and there was much colonial legislation hostile to lawyers as a class in the course of the eighteenth century however the legal profession many of its members trained in the english inns of court and in american colleges began to take a more prominent part in colonial affairs during the revolutionary epoch lawyers played a leading role in political and constitutional controversy while in the early days of independence when the federal and state constitutions were drafted and adopted 
and the laws and institutions of the youthful republic were moulded to fit the new conditions some of the foremost statesmen and judges were lawyers of high distinction the rise of a legal profession introduced a new and powerful factor in the growth of american legal ideas learned in the principles of english common law and in english constitutional ideas and practices the early american lawyers exerted a professional and legal influence upon american development and their share in the work of incorporating the principles of magna carta in colonial and revolutionary documents and in the constitutions of the federal era must have been considerable without pursuing this special topic further in the present connection we may yet note in a general way the services of the early american lawyers in the cause of the rights and liberties of the people warren in his history of the american bar expresses the main point in these words the influence on the american bar of these english-bred lawyers was most potent the training which they received in the inns confined almost exclusively to the common law based as it was on historical precedent and customary law the habits which they formed there of solving all legal questions by the standards of english liberties and of the rights of the english subject proved of immense value to them when they became later as so many did become leaders of the american revolution again in another place warren remarks the services rendered by the legal profession in the defense and maintenance of the people's rights and liberties from the middle of the eighteenth century to the adoption of the constitution had been well recognized by the people in making a choice of their representatives for of the fifty-six signers of the declaration of independence twenty-five were lawyers and of the fifty-five members of the federal constitutional convention thirty-one were lawyers of whom four had studied in the inner temple and one at oxford under blackstone in the first congress ten of the twenty-nine senators and seventeen of the sixty-five representatives were lawyers End of section 12of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Influence of Magna Carta on American Constitutional Development by H. D. Hazeltine. Parts 2, 3, and 4. Part two. By the close of the colonial period, principles of Magna Carta, adapted to social and political conditions in the American communities, had become firmly embedded in their systems of law and government. In the revolutionary epoch, extending from 1760 to 1783, these principles, as part of the whole body of English constitutional law claimed by the colonists as English subjects, were to enter upon a new phase of their American history. The years that immediately preceded the outbreak of war in 1775 and the Declaration of Independence in 1776 were characterized by a momentous controversy between the colonies and the mother country over constitutional principles. The doctrine that the colonists had all the rights of Englishmen had more and more strenuously asserted itself throughout the eighteenth century. At last the claims of the colonists were largely focused in the demand that there should be no taxation without representation, a principle which they held to be based on firm English foundations. As the controversy increased in intensity, the colonists appealed less to the guarantees of the royal charters and more and more to the principles of the common law especially the principles contained in magna carta the bill of rights and other documents of english liberty in support of the views which they so strenuously asserted in opposition to the position taken up by crown and parliament in the ten years just before the war there was indeed a marked tendency 
evidenced by all the great state papers such as the massachusetts circular letter of seventeen sixty eight the virginia resolutions of seventeen sixty nine the declaration and resolves of the first continental congress of seventeen seventy four the declaration of the causes and necessity of taking up arms seventeen seventy five and the declaration of independence seventeen seventy six itself to base colonial rights on political and legal fundamentals to be found in the law of nature and the english constitution the colonists looked upon the english constitution as their own and revered it as the embodiment of their rights the common rights of englishmen formed the shield behind which they resisted what they held to be attempts upon their liberties when the war at last came it was fought out by the colonists in defense of what they held these rights to be rights won in england in the long struggle for the rule of law and embodied in the doctrines of common law especially in the principles of Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, and other English documents that visualized for the colonists their claims for freedom as opposed to tyranny. Thus it resulted that the controversy between England and her colonies, and the war that followed it, were largely caused by differences of opinion as to constitutional and legal questions, and that in the struggle of the colonists for what they looked upon as their rights, Magna Carta, as one of the fundamentals, as part of the legal inheritance, the birthright of Englishmen at home and in the colonies, played a role of great prominence. Footnote. The American theory was summed up by Otis in one of the earliest, 1764, political pamphlets of the Revolution. Every British subject born on the continent of America is, by the laws of God and nature, by the common law, and by act of Parliament, entitled to all the natural, inherent, and inseparable rights of our fellow-subjects in Great Britain. See Channing, The United States of America, page 45. To what extent, if any, Magna Carta alone, and of itself, gave the colonists a basis for their version of the principle that there should be no taxation without representation, may be seen by a perusal of McKechnie, Magna Carta, 2nd edition, 1914, pages 231-240. to 240. End footnote. In considering the constitutional aspects of the revolutionary epoch, it should never be forgotten that since the early 18th century the institutions of England and of the colonies had been drifting apart, and that the colonists, unlike their kinsfolk in the mother country, did not recognize the doctrine of the supremacy of Parliament as an imperial legislature. In one highly important point, therefore, we find that the American Revolution was like the English Revolution of 1688. In England, powers of the king, asserted to be based on legitimate foundations, were destroyed. In America, powers of Parliament, unquestionably legal in character, were forcibly repudiated. Fundamental differences of opinion in regard to the authority of Parliament naturally affected the views of Englishmen at home and in the colonies as to the nature of constitutional rights and liberties and the interpretation to be placed upon constitutional documents such as the Great Charter and the Bill of Rights. Part 3 in respect of private law, the revolution resulted in no break with the past. After, as before the revolution, the common law, adapted and modified by its American environment, formed the general basis of private rights, and this feature of American law survives to the present day. So, too, in the matter of constitutional institutions, the revolution made less difference than is sometimes imagined, for in many of their main characteristics, the federal and state governments of the national era followed precedents of the colonial and revolutionary epochs. Thayer, in his essay on the American doctrine of constitutional law, sums up the revolution in two short sentences. The revolution came, and what happened then? Simply this, we cut the cord that tied us to Great Britain, and there was no longer an external sovereign. 
that the federal and state constitutions contained vitally important features that were distinctively american as opposed to english is one of the commonplaces of political history the institutional divergence from english models which set in as we have already observed during the early eighteenth century was sure to produce ultimate results very different from some of the leading features of the english constitution the federal nature of the union the sanctity of the written constitution as a document embodying the fundamental law the coordination of the legislature executive and judicature as the three departments of government which operate in distinct spheres and enjoy equality of position the remarkable power of the judicature to declare an act of the legislature that conflicts with the written constitution null and void these are four of the main characteristics which mark a wide gulf between american constitutional institutions and the unwritten constitution of england under which magna carta and the bill of rights although of fundamental significance are yet subject like any ordinary statute and the decisions of the courts to the legislative sovereignty of parliament but in at least one highly important respect the american constitutions display a striking adherence to the traditions of the english constitution in the bill of rights which forms a part of each of the written constitutions both state and federal there is a persistence of those fundamental rights of englishmen embodied in magna carta the bill of rights of sixteen eighty nine and other leading sources of the common law this whole development is summarized by sir frederick pollock in one sentence of the genius of the common law our fathers labored and strove chiefly in the field of crown law to work out those ideals of public law and liberty which are embodied in the bill of rights and are familiar to american citizens in the constitutions of the united states and of their several commonwealths it is this american bill of rights forming an important element in constitutional law as distinct from constitutional institutions which chiefly links the american constitutions of today with the magna carta of 1215 1 as the direct descendants of the royal colonial charters these charters being based on still earlier models the state constitutions are the oldest feature of american political life nearly all of the original thirteen colonies when they declared their independence and framed their state constitutions included in these documents as perhaps their most important feature a declaration of the fundamental rights and liberties of man most of the clauses of this declaration known collectively as the bill of rights were taken over from colonial and revolutionary laws and constitutional documents the contents of which in turn as we have already seen had been derived originally in important particulars from magna carta the bill of rights and other great constitutional statutes which secured the liberties of englishmen as new states have been admitted into the union from time to time they too have embodied a bill of rights in their constitutions in this way therefore the bill of rights of the state constitutions traces its pedigree back to magna carta in each separate state of the federal republic as in england the great charter of twelve fifteen still exists protecting men in their lives liberties and estates from the encroachments of arbitrary or tyrannical government footnote bryce american commonwealth nineteen ten volume one pages four twenty six to four sixty three gives a summary account of state constitutions and their history on page four thirty eight he says the bill of rights is historically the most interesting part of these state constitutions for it is the legitimate child and representative of magna carta and of those other declarations and enactments down to the bill of rights of the act of one william and mary session two by which the liberties of englishmen have been secured End footnote. naturally the state constitutions vary in the form of words chosen to express the rights and liberties derived from magna carta some constitutions more especially perhaps the earlier ones follow the original model closely 
others are couched in terms more suited to american conditions but the main features of the original are in all cases retained in the american derivations so too the constitutions vary one from the other in the extent to which they borrow from the great charter some take more and some less but in all are to be found in one phrasing or another the essence of chapter thirty nine thus to cite only one illustration in section sixteen of the constitution of the new state of oklahoma nineteen o seven chapter thirty nine of magna carta appears in the phrasing no person shall be deprived of life liberty or property without due process of law two the federal constitution of seventeen eighty nine including the amendments of seventeen ninety one and of later times is likewise derived in part from the colonial charters and from other constitutional and legal sources of the colonies and of england in lord bryce's felicitous words the american constitution is no exception to the rule that everything which has power to win the obedience and respect of men must have its roots deep in the past and that the more slowly every institution has grown so much the more enduring is it likely to prove there is little in this constitution that is absolutely new there is much that is as old as magna carta the constitution of seventeen eighty nine embodies in one article or another various declarations of the fundamental rights of men thus for example it provides for taxation by the legislature only for the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus for trial by jury in criminal cases for the prohibition of bills of attainder ex post facto laws laws impairing the obligation of contracts and laws imposing religious tests these and other provisions derived in large measure from english and colonial precedents constitute a body of constitutional guarantees of the highest value but the absence of a formal bill of rights similar to the one included in state constitutions was at once severely criticized by the people as a feature of the constitution dangerous to their liberties footnote some of the leading statesmen held that same view thus jefferson said i hope that a declaration of rights will be drawn up to protect the people against the federal government as they are already protected in most cases against the state governments jefferson seems to have had in mind the bill of rights embodied in state constitutions End footnote. in response to persistent demands ten amendments taking effect in seventeen ninety one were added to the original instrument these first ten amendments which are to be viewed as a supplement or postscript to the original constitution and not as an alteration of it make up what is called after the english and earlier american precedents the declaration or bill of rights in essence this bill of rights secures the rights and liberties of the individual citizens and the separate states against the encroachments of the federal government although each of the amendments added to the constitution after seventeen ninety one demands separate consideration both in respect to its general scope and the place it holds in the whole body of the constitution yet we may regard the thirteenth fourteenth and fifteenth amendments in certain of their fundamental characteristics as later additions to the bill of rights contained in the first ten amendments it is said that the people regarded the liberties embodied in the first ten amendments as their own because they were based on old english law certainly a study of the amendments reveals the fact that the origin of some of their features is to be traced to the common and statutory law of england certain of their clauses are undoubtedly based directly or indirectly through colonial and revolutionary precedents upon magna carta the bill of rights and other english constitutional documents thus upon magna carta rests the provision in the fifth amendment that no person shall be deprived of life liberty or property without due process of law similarly the fourteenth amendment eighteen sixty eight in declaring that no state shall deprive any person of life liberty or property without due process of law 
adopts, like the Fifth Amendment, the thirty-ninth chapter of Magna Carta. The last clause of the First Amendment, which provides that Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people to petition the government for a redress of grievances, seems to go back for its origin through various American documents to the English Bill of Rights. So, also, upon the English Bill of Rights is based the Second Amendment, which declares that a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In the words of Judge Cooley, the amendment, like most other provisions in the Constitution, has a history. It was adopted with some modification and enlargement from the English Bill of Rights where it stood as a protest against arbitrary action of the overturned dynasty in disarming the people, and as a pledge of the new rulers that this tyrannical action should cease. Again, the Eighth Amendment is almost an exact transcript of the clause in the English Bill of Rights, which provides that excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted, the Eighth Amendment reads, Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. These and other provisions in the Federal Constitution rest upon the constitutional law of England. Magna Carta's contribution to the Federal instrument and to the State Constitutions consists fundamentally in the adaptation of the famous Chapter 39 to meet American conditions this chapter had been embodied in colonial law. By its incorporation in state constitutions and in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments to the Federal Constitution, it still serves as the basis of the rule of law throughout the Republic. 3. Legal and historical accuracy may well be placed in jeopardy by considering the due process of law clauses apart from their full setting in the amendments and in the whole scheme of fundamental law as set forth in the complete federal instrument. But with this caution, a few words in explanation of the meaning and scope of the clauses may be ventured. The last words of the Fifth Amendment, 1791, declare that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The last portion of Section 1 of the Fourteenth Amendment, 1868, reads, No State shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any State deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. American political and constitutional history of absorbing interest and moment surrounds every word of these due process of law clauses. Suffice it here to say that the prohibition of the Fifth Amendment was introduced as a check upon the federal government, as distinct from the state governments, while in the Fourteenth Amendment, adopted after the great civil war between the North and the South, the prohibition is directed against the individual states that compose the Union. Thus the two amendments, under the dual government inseparably incident to American federalism, supplement one the other. Together the amendments ensure to the people their individual rights to life, liberty, and property under the rule of law, as opposed to arbitrary and tyrannical action on the part of either state or federal governments. The due process of law clause of the Fourteenth Amendment represents, therefore, the latest obligation of America to Magna Carta. Indeed, as Judge Dillon, in commenting on the constitutional guarantees of the two amendments, remarks, this was not new language or language of uncertain meaning, it was taken purposely from Magna Carta. It was language not only memorable in its origin, but it had stood for more than five centuries as the classic expression and the recognized bulwark of the ancient and inherited rights of Englishmen to be secure in their personal liberty and in their possessions. 
it was moreover language which shone resplendent with the light of universal justice and for these reasons it was selected to be put into the fifth amendment of the federal constitution as it had already been put into the charters and constitutions of the several states it was of set purpose that the prohibitions of the fourteenth amendment were directed to any and every form and mode of state action as opposed to federal action whether in the shape of constitutions statutes or judicial judgments that deprived any person white or black natural or corporate of life liberty or property or of the equal protection of the laws its value consists in the great fundamental principles of right and justice which it embodies and makes part of the organic law of the nation it will hereafter more fully than at present be regarded as the american complement of the great charter and be to america as the great charter was and is to england the source of perennial blessings footnote adams origin of the english constitution nineteen twelve page two forty three in commenting on chapter thirty nine of magna carta remarks what was then twelve fifteen demanded was a trial according to law and securing to them the barons their legal rights taken in this sense clause thirty nine of magna carta would correspond somewhat closely to the general prohibition included in amendment fourteen to the constitution of the united states nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty or property without due process of law End footnote. the supreme court of the united states has never attempted to give a rigid and complete definition of due process of law the policy of the court has been expressed in the recent case of twining versus new jersey this court has always declined to give a comprehensive definition of it and has preferred that its full meaning should be gradually ascertained by the process of inclusion and exclusion in the course of the decisions of cases as they arise there are certain general principles well settled however which narrow the field of discussion and may serve as helps to correct conclusions these principles grow out of the proposition universally accepted by american courts on the authority of coke that the words due process of law are equivalent in meaning to the words law of the land contained in that chapter of magna carta which provides that no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or outlawed or exiled or in any wise destroyed nor shall we go upon him nor send upon him but by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land in hagar versus reclamation district the court had already expressed the view that the meaning of due process of law is that there can be no proceeding against life liberty or property which may result in deprivation of either without the observance of those general rules established in our system of jurisprudence for the security of private rights so too in bank of columbia versus oakley it was said as to the words from magna carta after volumes spoken and written with a view to their exposition the good sense of mankind has at length settled down to this that they were intended to secure the individual from the arbitrary exercise of the powers of government unrestrained by the established principles of private right and distributive justice although the due process of law phrase is thus historically derived from and closely related to the phrase per legem terre of magna carta nevertheless in the application of the clause to the institutions of government in the two countries there is a marked difference between the constitution of england and that of america in england the provisions of magna carta including chapter thirty nine were originally intended and have since been regarded as a limitation upon the executive and judicature not upon the legislature in english law chapter thirty nine is held to mean that no person is subject to the arbitrary acts of the crown or its courts that no person shall be deprived of his life liberty or property unless in accordance with the existing law of the land whether it be common law or statutory law 
Parliament is not affected by the limitations imposed on the Crown and the Courts. Legally, the Parliament is the sovereign power, and can at any moment alter the law of the land by its enactments. The rights of the individual are, in theory and in practice, subject to the supreme legislative power of Parliament. As this legislative supremacy of Parliament was fully established by the time of the adoption of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, it might be contended that, historically, their due process of law clauses were not intended to operate as a limitation upon the powers of the state legislatures and of the Federal Congress. But American constitutional government, both state and federal, is based on written instruments, which in the sphere of political and legal activity are fundamental and supreme, though subject, of course, to the principle that they may be amended by the people acting through the machinery which the constitutions themselves provide. In vital differences between the English unwritten constitution and the American written constitutions, we must seek for the explanation of certain features of American divergence from English precedents. In result, the general purpose of written constitutions in America has gradually come to be entirely different from the purpose of Magna Carta and the other great constitutional documents of England. In America, to employ Willoughby's careful analysis, written instruments of government and their accompanying bills of rights have, for their aim, the delimitation of the powers of all the departments of government, the legislative as well as the executive and judicial, and it is therefore quite proper to hold that the requirement of due process of law should not only prohibit executive and judicial officers from proceeding against the individual except in conformity with procedural requirements, but also operate to nullify legislative acts which provide for the taking of private property without compensation, or life and liberty without cause, or in general for executive or judicial action against the individual of an arbitrary or clearly unjust and oppressive character. By a long and careful process of judicial construction, the prohibitions of the due process of law clauses have thus come to be applied to all three departments of the state and federal governments, the legislative no less than the executive and judicial. The Supreme Court of the United States, in the leading case of Hurtado v. California, decided in 1884, emphasizes the fundamental distinction between the constitutional doctrines of England and of America, and shows that the provision of Magna Carta has been incorporated into American constitutional law, but incorporated in a way which brings it into harmony with American notions, not only of the supremacy of the written constitution, and of the coordination of the three departments of government under that constitution, but of the great power entrusted to the courts of declaring legislative acts which conflict with the constitution null and void. In this case, the courts say, the concessions of Magna Carta were wrung from the king as guarantees against the oppressions and usurpations of his prerogative. It did not enter into the minds of the barons to provide security against their own body, or in favor of the commons, by limiting the power of Parliament, so that bills of attainder, ex post facto laws, laws declaring forfeitures of estates, and other arbitrary acts of legislation, which occur so frequently in English history, were never regarded as inconsistent with the law of the land. For notwithstanding what was attributed to Lord Coke in Bonham's case, the omnipotence of Parliament over the common law was absolute, even against common right and reason. The actual and practical security for English liberty against legislative tyranny was the power of a free public opinion represented by the commons. In this country, written constitutions were deemed essential to protect the rights and liberties of the people against the encroachments of power delegated to their governments, and the provisions of Magna Carta were incorporated into bills of rights. They were limitations upon all the powers of government, legislative as well as executive and judicial. 
applied in england only as guards against executive usurpation and tyranny here they have become bulwarks also against arbitrary legislation but in that application as it would be incongruous to measure and restrict them to the ancient customary english law they must be held to guarantee not particular forms of procedure but the very substance of individual rights of life liberty and property part four the history of magna carta in america has a meaning far deeper than the influence of a single constitutional document for magna carta typifies those ideals of law and government which have spread to america and to many other political communities that lie beyond the four seas encircling the island realm itself the world-wide diffusion of those ideals of liberty and justice deserves to be studied in its entirety as a vast historical process which had its beginnings far back in the middle ages and which has shaped and is still shaping in modern times the institutions of all the political commonwealths that owe their spiritual inheritance to england the history of the charter's influence upon american constitutional development as one phase of that vaster process should be illuminating alike to subjects of the crown and citizens of the republic above all it teaches them that english political and legal ideals lie at the basis of much that is best in american institutions those ideals jealously preserved and guarded by americans throughout their whole history still form the vital force in political thought and activity within the union as the americans adapt their institutions to the ever-changing conditions of national and international life those ideals of liberty and justice founded upon the great charter will continue to inspire and guide them the charter has a future as well as a past in the american commonwealth for its spirit is inherent in the aspirations of the race end of section thirteen Of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Magna Carta and Spanish Medieval Jurisprudence by Professor Rafael Altamira. Translated by F. A. Kirkpatrick. To a historian of Spanish constitutional law, Magna Carta may offer two fundamental and extremely interesting questions. One is concerned with the analogy between the rights, political and civil, which are defined in Magna Carta, and rights of the same kind which are formulated in contemporary or earlier Spanish legislation. The two pictures may be compared as the results of a process common to all the nations of Europe in the Middle Ages results produced in two distinct communities which were making their way towards the same end. The other question has to do with the possibility that certain liberties and customs, belonging to Spain and the adjoining lands, may have had some influence in the formation of the program which was imposed upon King John by the English barons. This second question has been raised by an English writer, Mr. Wentworth Webster, in his essay on The Influence of the Pyrenaic Fueros upon the British Constitution. Mr. Webster believed that such an influence may have been brought to bear through Simon de Montfort, who, during his government of Gascony, not only saw, in actual political working, many of the privileges recognized by Magna Carta, but was also himself obliged to use them and prove their efficacy. It is natural that the continual observation of institutions, tried and proved by use, should impress one closely concerned therein, should guide the direction of his thoughts, and lead him to introduce these institutions into another country when occasion should arise. Thus the suggestion concerning de Montfort is probable enough, although it would still remain to be proved that, in English constitutional experiments, the particular views of Simon de Montfort were actually predominant in guiding the thoughts of the other barons who had not shared his suggestive experiences. In the case of Magna Carta, it is permissible to examine the question concerning the influence of the Pyrenaic Fueros upon that document 
through the agency of such men of that generation as might be acquainted with them. Long before Webster, the Spanish historians, Senores Marie Haler and Manrique, put forward the hypothesis of such an influence, though not the agency of a particular person, but through possible knowledge of Spanish twelfth-century legislative documents on the part of the English barons. But they did not support this supposition by any historical proof that Spanish precedents were used by those who drew up Magna Carta. But in fact this question, interesting though it be, depends upon the first question stated above. For it is necessary to know exactly whether there is a true analogy between the two sets of liberties and privileges in favor of certain groups of the population and in limitation of royal power. In proportion, as the analogy proves stronger or weaker, the case becomes stronger or weaker for the possibility of the supposed Spanish influence. Or the solution may be simply a resemblance in the results of two independent movements directed towards the same object. This investigation will naturally examine several historical problems which form part of the general question. These problems may be thus stated. 1. Analogy in respect of the number and amplitude of the rights granted in each case. 2. Analogy in respect of their social scope, that is to say the classes or groups to which they extended. 3. Their chronological relation. The analysis of these three points should be completed by a comparative study of the two movements which in England and in Spain led to the results under examination, or at least a study of their chief features and particularly the main point of Magna Carta, namely the limitation of the absolute power of the monarchy and the safeguard of the rights and privileges, not always just, it must be admitted, of the people. Such would be the plan of a complete study of the proposed thesis but the limits of this chapter admit only of a brief summary of each point. Magna Carta contains some points which specially concern the political situation of England, points which have no parallel in Spain. A priori, this was to be expected. Feudal organization was not alike in the two countries, even if the most feudal regions of Spain be considered. Social elements were not alike, nor the relations between classes. In England there were also certain circumstances purely connected with the person of King John, abuses committed by that particular king which had to be abolished or restricted in the charter. We shall not touch on these points, since there is nothing corresponding to them in Spanish jurisprudence, and we shall only examine those matters which are in their essence common to both countries. Here also, Signores Marie Haler and Manrique have shown the way. They examine, one by one, most of the chapters of Magna Carta, in order to prove, by comparison with Castilian precedents, and especially with the dispositions laid down in the Corte of Leon in 1188, the priority, and in some matters the greater amplitude, of Spanish jurisprudence in the points of highest political and civil importance. The observations of Mary Haler and Mamreque, being merely a kind of digression in their book, are brief and also suffer from the deficiency of concrete studies, from which Spanish constitutional history suffered at that time, 1862, in most of the tropics which it embraced. Moreover, their whole work is marred by a want of organic perception. Nevertheless, most of their comparisons are accurate in the main. To avoid repetition, these comparisons have been summarized here. The two authors prove the priority of Leonese and Castilian jurisprudence, in part also of Visigothic jurisprudence, as defined in the Liber Judicarum, which during the age of the Reconquest was still in force in Spain, in respect of the rights of widows, Magna Carta, Chapter 8, the establishment of a royal tribunal in a fixed place, Chapter 17, the provisions concerning judicial process, Chapter 39, the judgment of peers, Chapter 21, the vote of subsidies demanded by the king, Chapter 12, and other provisions. These also indicate certain rights which are set forth in the record of the Corte of Leon of 1188, and of other earlier Cortes, and which are not mentioned at all in Magna Carta. For example, the right of declaring war and making peace, and the inviolability of the home. On the other hand, they recognize that Magna Carta contains some provisions, namely the right of trade and of ingress into the kingdom and egress therefrom, which have no parallel in medieval Spain. But the observations of Marie Haller and Manrique do not embrace all the points of similarity between Magna Carta and Spanish jurisprudence, nor do they touch the principal topic. For the chief topic, in my opinion, 
is the general system of limitations imposed upon the crown. On the other hand, some of the points mentioned by these authors require further study, which should take into account both the whole body of provisions concerning those points, and also the differences of circumstances surrounding these questions in England and in Spain. Thus, with regard to the provisions concerning administration of justice, chapters 17, 24, 40, and 45, in order to comprehend the true relation between English and Spanish jurisprudence in the 13th century, it would be necessary to treat separately some details which form part of the general subject. Thus two jurisdictions expressly mentioned in Magna Carta, that of the king and that of the barons, should be compared with three jurisdictions existing in Spain, that of the king, that of the consejos, or municipalities, these two working side by side in a relation not yet thoroughly elucidated, and that of the feudal lords, which last had shrunk very much in Castile and Leon in the thirteenth century. Again, the establishment in England of a fixed or stationary court of common pleas, and the exclusion of pleas of the crown from the local courts, should be compared with the special cases of royal jurisdiction in Leon and Castile, the royal power of calling up cases from inferior courts, and the double process, clearly marked in Spain from early medieval times, of absorption by the king's court, of signuarial jurisdiction on the one hand, and the penetration of royal authority into municipal jurisdiction on the other hand. In Spain, municipal jurisdiction, which was gradually won also by the inhabitants of places subject to feudal lords, subjected to the fiero, or local custom, all men of whatsoever social condition, even nobles and ecclesiastics, within the limits of the municipality. This institution, a knowledge of which is necessary to a clear perception of the scope of our jurisprudence, carries the question into a region unknown to English jurisprudence, at the beginning of the thirteenth century. The provisions established by Magna Carta concerning municipalities already existed in Spain, and the existence of municipal jurisdiction in that country represents a distinct element of extraordinary importance. The subject of guarantees concerning legal process, 39, has two parts. First, prohibition to arrest, condemn, etc., any free man, contrary to the law of the land. Secondly, the judgment of peers. As to the first, the Cortes of 1188 established some provisions, either identical with those contained in the text of Magna Carta, or else resembling them, besides others which are not mentioned in Magna Carta. But the main point, namely freedom from arrest except by competent authority, and freedom from condemnation except according to law and after trial, must be sought in the texts of our municipal fieros, and in statements to be found, passum, in ordinances of a more general character. With regard to the promise in chapter 40, which so scandalizes Marie Haler and Mamerque, who exclaim, In none of our codes or ancient documents do we find the shameful declaration nulli vendemus. It should be said that the same abuses are implicitly indicated in Articles 19, 20, 21, and 29, of the ordinance of Lyon. The malpractices of administrators of justice in those times were very frequent in all countries. Monarchs continually strove to check these abuses, and Spanish jurisprudence, both before and after 1215, contains very many provisions of this kind. But apart from the matters studied by Mary Haler and Manrique, matters which, as we see, demand further investigation, there are other points of relation between English practice and the jurisprudence of the various Spanish estates. Webster observed particularly the intervention of the popular element and the form of election favored by de Montfort. As to the first point, two chapters of the Charter demand our attention. The thirteenth, which affirms municipal liberties, and the fourteenth, which deals with the composition and functions of the Concilium Regni. As to both these points, Spain was far ahead of England, Independent municipalities were numerous in Asturias, Leon, Galicia, Castile, Aragon, Catalonia, and also Navarra at the beginning of the 13th century, whereas London was not a municipality till 1189, and in several of these countries the towns constituted a considerable political and social force. Their fieros were confirmed by every king, and the royal oath in the Cortes embraced the whole body of these fieros and of the privileges possessed by every class. It seems needless to dwell on this point, since it is recognized by all historians. For the same reason it is not necessary to trace in detail the priority and the greater amplitude 
of Spanish municipal rights, by examining the true significance of the second part of chapter 13, Praetaria Volumus et Concedimus, and the scope of the liberties of London at that time. As to the composition of the Royal Council, Spain, that is to say Leon and Castile, shows a distinct advance as compared with England. Our Royal Council, Conseil Real, was already in the thirteenth century an organism, precarious indeed and irregular in its functions, yet sufficiently developed and possessing a far wider competence than the baronial system to which the council seems to be reduced in Magna Carta. The Castilian council included not only the nobles, whose right to be summoned in England is confirmed and defined for the first time by Magna Carta, but also representatives of boroughs and cities, that is to say, a plebeian element which in the English system had no part whatever in such functions. Their inclusion in the Castilian Council possibly dates from the reign of Alfonso the Eighth, eleven fifty eight to twelve fourteen. Moreover, the chief kingdoms of Spain possessed, before twelve fifteen, another organism of much greater political and representative significance than the Council, namely the Cortes, which everywhere included representatives of the various classes of the community. The Cortes of Leon came into being in eleven eighty eight and the Cortes of Aragon probably in 1163. Catalonia had Cortes a little later, in 1218. In Castile, 1250 is the latest date assigned to their origin. Nor should it be forgotten that, before the introduction of the popular element, the assembly, concilium, which aided the king in legislative functions, was in normal and frequent action from the early ages of the reconquest. This concilium, possessed not indeed the power to pass laws, but the right to propose laws, like the councils of the Visigothic period. The decisive intervention of the Cortes in voting taxation, in which matter they held distinct authority, constitutes, in those Spanish countries which possessed Cortes before 1215, a superiority over the limited guarantees provided upon this point in Chapter 12 of Magna Carta. Chapters 28, 29, and 30 find their equivalent in our municipal and general laws concerning protection of private property. There are numerous provisions which check the abuses committed in seizing goods by way of penal or legal process, protect from seizure the instruments of labor and both the objects and the quantities to be assigned to the yentar y conducho, or feeding and lodging of the king and his suite and of certain other officials. Since these points of our medieval jurisprudence have not yet been specially elucidated, it is impossible to get a clear and succinct view of all these details scattered through many constitutional documents. But the complete and organic expression which was soon afterwards given to these points in the Partitas, 1265, in the Leyes de los Adelantados, and in other legal texts of Alfonso X's time, which in great part form a collection of earlier jurisprudence, prove the development which these matters had previously reached. Finally, to avoid a too lengthy comparison between the chapters of Magna Carta and Spanish jurisprudence, I will indicate the provisions concerning the Jews. Chapters 10 and 11 contain nothing favorable to them, rather they aim at protecting widows and minors against Jewish usury. Manifestly, the legal position of the Jews in England was inferior to that which they enjoyed at that time in Spain, and particularly in Castile. It may be said that the period from the 11th century to the middle of the 13th is the golden age of the Jews in Spain. It is true that social opposition to them takes distinct form towards the end of the 12th century, but persecution started much later, and even then royal protection was not wanting to them. The petitions of the Cortes against their usury throughout this period curiously resemble these two chapters of Magna Carta. The limited scope of most of the declarations of Magna Carta must be remembered throughout. The provisions of the Charter do not extend to all Englishmen, but, in most of the chapters, to the nobles only. Those of inferior status have little share in these advantages or, to be more accurate, in the limitations imposed on the royal power. The Charter, even when it does mention villains, frees them only from some obligations toward the king, not from obligation towards the lords, to whom villains continue to be like chattels. The status which was obtained by the citizens of London cannot be compared with that which was obtained by the barons. Even if we should accept the democratic interpretation of chapter 60, there still remain many other chapters in which the royal concessions lie out of reach of the mass of the people. 
in spain on the other hand and chiefly in leon and castile even the servile classes of earlier ages had attained a great improvement of condition in twelve fifteen and the liberties which were gradually being won chiefly benefited the people in general not an oligarchy of nobles even in aragon where later times were to bring retrograde movement in respect of some inferior classes the advantages actually attained were more widely diffused than in england and we find the position of the lower classes better protected by a legislation in which they were regarded as important factors two let us now pass to the most important point of comparison between magna carta and spanish jurisprudence in the thirteenth century the point which most clearly marks the tendency of political evolution in europe and which for that reason produced most results in the direction of constitutional control that point is the attitude of the barons toward the despotism of john lackland and the guarantees with which they surrounded the concessions obtained lest the king should evade those concessions in fact the whole scheme of declarations and promises contained in magna carta is valueless apart from security for their accomplishment many spanish kings made identical or similar promises and the same thing occurred in other european countries which were passing through the same movement but the real practical problem does not lie in declarations on the part of one section of the community or of several sections or of the whole people whether represented in cortez or not that they propose to limit and censure the king's exercise of authority the point is the possession of power to accomplish that object one method of doing this was to bind the king with a series of guarantees constituting for him a danger or considerable difficulty in the ordinary working of his authority and his administration in spain from the visigothic period onwards efforts are clearly visible to check the natural propensity of kings towards abuse of power a propensity which is found in all authority but the means chosen are either merely moral definitions such as maxims declaring the king to be the first subject of the laws or else legal declarations of guarantees which rest solely on the monarch's good faith such as limitations of the confiscation of private property the sole effective counterpoise lies in the king's perpetual apprehension about breaking his formal and legal undertakings in view of the powerful forces concerned in their enforcement at a later time the cortes constitute a systemized guarantee by means of which the people hold the king in subjection through the power of refusing what the king may require that is to say supplies but in all other respects equilibrium which is seldom rarely secured is produced or attempted through the free play of the two counterbalancing forces and this is why in castile the power of the municipalities and the whole body of privileges represented by the municipal fieros are so valuable while in aragon the social weight of the nobility possesses a similar value magna carta treats the question in quite another manner the creation of the committee of twenty-five barons chapter sixty one as a kind of tribunal to judge infringements of privilege and the functions assigned to this committee in chapters fifty two and fifty five as well as the recognition of the right of insurrection in case of breach of faith on the king's part constitute guarantees which already assume an almost constitutional form both these provisions are known to spanish jurisprudence but they only attain a similar constitutional force considerably later than the date of magna carta the first device that of the committee of barons as a tribunal to watch over the fulfilment of the peace and liberties granted and confirmed in the charter in aragon takes the form of the justica mayor in so far as that dignitary forced upon the king by the nobles becomes mediating judge or judge of contra fiero that is to say examiner of infringements of law committed by the king or his officials this guarantee was initiated in the cortes of Igia in twelve sixty five its complete development is found in the privilegio general one from pedro the third in twelve eighty three and is still more marked in the privilegio de la union twelve eighty seven which forbade the king to take proceedings against any adherent of the union whether nobleman or municipality without the intervention of a judicial sentence by the justicia and the consent of the cortes something in the same direction but less effective is to be found in the privilege of the Aragonese and also the catalonian cortes that examination should first be made of any grievances against the king in castile there was nothing resembling the committee of twenty-five barons before the pact pacto of the hermandad 
of the nobles and municipalities, Conseos, of Castile, Leon, and Galicia, with the Infante Don Sancho, son of Alfonso X, 1282. This pact established the right of the Hermandad to judge the royal officials, and even the judges themselves, and to afflict upon them punishments, including the penalty of death. This privilege or means of security against the king and his officials finds its culmination in the Concordia de Medina, which was forced upon Henry IV in 1463, but this later agreement was short-lived. The second device, that of insurrection, is more fully represented in Castile. The earliest document which we know concerning this is the above-mentioned Pact of 1282, which assigns to the towns the right of insurrection against royal infringements of the law. The same thing occurs in what may be called political programs of other hermandadas of the 13th century, such as the hermandadas which united the towns of Castile, Leon, and Galicia in 1295, and which were confirmed by Ferdinand IV. A similar provision is found in the above-mentioned Concordia de Medina, which establishes the right of making war on the king without incurring penalty, in case the king should proceed against the nobles or ecclesiastics in any other form than that formulated in that document. It would be out of place here to discuss the doctrinal development of this right of insurrection in the hands of theologians and political theorists of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries. This important topic has given rise to an abundant critical literature in recent times. In Aragon, assertions of the right of insurrection were at least as definite as in Castile and had wider results in the sequence of political events. The Privilegio de la Union declared that, in case the king infringed its provisions, the leagued nobles and municipalities were free to refuse him obedience and choose another sovereign without being guilty of treason. Notwithstanding the astute government of James II, this privilege was ratified in 1347, when the new king, Pedro IV, was obliged to recognize the power, claimed by the Union, of disposing, banishing, and depriving the king if he should inflict punishment without the judicial sentence of the justica and the advice of the ricos hombres. But this privilegio was not valid for long in Aragon, since Pedro IV himself annulled it in 1348. To conclude, it is interesting to compare the very wide character of these securities, that of insurrection and that of a tribunal or judge to examine royal infringements of law, in most of the Castilian and Aragonese documents concerning them, with the very special and limited character which they bear in Magna Carta. The competence of the tribunal of twenty-five barons and the right of insurrection refer explicitly to the peace and liberties granted and defined in Magna Carta, whereas similar securities embodied in contemporary or slightly later Spanish jurisprudence embrace every possible case of infringement of privilege on the part of the king or his officials, although these documents sometimes particularly mention irregularities of legal procedure. The greater amplitude which in Spain, from the beginning, marks the guarantees won by nobles and by the people, may arise either from a natural propensity of the Spanish mind to generalize without giving much importance to the generalization, or else from a complete view of the problem and a desire to solve it entirely once for all. Whichever be the explanation, it is a characteristic trait of our history. Another characteristic is the constant mixture of noble and of popular elements in these acts of resistance to royal despotism and to arbitrary administration. The joint action of both classes signifies that in Spain the liberties obtained had a very wide social reach, especially in Castile, where popular action had a large share in the movement. But it should not be forgotten that in many cases, especially in Aragon, but also in Castile during the reign of Henry IV, the pressure put upon the king had an oligarchical character, a condition of things which is in fact not less dangerous than royal despotism to public rights. The conflict arises not always between a despot and a people suffering under his despotism, but sometimes between a despot and other despots who resist a check upon their despotism. That is to say, class privileges are asserted against the authority of one man's will, and this fact should be well weighed as it has been weighed by modern writers on Magna Carta, in order not to attribute to political development a much more democratic tendency than it really possessed. What did happen was that those who strove to limit the royal will in their own interests were unwittingly furthering constitutional progress on behalf of all. 
for they were preparing both the minds of men and the machinery of government in such a way that when the royal power representing the unity of the state should rise above the diversity of aristocratic and local authorities this single power should not be in a position to injure the fundamental rights of the subject the dates at which this point was reached and the roads which led to its attainment have varied in all the countries of europe every country has also differed from its neighbours in the vicissitudes of advance and retrogression in england apart from some episodes of fluctuating movement the tendency of national liberties becomes continually more marked from twelve fifteen and soon takes a decisive and progressive direction in spain notwithstanding her priority in this kind of political activity privileges are lost without any compensating gain to the common rights of subjects for the absolute power of the king dominates all privileges and destroys that which had been attained in the middle ages nor is the loss replaced by any analogous guarantees of equal extent the process is interrupted and is renewed long afterwards in the nineteenth century without the attainment of positive advantages until near the end of that century but the true history of absolute power in spain in order to elucidate how far it penetrated civil and political jurisprudence still remains to be studied and any generalization would be at the present time premature end of section fourteen Fifteen of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Financial Records of the Reign of King John by Hilary Jenkinson, F.S.A. The most superficial study makes it clear that finance played a part of extreme importance in the reign of King John it is probably not too much to say considering any of the great crises of his time that had he commanded even adequate financial resources the other elements in the situation the personal character of himself and those with whom he came in contact at home and abroad political influences national movements would have worked out to a quite different end his period too after long neglect has in recent years received considerable attention it is strange therefore that the existing records which may be either directly ascribed to or obviously associated with his financial administration have been to a great extent left aside by historians it is true that the primary executive instrument of his time was the chancery and that chancery records have nearly all been published for his reign with introductions which in some cases at least still stand but even the chancery records are comparatively unworked for the financial points at any rate for the smaller ones which they contain partly no doubt because it is the great lack of all the earlier record publications they have no subject index the direct records of exchequer administration have with two exceptions been left severely alone here again there is an obvious reason in an obvious difficulty the pipe rolls the chief though not the only class of direct exchequer records for this reign being so bulky that inquirers have doubtless despaired of making a just use of them it would be well if these records could be dealt with in print meanwhile the present anniversary seems to offer an opportunity for the survey of such exchequer records of king john as remain to us having surveyed we may also do good work by endeavouring to place them we have a good general summary of exchequer procedure as it was in the twelfth century in the dialogus de sacario and we know in outline at least what the machinery of it was in the period which first gives us fairly complete manuscript remains of the various departments of exchequer administration say the early fourteenth century it is obvious that the second of these states has grown out of the first but obvious also that we cannot without investigation put down to mere expansion all the changes which we find there might well have been some violent innovation now where do john's exchequer records stand in relation to this expansion and if they took place to these innovations the fact that the chancery rolls begin with his reign makes it peculiarly desirable to establish at this point some limit between the twelfth and fourteenth centuries in the matter also of the exchequer even so we have not exhausted the list of what may properly be considered preliminaries essential to the study by historians of john's finances 
all administrations perhaps everywhere certainly in england have been from the earliest date subject to the mysterious influence of the legal fiction old forms that is to say because they were established and because they had legal sanction have been adapted to violently new uses two people play at going to law in order to transfer land with the greater security the king makes out a receipt for money he has not received from a in order to have a convenient substitute for cash with which himself to pay b we have in fact to consider the records of for example the annual audit in the light of transactions which we know from other sources to have taken place in order to settle the question whether the pipe roll at a given period represents what we should expect it to represent a survey of the year's income or whether it is only partially this or not this at all reversing the process we have to test where possible our knowledge of the alleged exaction of the king by its representation in records does the statement that the king imposed a tallage of twenty thousand marks mean that he obtained twenty thousand marks in the vast majority of cases administrative documents and narrative descriptions have not both survived for any given transaction in early medieval times but an examination of the cases where they have will furnish a criterion of value for the large number of cases where only one or the other remains to us to deal with such problems as this is obviously beyond the scope of a single paper indeed for the most part they must be left till greater facilities in the way of printed and indexed records are available at the same time in view of the wide and unquestioning use which has been made of chronicle statements the point is worth raising meanwhile we may attempt perhaps with some profit the survey of the wealth which remains to us and to a certain extent the classification of the records from the point of view of the part they played in the administration of the various departments for the purposes of a survey it will be convenient to travel backwards briefly then to summarize what is well known the financial documents which remain to us from the time when the course of the exchequer was well established say at the end of the first quarter of the fourteenth century are as follows it may be premised that we are attempting only to deal with those officials who left us records i e direct records of the particular processes they controlled for example we are to display an interest in the chamberlains of the receipt but not in the tellers important as the latter ultimately became to begin with the exchequer of audit this is represented by the two departments of the king's remembrancer and the lord treasurer's remembrancer the latter's department is that of final audit represented in records by the pipe roll and the divisions which split off from it the king's remembrancer's department that of preliminary audit is represented in records by a mass of vouchers of every shade of variety in point of officiality provenance and writing and by some preliminary statements or summaries of accounts compotuses compiled from the vouchers these last are closely connected with the enrolled accounts mentioned above all these are an origin part of the ancient miscellanea of the exchequer k r and are represented now by a number of classes principally those known collectively as exchequer accounts the supplementary interim or domestic affairs of the upper exchequer as a whole the proceedings of the barons their minutes and correspondence are represented in the case of both these remembrancers by a memoranda roll in which each of them had noted such of the proceedings as interested his department in many cases the same information would appear in both rolls these memoranda are of course the distinctive records of remembrancers at the time we are speaking of they are arrayed in definite divisions including the adventus vice comitium and dies date showing the arrangements made for audit the brevia directa baronibus a section of in letters the status et visus compotorum the brevia retornabilia and irretornabilia out letters the precepta instructions for issue of writs of process and a section in which private deeds are enrolled and most important of all the very lengthy communia with various subsections the chief of which is that of the recorda of revenue cases which come up for decision before the barons this last section is intimately connected with the origin of the separate exchequer of pleas but precisely how intimately has not yet been settled 
behind or below this exchequer of audit separate from but subject to it is the department of receipt represented qua officials by the treasurer and the two chamberlains or their deputies speaking broadly the duties of these three at the recepta are the same and they are represented in records by either a common collection or a triplicate series they record the operation of receipt by preserving counterfoils of receipts the foils of tallies are contra tally and eventually the stocks of the same when these come in after audit and copies of the inscriptions of these tallies on rolls receipt rolls the operation of issue by preserving the original writs for issue copies of these liberate rolls or notes of them issue rolls besides the recepta there is another office where receipt and issue go on when the differentiation of the exchequer from the curia was complete the result was the elimination of any personal control by the monarch the same thing occurred in the departmentalization of the chancellor who with his staff controlled the great seal in each case the result was the same under the older official or rather body of officials there grew up an official or an office closely resembling it in functions and to some extent in methods but controlled as itself had originally been directly by the sovereign at its weakest the new body acted as a link between the older one and the king at its strongest it usurped in his behalf the authority of its prototype the departmentalization of the curia in fact brought into existence the camera the household grew up as an administrative organ beneath the court thus below the process of the great seal preliminary or subsidiary to it we have that of the privy seal and presently below this in its turn the signet similarly below the exchequer upper and lower auditing body and receipt we have financial functionaries of a less official character notably we have well established long before the fourteenth century the wardrobe taking upon itself to a greater or less extent according to the relative strength of the king and ministers for the time being the function of receiving and more particularly of spending the king's money of the activities of the officials of the wardrobe record is preserved to us in the shape of a regular series of accounts with quantities of attendant vouchers among the records of the king's remembrancer apart from the direct operations thus recorded at the two departments of the upper exchequer at the receipt and at the wardrobe record is preserved at the chancery of the part played by that executive in originating active financial operations writs for issues and those concerned with the audit process writs of account allowance pardon etc are preserved in copies made as they issue from the chancery we have in particular the chancery liberate rolls because these many other letters under the great seal must necessarily concern the exchequer either directly by causing payments in or out or indirectly by modifying the property in respect of which audit takes place as these letters unlike the writs mentioned above are not directed to exchequer officials copies or notes of them extracted from the chancery enrolments must be sent over to the exchequer where they are preserved in the shape of originalia or chancery estreats finally we must give a word in passing to another class of non exchequer records the rolls of the justices full of subjects so interesting to the exchequer as amercements as these were preserved at the treasury of the exchequer they were presumably available there for reference but as streets were also prepared from them whether by the justices or the exchequer officials for the information of the exchequer and its accounting officers it is to be noted that all the operations which lie at the base of the classes of documents we have touched on are simple ones which in a primitive form at least are going on in the earliest times at which we have detail of the organized finance of the king's courts to return now to these earliest times in the time of the dialogus we have an upper exchequer represented in records by the pipe roll the form of which a fact confirmed by existing rolls is essentially the same as that we find later it is written we are told by the treasurer's scribe from his dictation at the actual time of audit and at the same time a copy was taken by the chancellor's scribe for the chancellor we may add for completeness a reference to the existing rolls and their publications by the pipe roll society there is evidence of the production of original writs of pardon or allowance at audit time by the accountant 
and of their preservation by the marshal at the recepta the officials are the same as we find there later the tallies given out as acknowledgments of sums paid in are also practically the same and the foils and subsequently the stocks are preserved in like manner the writing on them is done by the treasurer's clerk the same official also deputat scripto the sums received possibly this is a reference to the rotulo receptorum which is also mentioned payment out is already dependent on a writ of liberate from the chancery which the officials of the receipt preserve after it has been honoured two examples of the henry the second period have survived before going any further we may interpolate here some remarks about the separate financial administration of normandy an administration which of course was not in existence so far as concerns this country at the later date we have been discussing stapleton who edited the rolls of this norman exchequer for the society of antiquaries quoting allusions made in the dialogus to this scaccarium transmarinum discredits the suggestion that the english system was based on the norman a position taken also by most modern writers but makes it clear that there was a separate norman thesaurus in eleven thirty one and the balance of opinion seems to be in favour of accepting the fact of a scaccorium in session in normandy as early as eleven seventy one it is to be noted that the dialogus expressly describes this overseas exchequer as essentially different from the english one and professor powicki in describing its functions is of course noting some functions and fashions which are certainly not english the surviving rolls go back to eleven eighty four it is further to be noted that in the time of the dialogus we have already allusions to financial transactions carried on by some machinery other than that of the scaccorium and recepta by the camera in fact both in england and in normandy in the chancery it appears from the dialogus the chancellor's clerk keeps a rescriptum otherwise called contra brevia of the writs of liberate pardon and allowance issued and these contra brevia may apparently be produced at the exchequer board of audit just as the contralati are produced for checking purposes by the officials of the receipt turning to judicial records we find that the dialogus supplies no evidence of the existence of plea rolls in its time the earliest which have survived are of the reign of richard i but it is clear that information concerning immersements imposed is furnished by the justices now it will be noticed as one compares the twelfth with the fourteenth century that we have here certain large gaps at the receipt we have seen nothing of any issue or liberate rule in the chancery there is no preparation of originalia though the rescriptum or contra brevia seem to be used for the same purpose finally we have said nothing so far in relation to the twelfth century of the remembrancers and of their most distinctive records the memoranda i have mentioned these last because we have here a matter which needs rather more detailed discussion it is clear of course that in the time of the dialogus the business of audit was not divided up into the preliminary and final department of the king's remembrancer and the lord treasurer's remembrancer or any two officials under other names but that does not mean necessarily that there were not at that date remembrancers or at any rate some officials whose successors ultimately became remembrancers moreover we have yet to mention two more officers whom the dialogus does chronicle with their records master thomas brown and the archdeacon of poitou richard of ilchester for a short time seneschal of normandy these being two and unplaced in the exchequer scheme of things and the later remembrancers who are not mentioned in the dialogus being also two it is naturally tempting to equate the pairs thus dr poole has long been accustomed to see in thomas brown and richard of ilchester the origin of the two remembrancers who first appear by name under henry the third the position of both at the exchequer board is certainly anomalous of thomas brown we are told that at the court of the sicilian king before he came over to that of henry the second he was in regis secretis pena prasapuis and that at the english exchequer he sits in quarto scano quod est oppositum justicario and that he has a copy made from the pipe-roll or parts of it 
at the same time as the chancellor's clerk makes the chancellor's counter-roll his own clerk having a special seat given him that he may be able to discharge this duty that he also has a clerk at the receipt who liberum habet facultatum scribendi cue recipientur et expendentur of the archdeacon we are told that his clerk kept rescripta of the writs of summons which he used for the purpose of checking them when they were read out at the audit we are also given details of his place at the board as to the peculiarity of the position of these two administrators thomas brown's privilege of keeping for his own use a third roll is praetor antiquium consuetudinum while the archdeacon's position is ex officio quidem set ex novella constitutione in the case of this last passage a variant reading would tell us that he sits non ex officio the first of the above remarks seems to me to show that thomas brown's position was ad hoc created not for an office which he filled at the moment but for him taking this view i should be disposed to accept the non in the second passage though even without it the remark does not i think establish conclusively the officiality of the archdeacon's position at the board ex novella constitutione is elsewhere applied to thomas brown and is there explained as meaning added by the present king at this point i come with great diffidence into conflict with the view which sees in these two the ancestors of the remembrancers officials be it noted who are not known to occur under that name before the reign of henry the third the identification of the archdeacon and the lord treasurer's remembrancer may here be left it is a matter largely of taste for it depends almost entirely upon the interpretation put upon the passage quoted above though there is possibly some force in the fact that the archdeacon is connected with the function of summons together with the fact that if thomas brown is the ancestor of the king's remembrancer there seems really no reason why the archdeacon should not foreshadow the lord treasurer's remembrancer if thomas brown's suggested position be not substantiated then the similar suggestion for his contemporary rather falls to the ground now as to thomas brown dr poole's argument is that the words quoad or portet excipiat applied to his clerk imply a selection of topics and that the regni iura regis qui secreta contained in his roll are very nearly what the later remembrancers wrote in their rolls in making this point dr poole has to dismiss the statements that any errors made in excipiendo can easily be corrected by a comparison with the chancellor's and the pipe rolls together with an important comment of disciples in this connection this is difficult and an even greater difficulty is that the same word excipere is applied to the work done by the chancellor's clerk who undoubtedly makes an exact copy from the work done by the treasurer's clerk as to the word secreta dr poole has already explained its use in connection with thomas brown's sicilian experiences as referring to the duana de secretus and there seems to be no difficulty here in explaining it either as professor haskins does as a piece of mere magniloquence or as being borrowed by the writer of the dialogus from his own previous description the man who was great in the secreta of sicily was also great in our english secreta a piece of elusiveness quite in character of course it may be argued that brown did keep an exact copy but that in spite of this he was a remembrancer i confess i find it quite easy to suppose that a restless experimenter to adopt professor haskins description of henry the second temporarily included special members in his court of exchequer in order to have the advantage of their advice and in consideration of their financial experience which was well known elsewhere i have tried to show that so early as the beginning of this king's reign new revenue problems were making the conduct of the audit upon the old lines by no means a simple matter it is much more difficult i think to suppose a permanent change to have been made by revolutionary innovation at the exchequer whereas as the dialogus shows the ancient course was already a shibboleth such changes are extremely rare in the whole of exchequer history and indeed in the whole of english administrative history it is much easier to suppose that the remembrances were merely the evolution into a separate name and recognized office of the simple clerks of one of the original officers of the court just as was the case with the chancellor of the exchequer 
originally the chancellor's clerk and the clerk of the pipe treasurer's clerk at the upper exchequer the clerk of the pells treasurer's clerk at the receipt and other distinct officials in other courts this is perhaps again very much a matter of taste but there are other arguments less open to that objection the nature of the later memoranda rolls does not suggest that they originated in copies from the pipe rolls they consist in fact largely of things which are not in the pipe roll again neither of the later remembrancers had any function at the receipt thomas brown kept a clerk there final and strongest argument against this derivation of the remembrancers office the dialogus actually mentions the making of memoranda and memoranda of such a nature as we should expect very little it says is written at the easter scircarium tamen quedam memoranda quae frequenter incudunt siorsum tuc scribuntur ut soluto scicario de hias discernant maiores quae quidam non facile propter numerosam sui multitudium nisi scripto commendarentur occurrent the volume of business is so increased that many matters so many that they must be noted in writing have to be reserved for discussion so to speak out of term we shall have to return to this later for the moment the interesting point is that this writing is done a clerico thesaurii in treating therefore this section of records it is from the view of the memoranda that we must start that is from an expectation of finding in the pipe roll such a growing unwieldiness and confusion as would necessitate the regular making not of extracts from it but of notes of preliminary and interim matters which need not ultimately appear in the pipe roll at all and from the parallel expectation of what when we find them the first memoranda will be so we may turn after a rather long digression to the actual records of john end of section fifteen section sixteen of magna carta commemoration essays this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Financial Records of the Reign of King John by Henry Jenkinson. Part 2. Pipe Rolls. These exist for every year except the 15th and 18th, and fragments of the latter are made up in the roll of the 17th year. Chancellor's rolls exist for the third, fourth, seventh, tenth, thirteenth, and seventeenth year. That for the third year was printed by the Record Commission. There is also a fragment in the Exchequer K.R. Miscellanea 1 6. Memoranda. Two rolls are definitely so called, though they are not now numbered with the classes of that name. They are Exchequer L.T.R. Miscellaneous Rolls. 1 slash 3 and 1 slash 4. Vouchers and miscellanea. Classed as such, though we may have to bestow some of them elsewhere, are at present one document in Exchequer K.R. Miscellanea, and eleven among the Exchequer accounts. Of the latter, six are Mize and Impressed Rolls, partly known by the Record Commission publication, Exchequer Accounts, 349, numbers 1b, two and three and three hundred twenty five numbers one twenty one and two and referred to under household below of the remaining five two exchequer accounts five o five numbers two and three have to be eliminated at once as they belong really to the following reign on the other hand one exchequer accounts three forty nine number one a at present classed as belonging to the previous reign must be assigned to our period we have therefore to consider under this heading five documents, of which one, Exchequer Account 152, Number 1, has been printed by a foreign student. Tallies. One possibility of this reign has survived. Receipt Rolls. We have one doubtful fragment, Receipt Roll 2, and one Jewish Roll, Receipt Roll 1564. For purposes of illustration, we may note four earlier fragments. Two of Henry the Second one of Richard I, and one a Jewish roll of the same reign. Issue rolls. None survive. Original writs of Liberate. 
One such has been found in Ancient Correspondence, Volume 47, Number 2. Household or Camera Here are to be classed the three Mize Rolls and possibly the three Prestita already mentioned. Two of them were formerly included among the Chancellery Rolls and were printed by Hardy. They came from the Tower, which was a repository both of Chancery and Exchequer records. The remaining four probably came from the Record Office, all from the Carlton Ride Repository of the Ancient Miscellanea of the Exchequer, K.R. Of these four, the two Mize are duplicates, the best of which Cole has printed. Cole has also printed one of the Prestita, but the other has not yet been published. The Mize are of the twelfth and fourteenth years of John the prestita of the 7th, 12th, and 14th to 17th years, the last, 14th to 17th, being unprinted and consisting really of separate rolls for several years. It will be noticed that we have made so far no reference to originalia or to Norman records. Both require some reference to the chancery as well as the exchequer and may therefore conveniently be treated together here. Originalia. Actually at the exchequer there is no trace of these, the classes of chancery records from which the originalia, when they came into existence, were drawn give us in the time of John a varying amount of exchequer information, and to these we must go direct. We may note them in the chancery. The Barate Rolls There are three of these belonging to the second, third, and fourth years of John. All were printed by the Record Commission, with an introduction by Sir Thomas Hardy, but we shall have a small addition to make to them later. Close Rolls these again were all printed by the commission with an elaborate introduction, also by Hardy. Including three duplicates, they number fifteen rolls covering the sixth to the ninth and the fourteenth to the eighteenth years of the reign. We may add that two fragmentary membranes have been recently discovered and added to the rolls of the sixteenth and seventeenth years. These fragments fill a number of gaps in the printed version. Fine or Oblata Rolls Including three duplicates, there are eleven of these covering the first, second, third, sixth, seventh, ninth, fifteenth, seventeenth, and eighteenth years of John's reign. These, once more, were all printed by the commission under Hardy's editorship. We shall have later to say a few words with regard to the nature of these chancery rolls. For the moment we may leave them, adding, in passing, a mention only of the patent and charter rolls, less directly connected with exchequer procedure, together with a note that we shall have ourselves a small fragment to add to the Fine roll class. Turning now to the Norman records, we have to examine two divisions, Exchequer and Chancery. The first of these, that of the Norman pipe rolls, includes duplicates, presumably Chancellor's rolls, though they were not known under that name. It consists now of a collection, formed in 1862, of eighteen rolls, fourteen being of the reign of John and four of an earlier date. These rolls were edited in 1840 and 1844 for the Society of Antiquaries by Stapleton. Unfortunately, the later arrangement does not correspond with that of Stapleton, and it is a little difficult to decide which rolls he used. It is clear that he collated the duplicates to some extent, but that he had not access to all of them is plain from the fact that he printed the very fragmentary roll number 22, membrane 16, of which number 6 is a practically uninjured duplicate. It may be convenient to add here as a footnote a key to the rolls used by Stapleton. We have to add the fragment discovered and printed by Delisle, though this does not belong to our period. We shall have later to make a small addition ourselves. We come finally to the Norman rolls of the English Chancery. These form part of a single series, applying in turn to the reigns of John and Henry V. Hardy printed six rolls for the first of these reigns, three of the second year and one each of the third, fourth, and fifth and one for the second, with an introduction which is for once definitely inadequate. He does not consider the question whether a single title is really applicable to the rolls of the two reigns, nor, though he gives some faint indication of it, the fact that the rolls of our period are themselves by no means a homogeneous series. His work was continued, for the reign of Henry V, in a calendar in the appendix to the deputy keeper's forty-second report, without any recognition of the fact that in the meantime an entirely new Norman roll of John had been added to the series number one. The rolls are now numbered in an order different from that in which Hardy printed them, and that a new membrane had been added to one of the rolls, number six, already published. 
the extra roll need not in point of fact trouble us here as it has in reality nothing to do with normandy being a portion of an english liberate roll in concluding our summary we must add for completeness a reference to the plea rolls of this reign there are fifty-five plea rolls of the king's court and twelve belonging to the class of visitational jurisdictions also to the early files of feet of fines containing fines of our period some of which have not been printed we have thus unpublished and unconsidered besides the pipe rolls and all save one of the chancellor's rolls two memoranda rolls five documents in the class of exchequer accounts two in that of receipt rolls one and a fragment in that of the norman rolls one at least in that of the norman pipe rolls and two fragments in that of close rolls together with a tally and an original writ of liberate the three last named need not detain us we have in addition a body of unpublished plea rolls and feet of fines the indirect evidence from which might be considerable but this again is beyond our scope and we have suggested that the significance of the chancery rolls published by the record commission has by no means been exhausted as yet in opening some investigation of these possible sources of information we may conveniently recapitulate one or two points with regard to exchequer procedure which it is very desirable to remember a touching the relation of the upper and lower exchequer one receipts of the king's revenue do not necessarily all appear on the pipe roll i have noticed elsewhere the case of jewish receipts and the collection of william cade's debts moreover the whole of the revenue of the crown does not necessarily go through the lower exchequer we have already mentioned the possibilities of the camera two in the case of issues the pipe roll is even more incomplete essentially it covers only the cases where an official has money paid him for which he is held to account these being generally cases in which the money is not paid out of the treasury at all but subtracted in advance by the accountant to meet current expenses from that which he will be expected to pay in it is thus seen that the pipe roll is not a guide to receipts and expenditure and that the only relation between the upper and lower exchequers is that the latter is required to give evidence not of all of its receipts but of such only as establish or disprove the statements made by an accountant at his audit b as to norman and english administration historians have been agreed up to the present that the norman sacarium is merely a reproduction in normandy of the english one mutatus mutandis made for convenience similarly a norman thesaurus reproduces the english thesaurus since there is no audit of the king's receipts and issues as a whole and exchequer procedure acts only as a check upon the local accountant there is no inconvenience in this previous writers however have taken the existence of a similarity in points of surface procedure between the two rather for granted in spite of the warning of the dialogues the lyle for instance in a work which still stands so far as regards its survey of the divisions and resources of normandy as a revenue producing country treats the actual machinery of the sacarium in somewhat cursory style boldly applying the dialogus description of the english institution to its norman parallel and even importing into the latter without evidence a system of originalia which did not adorn the english exchequer so far as we know till a later date beyond an inaccurate description of one of stapleton's rolls as a receipt roll he has not found it necessary to make any serious attempt nor have his successors m valine or professor powicki to establish the existence and scope of other records or record processes in normandy nor though it is agreed that one chief executive office one chancery controlled by both countries have they looked very far for any possible special treatment by the chancery of norman affairs we turn now to the pipe rolls of the reign of john the bulk of these as has been said is so enormous that it would be unwise even to attempt to sketch out all the problems which the student of them will be called upon to discuss when they with those of richard i are in print it must suffice to venture one or two theories as to the lines upon which growth was going on in the class during our period growth that is away from originally simple essentials into the utter confusion which undoubtedly reigned at the end of the thirteenth century and the highly complicated character which we know marked these records from the latter part of edward the second's reign onwards it would be particularly unwise since apart from the bare outlines just suggested 
no one has yet made such research as would enable us to get a clear and detailed idea of the state of things which was in existence in these later periods under these reservations we may venture here to put forward the fairly obvious suggestion that later developments of the originally simple pipe roll hinge entirely on the attempt to apply this essentially simple machinery either to business for which it was not designed or to business of a bulk so vastly increased that it broke down under the sheer weight i have suggested that as early as henry the second the machinery used for getting in or for assuring what was then the greater part of the king's income was proving quite inadequate to provide him with cash that so early as eleven sixty six the king was habitually anticipating many and large sums by means of assignments this alone introduced cross-references into the accounting to an extent almost unbearable and it is to be remembered that the use of these convenient assignments was continually growing again the sources of income which figure in our original picture of the sicarium all increased in bulk the cases for instance which came into the king's court and consequently the fines and immersements alone sufficed by their enlargement to upset machinery based on an idea that all the accounts could be assembled at the annual exchequer in a limited period their accounts audited and the roll describing the process written up while that process was going on besides the actual numbers of sources of income increased and though as in the case of the jewish talliages many of them do not come under the pipe roll audit yet we may argue i think that exchequer opinion would be always working up towards a state of affairs when these new sources should be under the same restrictions as the old throughout its long history the exchequer was always trying to subordinate the new whether in material or forms to the old not only this but it would be we know it was working up always towards the inclusion of the spending departments in the audit that is to the state we find when foreign rolls and the like modifications appear finally in considering the developments we may expect to find at the exchequer or indeed in any administrative department we have always to reckon with the fact that john's reign followed that of richard a period which introduced new elements of confusion while it is scarcely likely to have found time for much rearrangement or reform the early pipe rolls at least of john's reign contain references to numerous arrears of the time of his brother an entertaining instance may be found in the cases of certain people who still owed substantial fines for siding with count john taking all these considerations into account we may confidently anticipate that the reign of john will find the exchequer system as it was badly hit at certain definite points there is a difficulty of getting business through in anything like a reasonable time a tendency of the audit to spread over a longer and longer period convention makes its proceedings begin at michaelmas but from michaelmas they extend for an ever lengthening time the resulting confusion since the sheriff of one county accounts in october while he of another is perhaps not dealt with till march between the accounts of a given year and those of the preceding and succeeding ones is potentially very great there is confusion also between different kinds of exchequer records at any given date for example the yorkshire receipts of march of a given year might belong to the yorkshire audit of the previous or following year a pipe roll which shall be written up at the actual time of audit becomes in fact an impossibility further there is a legacy of arrears and these we may say are increasing finally there is a confusion between transactions which go on the pipe roll and those which do not a confusion that is between treasury or recepta matters on the one hand and camera matters on the other which may be productive of extreme inconvenience in public administration from these facts again we may deduce the probability of an attempt to solve exchequer problems on certain definite lines first we may expect to find preliminary and supplementary processes of all kinds going on at the upper exchequer before and after audit all the year round in fact secondly we may deduce a pipe roll made up beforehand and consequently having to be either corrected at audit time or else left blank or incorrect in parts and again we may expect the beginning possibility of some organized forms of new account some attempt it is the obvious remedy for congestion at the final audit at a preliminary compotus in several chosen cases and certainly of the habitual accumulation of a great many vouchers and memoranda this last in particular the extension of the habit of keeping memoranda is a fairly certain deduction 
the mere lapse of time which may occur between the preliminary interview of the exchequer officials with an accountant and his final examination the mere amount of confusion that may be caused in his accounts by the fact that he has paid in money in two or three different ways and places these and other considerations such as we have adumbrated above must if anything at all is to be accomplished at the exchequer connote some attempt at organized memoranda of extra audit transactions it is to this class of records therefore that we must turn for indications of the new developments in audit procedure which were produced by the time and circumstances of the reign of john before we do this however we may perhaps glance at the norman exchequer we know that the two exchequers are at least closely connected and we know that richard of ilchester was transferred to the norman exchequer in eleven seventy six presumably in order to effect changes of some kind whether these were in the direction of differentiation from or approximation to the english model in the first place are these norman pipe rolls so close to the english ones in some surface matters as is assumed by most people and to some extent by stapleton the eighteen rolls fall into two groups the smaller of these consist only of three rolls one of these occupies two pages in stapleton and is fragmentary we may say at once that most of the missing part is to be found in the unprinted exchequer account already referred to which has hitherto been described as a mise roll and ascribed to the reign of richard i the two fragments form together an almost complete account of the receipts and expenditure of Warin de capon seneschal of normandy in twelve hundred slash one the other two rolls are duplicates and are similar accounts of of robert de vertelli pont then bailiff of the Rumois in 1203. The larger of the two groups is that of the Norman pipe rolls proper, but they differ from the English ones in several important respects. All are of much the same breadth, 11 inches, but this is not the same as that of their English contemporaries, which are about 15 inches. In length again they vary between 3 and 8 feet, the largest rolls consisting of a number of membranes sewn head to tail, the English rolls practically never exceeded two. Another point of difference is found in the way in which they are written. Some are indexed at the tail of the membrane, as all the English ones are, and they have place headings and, after the form, subject headings which correspond mutatus mutandus with those of the English ones. But they impress one rather as having a common tradition with their English contemporaries than as being written by scribes trained in the same school. It is possible that this surface impression is incorrect but in any case it is not improbable that a paleographical examination of the two sets of rolls might establish points of importance with regard to the relations of their producers but there is one more noticeable difference to be mentioned we have already alluded to the inclusion in the pipe roll of accounts other than those of the normal accounting officials as being one of the obvious results which must spring from the widening of the sources of revenue and as one of the great changes crystallized in the fourteenth century of which earlier traces might be found the distinction of such from the ordinary accounts which appear on the pipe roll are first the fact that they may be rendered by all kinds of officials secondly the fact that they are more marked by division into receipt and expenditure each of these being usually given a summa totalis and finally the fact that the receipts may represent sums not collected from the king's subjects to be paid into the exchequer and only expended upon the king's special order but sums received from the exchequer expressly for the purpose of definite expenditure. Now the germ of such accounts is to be found in certain early pipe rolls and in certain exceptional cases. Thus the warden of a mint must necessarily, from the nature of his business, account in some such way as that just described. Besides this, cases will be found such as that of the Sheriff of Kent, who was charged with military building on a large scale at Dover in 32 Henry the Second. In that case the sheriff renders account, among other matters, de recepta sua de thesoro. The Norman pipe rolls seem undoubtedly to carry this principle further, and it is possible that we see here Richard of Ilchester adopting at the Norman exchequer reforms which his English experience had shown him to be necessary, but which, for various reasons, were delayed in England till a later date. This may lead us to a discussion of the small second group of three Norman pipe rolls, these rolls are narrow, eight or nine inches, and short. They use the phrases of the pipe roll, reddit copontum, 
est quietus and so forth but they are also distinguished by new ones and they are distinguished particularly by a division into two main parts receipts and expenses with a final balance not to linger over the description they are strikingly similar to the later compotus of the english exchequer the preliminary accounts compiled from vouchers in the king's remembrancers department which we noticed above or to the final copy of these enrolled among the foreign accounts and they show us first the seneschal and then robert de vitieri pont expending money received for the purpose from the exchequer even from the english thesaurus we have in fact at the norman exchequer an anticipation of two most important points in later english exchequer processes the auditing of foreign accounts including a considerable quantity of accounts of expenditure and the auditing of them apart from the ordinary pipe roll process and on a different kind of roll this is to say that we have found if our suggestion is correct an anticipation of the later attempt to meet difficulties of time and place caused by increase in the number and size of accounts by means of a separate audit let us turn now to consider the other expedients which as we have suggested must have grown into greatly increased use to meet the same difficulties the memoranda which in an embryo form we saw existing in the time of the dialogus end of section 16of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Financial Records of the Reign of King John by Hilary Jenkinson. Part 3. In this connection, we may examine in some detail the first of the two memoranda rolls already noted though it is to be remarked that neither in this case nor in that of many other records mentioned in this paper can anything approaching exhaustive treatment be attempted indeed the present roll bristles with points of administrative interest which we cannot even notice here this roll bears on its first membrane the title communia memoranda de termino sanctus michaelis post mortem regis ricardi anno regni regis johannes primo it consists of sixteen membranes all of much the same breadth, about six inches, with six small pieces of parchment considerably narrower. Membrane two is entitled Item Communia Membrana Mitch, and membranes three, four, dorsae, five, dorsae, and six are similarly described. Of these, membrane one has the subtitle Isti sunt vice comitas, cue vinerunt, adsicarium in cross tino sancti michaelis vi prose miserunt anno regni johannes primo membrane five d which is continued by membrane six has the subtitle de singulis vice comitibus qua ponunt plura debita super singulos the meaning of this is made clearer by the form adopted on the next membrane de vice comitibus qua pronut debita unus qs qa super alterum to which a frivolous scribe has added what is possibly the earliest known official jest the remaining membranes are all of the same kind each containing matters grouped together under counties thus membrane four deals with surrey and kent membrane five gives us the affairs of nottingham and derby membrane nine d those of oxford which are continued on membrane ten and so forth membrane thirteen is devoted to jewish business the small membranes may be left for the moment it is clear that we have here rolls similar to the later series of memoranda rolls the arrangement makes this plain giving us as it does adventus vice comitum on the first membrane and so considerable an amount of the well-known later division of communia it is fairly clear also that we have not here the first of the series it is not sufficiently experimental and indeed there are definite references to earlier memoranda but to consider the communia in a rather more detail a large number of the entries under this heading consist of dies date days assigned to accountants for their auditing or or respites or adjournments there are about sixty such entries and roughly speaking they follow a chronological sequence though to make this nearly perfect we must suppose that membrane four d should properly follow membrane two thus starting with adjournments which are mostly for october or november we work down to those for april 
Interspersed with these entries we have about a dozen cases where it is definitely mentioned that so-and-so venit hic, or venit coram baronibus, on a particular day. These again are chronological, extending from October to the end of March. We have thus in the communia a record which is being compiled day by day during the Michaelmas term, but the entries in which never refer to any auditing which was actually in hand at the moment of writing. This, however, does not end the contents of the communia. Interspersed in this regular chronological sequence are a large number of entries recording that a fine has been made or is due or has been paid, that the king sent his writ in these words, that so-and-so is not to be summoned on such-and-such -such an account, that a writ has been sent to the sheriff, that an account is to be transferred from one membrane to another on the pipe roll, and so forth. It is to be noted that all communia entries have their counties noted in the margin. Now this last section of entries is not very different in character from those which appear on the other membranes, those arranged under counties. Though these latter tend to be distinguished by the use of such phrases as loquendum cum to introduce them, and in a number of cases have notes obviously added to them at a later date, membrane 8 actually has a space deliberately left for such notes. On the whole, I think there can be little doubt that, while the communia include, one, what are later separate sections in the shape of dies date and various brevia, two, matters noted for reference when some account, not yet auditing, shall come up or in future terms, the county membranes give us matters left unsettled during the auditing of each sheriff's accounts. This close connection of the county membranes with the actual making of the pipe roll is supported by the fact that their entries are found to correspond with cases on the pipe roll, where the essential words of the entry, the debit or redit compotium, are left blank. If this explanation be correct, we have established that the use of the memoranda in John's time, not only for the noting of calendar arrangements made with the accounts, but also, one, for recording all kinds of current business, which was now too voluminous to be dealt with without some kind of minutes, two, the easing of the calls of auditing upon a limited amount of time by the regular reservation of matters which were doubtful or perhaps controversial. This second difficulty, that of time, was met later almost entirely by the expedient of preliminary audit, of which we noticed traces above. We have not quite exhausted the contents of our first memoranda roll. There remain the small membranes and the Jewish membrane. The small membranes include one which again foreshadows a well-known division of the later memoranda roll, giving us immersements of sheriffs who had failed to attend at Easter and appointments of days for views of accounts. This last is obviously important with regard to the matter of shortening the taking of accounts already referred to, but we have not sufficient details to found suggestions upon it. The remainder of the small membranes are memoranda, giving the details of larger sums for which various persons have to account. In a word, they are in the nature of estreats, or of particulars, of which we shall have to say a little later. The Jewish membrane is headed, Compotus Benedicti de Talamant de Debitus et Finibus Jederorum Anglii, Efesto Purificationis, Ani Noni Regis Ricardi, Usque ad Festum, Sancti Hilarii Anno Johannes Primo. It is to be noted that this is not the actual Compotus of Benedict, but memoranda upon it. It is particularly interesting from many points of view. But the whole question of the administration of monies paid by the Jews is so complicated that it is difficult to deal with any sections of it without a reasonable space. We may note, however, that the payments for which this Jew was responsible were apparently not intended to appear, and they did not appear, upon the pipe roll, while on the other hand he apparently did account for them. I have endeavored elsewhere to show that later, at any rate, there was a distinction between receipts from Jewish talliages and receipts from other Jewish sources, the latter, not the former, being collected by the sheriffs and figuring, though obscurely, in their pipe roll accounts and in the ordinary memoranda rolls, whereas talliage matters did not appear on the pipe rolls and, if they required memoranda, must have had special ones devoted to them. Since the matters here noted are of a very general character and are not yet stated to be subject of a compotus, we may conjecture that we have here traces of an early experimental stage in the exchequer treatment of Jewish administration. To sum up, we have here in this memoranda roll not only interesting foreshadowings of the memoranda rolls we know later, 
and indications of earlier ones in the same series now lost, we have also certain definite signs of the result upon exchequer administration of the increased size and number of accounts. First, the memoranda of the Dialogus developed into communia, in which were set out in an orderly fashion the various notanda of a busy department, these communia throwing off, as it were, smaller specialized divisions for certain regularly recurrent items, produced the memoranda roll as we know that record, and in the example we have been examining may be found in embryo all the varieties of matter which the subsequent rolls contain. Secondly, our roll shows us attempts being made to meet the second great difficulty of the period, not only the increased business but the consequent increased demand upon available time. In our role it is met by the reservation of special points. Later it was met by a system of preliminary audits, the adoption of which eliminates the necessity for country membranes which consequently disappear from the later memoranda rolls. It is even possible that we have in our role an indication of the trying of this method of separate audit also in the case of the Jewish matters. Finally, the memoranda roll of John's first year gives interesting testimony to the fact that all exchequer development turned on the necessities of the pipe roll and its scribes. Elsewhere I have suggested that even the early receipt rolls, though the dialogus tells us they were made in the lower exchequer, presumably for the convenience of that office, were conditioned in all the particulars of their form and making by the necessities of the pipe roll scribe. The same might be said of the country membranes of the memoranda which we have been discussing. Their arrangement, writing, and form all confirm the inference which may be made from their contents and in the small membranes which we have noticed, what have we but those rolls or notes of particulars the existence of which elsewhere is not infrequently noted by the pipe roll scribe when he has not time or patience to insert their details in his roll? These are the germs of the collection of vouchers by the king's remembrancer, which has given us our modern class of exchequer accounts, etc. We have dealt at so much length with this important record that there is little space left to discuss others like or connected with it. We may take these in conjunction with the vouchers. It will be remembered that we have to deal with three documents from the class of exchequer accounts and one from the K.R. Miscellanea. To these we may add the companion roll to that just described, LTR Miscellaneous Rolls 1 slash 4, but we may eliminate the Miscellanea document reserving it for treatment with the chancery fine rolls. Taking first the last of these, a roll of about a dozen membranes, with a few smaller membranes or slips, we find we have to notice most of the features which were prominent in the previous example. We have the title Memoranda, with two interesting variants, which suggest a still fluid state. Memorialia and De Memorias on membrane 8, and we have apparently Communia on membrane 1. We have Adventus Vicae Comitum, under that title, on membrane 2. We have the same distinction between communia, entries, and membranes assigned to particular counties. We have letters from the king to the barons, M3, and we have again a special section devoted to the Jews, M13, entitled Compotus, though it is really only a number of memoranda upon an account. In this connection we have to note an innovation, for a similar heading on Membrane 12, relating to Hugh de Neville, introduces us to actual rough compotus, which seems to take us a step toward the use of preliminary audit. This roll covers the Easter and Michaelmas terms of the tenth year of John, with some reference to the preceding year. The whole appears to be an incomplete set of membranes. Two final points to be mentioned are concerned with the use of the word extracta as a title on a membrane, M14, containing lists of debts, and with the nature of the small membranes which are here, as before, to be classed as either as streets or particulars. In connection with this last point, it is to be noted that even in the later periods, it is very frequently impossible to decide whether an isolated list of entries in the great form de Jona de London V.S. is an a street, from other records showing amounts which are due, or a particular, giving the details of sums actually handled elsewhere, on the pipe roll, but handled there only in gross. The presence, of course, of the word extracta makes it certain that we are dealing with a list of debts which are to be extracted, but other of these lists, notably the small membranes on the memoranda, are more probably particulars. This may serve to introduce us 
to a group of rough rolls giving under a county arrangement lists of debts which we may conjecture to have been left over at the end of a term of audit and listed for the purpose of a summons for the next sacarium indeed we have in one or two places items cancelled with the note ponitor in submonicione or in rotulo est this group includes besides membrane fourteen of the roll just dealt with three documents of the next reign which we may perhaps mention in passing because they correspond so exactly with seven membranes and a fragment out of the twenty-two which make up exchequer accounts five o five number four a roll in a very bad condition which is ascribed to our period and may belong to it though the evidence for this date is not on any of these eight membranes it is to be noticed that certain membranes are indexed with a county reference at the foot and have added the word m presumably for m endator or some other part of that verb meaning apparently that the list has to be checked we are left with the bulk of the roll last mentioned exchequer account 505/4 and with exchequer accounts 152 number 1 still to be described both are of considerable importance for they are memoranda of the norman exchequer the first a collection of thirteen membranes and a fragment was joined by accident to the english membranes already noticed as we may conjecture during a search for information about forests conducted as it appears by an endorsement a century or so later however that may be they are worthy of more study than we have space to give them here it must suffice to note summarily a few points thus they belong apparently to the year twelve o one or twelve o two some of them are similar mutatus mutandus to the english rolls of debts just mentioned and have references to the norman pipe roll and audit summonses we may note in connection with some of these that the use of the words extracta memorandarum the last supporting the suggestion made above in connection with the use of extracta in the english memoranda that these lists were made up at the close of a session of the exchequer from the memoranda of the term on another membrane we have memoranda precisely similar to those in the english communia of terms given for rendering account and notes beginning sciendum or debit respondere all annotated in the margin with the names of the districts to which they refer but perhaps most remarkable are two membranes dealing with impress receipts in money and kind by warren de glepion and others and expenditure at rouen and other places over a period named and mentioning the receipt at the norman exchequer of a rotulas de camera regis the significance of all this information is obscure but it clearly indicates proceedings both complicated and varied showing at the same time a close connection with the english court and distinct individuality at the norman exchequer the other norman document of a memoranda character is a single membrane having no date monsieur le gras puts it early in the reign of john in several places it is entitled extractus memorandarum also it has a note amend and another ponitur in rotulo all points connecting this with the documents we have been noticing it has however two characteristics of its own one is a vertical line drawn through the part to which the note ponitur appears to relate a familiar device in later exchequer procedure the other is the fact that we have here apparently not so much memoranda for the use of the court as instructions to an official who was to collect the debts de t ipso is a frequent entry and it appears that this official whoever he was was personally responsible for a large number of accounts with this we must leave the question of memoranda and vouchers of the two exchequers noting only in passing an indenture which may be presumed to have been a voucher to some kind of count this last very interesting document which i believe has not been printed gives particulars of the contents and disposal of prizes brought into portsmouth by john's galleys from twenty five april to eight september in his thirteenth year this completes so far as present space and knowledge allow it our survey of the upper exchequer we turn to the lower exchequer which may be quickly dealt with of original receipts as we have noticed there is possibly one the person whose debt is mentioned on this tally jordan nepos geruasii appears in records from the end of the reign of henry the second to that of john possibly the writing on the tally makes the later date more probable of receipt rolls we have practically nothing the very interesting roll of the reign of henry the second 
with a similar one of the reign of Richard I, which has lately come to light, suggests that the receipt roll was in origin closely connected with the processes of the upper exchequer. The handwriting, though smaller, is similar, so is the division into counties. The reign of John furnishes us with an important roll showing the development out of this state, as the present writer interprets it, into that which we find in the early years of Henry the Third. The John Roll, which is devoted to receipts from Jews, was prepared in and for the Exchequer of Receipt. In this roll we find the parchment enlarged, and the writing made smaller than in the previous examples, so that there is space for two or three columns abreast, though the pipe roll habit of noting the contents at the foot of the membrane still persists. It is this type of roll, with its fuller contents, its sume added at intervals, a matter which would not concern the pipe roll scribe, and its make-up, in many cases, with membranes of issues, which seem first to show us the idea of a receipt roll applied to the convenience of its makers rather than that of the pipe roll scribes. Before leaving this subject we must mention a small roll, which has always been classed, in modern times at least, with the receipt rolls, though in character it resembles rather the particulars mentioned above, and though it came to the record office from the Tower of London, it will be convenient, however, to reserve it for illustration of a later point. Turning to issues, we have again to note the preservation of only one original, a writ of liberate, now among the ancient correspondence. It is interesting because there are only two earlier ones known, that printed by Dr. Round and that given by Madox. Like Dr. Round's specimen, it is sent by the Chancellor, presumably in the King's absence. Of enrollments of writs we have no example. The earliest is attached to the earliest complete general receipt roll belonging to the fourth year of Henry the Third. The earliest example of the later form of roll, which gives only a summary of the writ, belongs to the twenty-fifth year of Henry the Sixth. Leaving for the time the question of the records of financial departments other than the Exchequer, we pass to the records which, though belonging to the Chancery, affect either directly or indirectly the Exchequer processes. The first question that faces us is that of the connection between the collections of the two countries, together with the possibility already referred to that the Norman set are not homogeneous and perhaps not all chancery rolls. As to the nature and number of the Norman rolls, as that name was understood in the past, we have little to guide us. We have notice of the bringing of rolls from Normandy, but this does not help us. Nor can the conclusions which Hardy based upon an indenture of the time of Richard the Second be relied upon in this particular. In point of fact, one of the surviving rolls is definitely of Norman exchequer origin. It begins, Hic est rotulus catarum et chirographorum normanorum factus tempore, guarini de glepon senescali normani, assistenibus ad scacerium sansone abate cadomi. This is a roll of fines made at the Norman Exchequer and of private deeds, including some charters from Henry the Second and Richard, and a number from John, enrolled, we may presume, for safety among the records of the King's Court, a function of the Norman Exchequer of which we have little notice elsewhere. On the other hand, Norman Roll Number One, which has been added to the series since Hardy's time, is merely the first part for the month of April of the first English Liberate Roll while number seven, which was printed by Hardy, is a roll of the values of the lands of Normans in England after John had lost the duchy. Of the remaining four rolls, number two, to John, entitled De Oblatus Receptus, corresponds closely with the English fine rolls, but relates to Norman affairs. The Et Mandatum Est, when it appears, is addressed to Norman officials, and there are interesting references to summonses to the Norman exchequer. Roll 4, belonging to the same year, is called Rotulus de Contrabreoibus. The meaning of this is explained below. For the moment we need only observe that the writs are generally addressed to Norman officials or else to persons abroad, while on the other hand the dates of the last membrane of the roll suggest that it was made in England. Number 5, for John, is a Rotulus terrarum liberaterum et contrabreuium the dating of which writs enrolled here, save at the beginning, is abroad, and itself was presumably made abroad. The references, too, are clearly to Norman administration. We have a special note of a matter, quad debet scribi in rotulo angli. Number 6, 5 John, is a similar roll to number 5, 
and it is to be noticed that a fragmentary fifth membrane added in 1838 has never been printed. The addresses of writs on this roll are generally Norman, and the dates all Norman, save four at the end, corresponding to John's return from Normandy to England in this year. It seems clear that these two English-dated writs are only included on the roll by mistake. A mistake in the other direction has a special note, in rotuo anglii totum bruei. Now from a later experience of the Glasgow rolls, and other special chancery enrollments, we may remark that a special roll of this kind may either be, one, a roll of letters dated abroad, or two, a roll of letters referring to foreign matters, whether these appear in other, ordinary enrollments or not. What is the principle on which the Norman rolls were made? There is no serious doubt that at this date the chancery still, as a rule, followed the king. There is a prime facie case, therefore, for making the Norman roll a roll written in Normandy. I think this conclusion is made almost certain by the ending, already noticed, of Norman Roll Four. On the other hand, the personal touch of the king being still strong in affairs, it is not unreasonable to suppose that Norman affairs would rather monopolize the attention of his chancery when he was in Normandy and English ones when he was in England, provided, of course, that he was in any given year dividing up his time pretty fairly between the two countries. This probably resulted sometimes, by confusion, in a belief that Norman entries should go on the Norman Roll, resulted, that is, in the interpretation of this roll's function upon a subject basis, so that we get contemporaneous rolls of English and Norman liberate, find upon an English liberate roll Norman entries cancelled, quia in roto normani, and have, as has been seen, one Norman roll actually compiled in England. The confusion would go so far that the Norman-made rolls, composed, as we shall see, entirely of entries having a financial interest, would be preserved in Normandy in the interests of the Norman exchequer, although, unlike the exchequer rolls, they did not owe their existence to a separate body of scribes. This would explain the presence in the modern series of the Norman exchequer roll noticed above. End of section 17§ 18 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Financial Records of the Reign of King John by Hilary Jenkinson, Part 4. Turning to the question of the contents of these rolls, we may say at once that they do not differ generically from the English ones, so that the two sets may be treated together. Taking, then, the Norman and English chancery rolls, which are of direct exchequer interest, we may divide them into two classes, called for convenience liberate rolls and fine rolls. The first of these classes contains entries of writs of liberate for payments at the exchequer, as also some writs of pardon, of computate, and of allocate, addressed to that department. The fine rolls, alternatively called oblata in early times, contain entries of the sums paid to the king, so-and-so dot domino regi, so much to obtain various privileges, licenses, and exemptions. The ways in which the scope of this role was developed and modified later need not here detain us. Our exchequer interest in the two classes resolves itself into two questions. 1. How far do these roles relate to the business of the exchequer, and how far to that of the camera? 2. How was the information in them imparted to exchequer officials? Let us take the fine rolls first. These rolls are certainly compiled in the chancery, not the exchequer. This is made clear by plenty of notes such as hinc mitendum in sacarium. It is equally clear that certain entries, at least, have a definite sacarium interest, and we have references to the pipe roll. It is clear again that the documents used by the exchequer were not our rolls, but copies, for we get such a note as this. Finis iste non debit miti ad sacarium hic quia mititur superius. Moreover, it appears that in spite of the dat domino and the title of the earlier rolls, rotulus obularum, or finium receptorum, the money was not always, at any rate, paid on the spot. This appears by the following among a number of entries. Cives London dat domino regi tria milia macarum pro habenda confirmatione. 
et carta liberabitur galfrido filio petri per sic quod si ila volunt dare suam cartam habebunt si non autum cartam non habebunt on the other hand the interest of the fine roll entries is not always for the exchequer for we have such notes as non mititur quia foresta and if the dat or the receptorum ever have a literal meaning it is difficult to see how the exchequer could need or profit by information concerning the entries on these rolls unless we are to make the difficult assumption that the chancery staff were at this date subjected to audit we may perhaps make tentatively the suggestion that entries upon the fine rolls fall into two rough classes of cash payments and promises only the latter engaging the attention of the exchequer this opens up possibilities too wide for discussion here though we may perhaps say a word on the subject later in connection with the camera like the other printed volumes of john records the fine rolls offer scope for a careful reading and analysis in conclusion we have to add to the known fine rolls what is though rough and written on an unusually narrow membrane undoubtedly the fragment of a fine roll of the twelfth year of john twelve ten it came originally from the treasury of the receipt but it is not unknown for chancery records to be found in the repository it is now among the miscellanea of the exchequer k r one number five turning now to the second of the classes of chancery rolls to which we alluded above the liberate we have to deal with three norman rolls proper one norman roll which forms the april section of the english liberate roll for the second year of john and english liberate rolls of the second third and fifth years further it is generally admitted that this series is continued by the close rolls which begin as has already been noticed with the sixth year it is possible that the loss of normandy and the elimination of the necessity for a double series of liberate rolls and double reference to two exchequers had something to do with the innovation if we include the close rolls in the division we are now considering the principal question facing us is what parts of the contents of the rolls would interest the exchequer now the contents of the liberate rolls proper are writs of which the originals by their nature are bound either to be found in the exchequer at the time of audit or to be produced there by accountants the only use for the chancery records of these so far as the exchequer is concerned is that mentioned in the dialogus the checking of the originals by means of the contra briuia or rescripta which themselves not in the shape of secondary copies are brought over by the chancellor or his clerk it is by no means impossible that in contradistinction to the fine rolls the actual liberate rolls still preserved to us among john's chancery rolls themselves visited the exchequer certain annotations upon them may even have been made in the exchequer if the chancery liberate rolls were periodically sent over in this way it would account for the fact that no exchequer enrolments of these writs have come down to us for the john period it was not till the receipt officials came to make rolls for their own convenience that such an enrollment came to be thought desirable to the liberate rolls then representing the rescriptum of the dialogus we see added to our period e g in norman roll five entries of terra liberate that is copies of letters which indirectly interested the norman exchequer similarly in the english liberate roll three we have the title rotulus terrarum et denariorum liberatorum in anglia once again then i think we have here as in the case of the receipt rolls mentioned above the exchequer interest originating the keeping of rolls in another department this other department speedily finds out the convenience of preserving such records for its own purposes and we have added to them copies of documents in the present case other letters close or patent which are not, in some cases, even indirectly of audit interest. From this the transition would probably soon be made, in the case of the chancery, to an ordered treatment of the subject from a chancery point of view, and we then get, added, the idea of originalia, or estrites, made specially for the benefit of the exchequer, and incorporating transcripts from the fine rolls, with less numerous items from the close rolls and the patent and charter rolls it is not improbable that the duplicates surviving to us in the classes of both fine and close rolls of the john period are relics of the transition stage 
but here again is a subject too detailed to be dealt with in the present paper we have in fact in the time of john at first two distinct collections being made by the chancery one enrolments of charters and letters patent of which letters copies were preserved for the purposes of the chancery two liberate preserved primarily for exchequer purposes as this second class merged into the close rolls the chancery interest in the preservation of record of letters close became equal at least to that of the exchequer the stage before this is possibly responsible partly for the lack of exactitude which we sometimes notice in the early rolls in the assignment of a letter of one or the other kind to its proper class of enrollment we have left till the last the most thorny of all the questions connected with early financial records contemporary reference gives us as administrative instruments the sacarium the thesaurus the recepta the camera and the garderoba what are all these and what their relations one to another various writers have touched upon this one and that and have even alluded to points in their relationship thus professor mckitchney suggests that though the audit was fixed at westminster the exchequer in which he includes presumably the upper exchequer and the recepta with much of its impedimentia of writs and tallies would accompany the king delisle speaking of norman affairs says la chambre suivant le prince le trésor restrait en dépôt et un château filets or cane professor powicki dealing with the norman exchequer speaks of the english exchequer chamber so far as that did not follow the king in dealing ourselves so far with existing exchequer records we have been able to trace in john's reign a number of the series of exchequer records which are familiar to us at a later period and to trace too something of their relationship to each other and to the most important of all the pipe roll we have even ventured to suggest what were some of the matters of difficulty the points of pressure and congestion in the old simple system of receipt expenditure and audit and in the records of these processes and consequently what signs of development and growth we may look for in our period both in the system and in the records we have refrained however so far from an attempt to fit king john's known financial transactions as they are reflected in innumerable instances in for example his chancery rolls into this or that part of the machinery we were able to outline we have been content that is to allude to the fact that the pipe roll and other machinery does deal with some financial matters while others pass it by without attempting either to classify the first of these or to collect concrete instances of the second unfortunately we have financial records still to deal with which touch the second of these classes the mise and prestita rolls which are undoubtedly concerned with some transactions that are outside the normal course of the exchequer and the normal pipe memoranda receipt and issue records we are driven therefore in conclusion to touch upon the record evidence for the administration of financial matters which did not come within the influence of the upper exchequer we have already suggested that because a matter was not subject to audit there is no reason that the receipt and issue side of it should not be controlled by the lower exchequer whose business these processes were unfortunately the paucity of records of this department for john's reign does not permit us to prove or disprove the suggestion that the receipt was still giving itself little trouble over matters of which the pipe roll scribes did not take cognizance in opening this matter it is necessary to distinguish not so much between the camera and the sacarium as between the camera and the curia it is to be remembered that the curia is originally the personal entourage of the king the camera only appears when the curia has been professionalized and departmentalized supplying that personal element which the curia had lost thus in administration when the king's secretary has become the department or court of chancery there arises a new personal secretary a member as the chancellor had originally been of the king's household staff similarly the treasurer departmentalized is replaced from the personal point of view by the keeper of the king's private accounts in the contemporary phrase keeper of his wardrobe we have to note first then that the camera is not a purely financial affair it is the successor of the curia in the position of the king's personal entourage all kinds of duties certainly secretarial as well as financial ones may be undertaken by it the unfortunate anomaly of john's reign is that the chancellor has not been departmentalized whereas the treasurer has 
so that we have this member of the curia still following the king and in effect a member of the camera later he will be replaced there by the keeper of the privy seal but at present that instrument is no more than a signet ring which the king uses normally in much the same way as any private person we may now attempt some distinction between the financial terms mentioned at the beginning of this section in the first place the sacarium apart from its literal sense should undoubtedly be a season an occasion the occasion or season of audit unfortunately there seems little doubt that in early times while this is the generally accepted sense the word is sometimes used loosely maddox has collected together several instances of what appear to be local sicaria according to him some subordinate receipts or places of revenue with which he classes the sicarium redemptionis regis ricardi and the sicarium aronis which dealt with the debts of aaron of lincoln and also the sicarium hugonis de neville to which a certain debtor was ordered to pay seven hundred pounds on the understanding that hugh de neville would account for the sum afterwards at the sicarium west monasterii most of the instances given might be explained as being special occasions but this last of hugh de ville is difficult we may add to it a reference to john's sicarium de merleberg at easter twelve o seven the payments which are ordered to be made there appear to some extent in the normal pipe roll of the following michaelmas so that we might suppose that on this occasion the easter exchequer sat exceptionally away from westminster we have to add to this however that a little later on in july twelve fifteen hugh de neville was keeper of the king's thesaurus at marlborough that the small so-called receipt roll mentioned above is a short list of sums received de balavis hugonis de neville unde responsum est ad sacarium and that in the pipe roll of the tenth year we have a compotus hugonis de neville de recepta sua it is possible that we may draw from these passages the inference that yet another expedient was tried during our period for the relief of the overworked exchequer an extension of the principle of compotus and particulars in the shape of supplementary provincial exchequers whose activities were summarized at the audit at the sacarium westmonsterii be that as it may it is clear that we must be prepared for the use of the word sacarium in exceptional cases in a sense closely similar to that of thesaurus about the function of the thesaurus there is no ambiguity its business is the custody of treasure including records it frequently follows the king but sometimes he deposits its contents in some place which is considered safe such as the abbey of reading on the other hand it sometimes remains apparently in places difficult of access it is possible that the term was applied to more than one depot of treasure for we have reference to the king's receipt at shrewsbury of a large sum from our treasury of marlborough but this may have been only a temporary localization did the officials of the recepta who normally controlled the thesaurus follow the king if not there must always have been a thesaurus though it might be empty at westminster in any case there is no reason to suppose that the thesaurus or thesauri though it or they certainly should receive monies paid in and audited in the old normal way did not also include any monies the king might have accumulated by other methods the camera as well as the sacarium may have been so to speak a depositor there is no doubt that the king did receive irregularly large sums which were paid over to him wherever he might happen to be this is to say that he received them in camera in his household sometimes they were sums which formed part of a regular pipe roll account and the barons of the exchequer have to be notified of the receipt sometimes they are donna or fines many of which certainly did not figure in any known audit sometimes they are sums derived from the thesaurus we have numerous instances of such receipts in camera or in garderoba do these two phrases convey the same thing probably the explanation is that anything paid in garderoba was necessarily paid in camera of which garderoba was only a part this brings us to the question of the prestita and mise rolls of the contents of these rolls we have not space to say much and indeed their relation and distinction may perhaps be sufficiently illustrated 
by a single quotation from a precita roll iadem dei ibidem rogero wacalin de prestito ad nueum suam omnio perandum v marcus praetor donum quod rex ae dedit di alies v marcus cui sunt in rotulo mise the interesting point to us is the question of their place in the general scheme of administration and since the relation to the pipe rolls if there is any cannot be settled with certainty while those records remain unprinted this is largely a question of the persons who produced them to that question there can i think be only one answer even if relations can be established later upon some points with the zacarium it must remain clear that these rolls were put together in and for the benefit of the king's camera the prestita are really only a development of the expenditure side of the garderoba the more normal manifestation of which are the mais both are part of the king's personal expenditure and since the king's personal writing officer was still as we have seen the chancellor with his staff we can hardly avoid the conclusion that hardy was right in classing them mais and prestita as chancery records and that they are incorrectly placed in the exchequer because the latter wardrobe accounts which they anticipate went there as a result of the later arrangement by which the wardrobe was made subject to audit in the chancery they form part of a class we might conjecture which on the side of receipts includes the very curious fine and oblata rolls in this connection we may conclude with three further citations from the patent rolls which speak for themselves one sciatus quod quietum clamavimus delectum et fidelum nostrum philippum de luci de omni prestito quod ea facimus et de omnibus receptus quas recepit dum esset in camera nostra two litera ista i e originals of enrolments on the patent roll liberate errant in camera domini regis rudolfo parmentario apud craneburn three sciatus quod recepimus permanum r pioris de reading omnis rotulus nostros de camera nostra et sigillum nostrum et rotulus nostros de sacario no doubt the phrase rotulus de camera refers to the mais and prestita but where are the chancery rolls the records of letters which had issued under the sigillum it is tempting to include them also under the same designation for to the camera at this date they did in a sense undoubtedly belong inasmuch as we must hold it to have included that chancellaria which still followed the king a study of the way in which john's cash resources were handled passing from england to normandy from the exchequer official to the soldier from the camera to the recepta would reveal i think the fact that so far as he had them he disposed of them at his will freely he may have lacked both money and men but whatever his servants were they were not his masters similarly behind all the administrative confusion of the reign the loose ends of old processes dying out new ones beginning and tentative ones lapsing we seem to see working a single very powerful administrative brain was that the brain of king john's end of the financial records of the reign of king john and end of magna carta commemoration essays by various authors